Honourable Senators, President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you as I read the prayer to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? No. Uh, documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during this? Ah, oh, there's too much noise in here, Senators. <coughs> Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of this? This is shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. The, I call the clerk. Private senators' bills ordered the day number 35, improving access to medicinal cannabis. Bill 2023, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak to One Nation's improving access to medicinal cannabis. Bill 2023, medicinal cannabis has only been legally available since 2016. Since it was down-scheduled through measures like the approved prescribe out scheme, the number of Australians prescribed medicinal cannabis products has increased from a few hundred in 2018 to more than half a million in 2022. This growth clearly shows there is a prominent place for medicinal cannabis products in Australia health care. However, a system which worked quite well for only a few thousand scripts a year is under strain from hundreds of thousands of scripts. Patients have more recently encountered increasing problems with accessing these products, along with other issues like product quality, availability and pricing. <coughs> these difficulties have resulted in a small drop in prescriptions, so we consider this legislation to be timely response. A bill cleans up the poison schedule listings for medicinal products derived from cannabis and makes them available under Schedule 4, meaning they can be prescribed by any doctor or veterinarian. In addition, the bill provides for low-strength preparations to be made available over the counter at a pharmacy or veterinary practice for purchase by adults. The strength of these products is determined by the level of tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC in them, this is the intoxicating compound. All states in Australia now have a 1 per cent limit on THC in these products, still well below the level which could produce intoxication. Such products are commonly called hemp. A bill harmonises Commonwealth law with state laws, increasing the level at which the products are considered hemp from 0.1 per cent to 1 per cent. Previously, a hemp classification was based on the genus of the plant from which the product was derived, sativa or indica. However, growers overseas have bred new varieties of these plants which are much lower in THC but have had higher levels of other beneficial healing compounds. Our bill reflects that a hemp product can only be determined by its THC level. Perhaps the most important benefit to this bill is that it will be highly it will be to help to significantly reduce the cost of medicinal cannabis. By moving it to Schedule 4, more doctors and vets can prescribe it so economies of scale will work in the patient's favour. 
More crucially, moving it to Schedule 4 opens the pathway for listing medicinal cannabis products on the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme. A successful PBS listing application usually requires a sponsor with deep pockets who can later recover costs from its patent on the listed product. However, you can't patent a natural plant. There is a solution to this, and One Nation will soon introduce legislation which enables listing medicinal cannabis products on the PBS. Another important element to increasing access is to ensure doctors, pharmacists and vets are educated about medicinal cannabis so they are prescribing or selling the appropriate product for a given condition. It would be wise for the Therapeutic Goods Administration to maintain the requirement that, medicinal that medical professionals complete an appropriate medicinal cannabis course before they are able to start prescribing it. This isn't a criticism of doctors who can only prescribe what's available, but one of the reasons for the recent reduction in medicinal cannabis scripts is that patients feel the product did not work for them. However, this is usually because the wrong product was prescribed for the health profile of the patient. Our legislation supports Australians who are seeking more natural medicines and medical treatments. The cannabinoids of in cannabis, in cannabis are as natural as any other product available. They are found in other plant species and in sp spices like black pepper and turmeric. They are manufactured by our own bodies and play an important role in the human body's capacity to heal itself. They are also manufactured in the bodies of the pet animals we keep. The full range of these cannabinoids are available in cannabis plants, but that's not all that's in these remarkable plants. There are around 500 other health-promoting compounds, antioxidants, dietary fibre, minerals and trace elements. As more Australians access medicinal cannabis to treat a wide variety of conditions, state and territory governments will need to have another look at the way the, they test motorists for intoxication. The purpose to, is to ensure motorists are not impaired and present, present a danger to themselves and others on the road. This should not be based on a chemistry test, but on whether a driver is actually impaired, as it is evident medicinal cannabis products can result in a positive drug test while not actually impairing the person being treated with them. A final po point. Our legislation very strictly does not allow children under 18 to access any of these products. <coughs> with clear evidence that medicinal cannabis is not only effective in treating a wide range of conditions and clear evidence is it is high, in high demand in Australia, it is time to elevate it as the primary healthcare option it should be. One Nation has always puts Australia and Australians first, and in this spirit, I commend this legislation to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Deputy President. In Australia, we have a national classification uh, system that controls how medicines and chemicals are made available to the public. Medi medicines and chemicals are classified into schedules in the poison standard according to the risk of harm and the level of access control required to protect public health and safety. This bill is an attempt to downschedule substances contained in medicinal cannabis products. Furthermore, the bill attempts to remove any requirement for medicinal cannabis products to be accessed via the Special Access Scheme or Authorised pres Prescriber Scheme. The Therapeutic Goods Administration are the Australian Government Authority responsible for evaluating, assessing and monitoring products that are defined as therapeutic goods. The TGA have advised they have serious concerns with both proposals put forward in the bill. It seems that the impacts of this, bill, this proposed bill have not been carefully considered. It leads me to question how much research and consultation went, went into the drafting of this bill. The government considers this proposal to be inappropriate as the current scheduling of these substances is the result of a long and well-considered process based on clinical evidence and expert advice. I am a supporter of the well-considered use of prescribed medicinal cannabis in appropriate circumstances and have been involved in Senate committee hearings inquiring into this matter. I have met and spoken with people who use medicinal cannabis on prescription to treat medical conditions with positive results. In late 2019, through to the tabling of its report in March 2020, I was an active participant in the Senate Standing Committee 
on community affairs inquiry into current barriers to patient access to medicinal cannabis in Australia. Subsequent to that inquiry, I worked hard in my home state of Tasmania, along with my colleague Senator Billick, to encourage the state government to adopt the recommendations of that inquiry and improve access to medicinal cannabis products for Tasmanians who are suffering and to bring the state into line with other states and territories. This bill has the potential to undo much of the good work that has been done to give those who suffer from medical conditions where the use of medicinal cannabis product is deemed appropriate access to those products by medical prescription. The scheduling of substances contained in medicinal cannabis products is the result of a very careful and considered assessment of the most appropriate pathways to access medicinal cannabis products based on available scientific knowledge and input from scheduling committees and expert clinical advice. I'm a great believer in science and we should always look at the science closely. The impacts of this bill have not been carefully considered and do not, respect, uh, do not reflect expert clinical views. Cannabis, the plant, and THC, a psychoactive component of cannabis, were historically included in Schedule 9 prohibited substance of the poison standard, which severely restricted patient access to medicinal cannabis for many years. A decision to amend the scheduling of CBD to a Schedule 4 prescription-only medicine in March 2015 and amend the scheduling of cannabis and THC to Schedule 8, a controlled drug in August 2016, enabled prescriptions of both CBD and THC containing products for therapeutic purposes subject to state and territory requirements. But this, proposes, this bill proposes to downschedule medicinal cannabis products from Schedule 8 to Schedule 4, which would conflict with the scheduling policy framework for psychoactive drugs that has been agreed by all states and territories through the then Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council. The proposed downscaling, downscheduling would not in, in and of itself have claimed effect of permitting access to medicinal cannabis products through any medical practitioner. This is because authorised prescriber and special access scheme approvals are required for most medicinal cannabis products as they are not included in the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. To lawfully supply a therapeutic good that is not included in the register, one of the pathways for accessing unapproved goods, such as through the special access scheme, authorised prescribe prescriber or personal importation must be used. The rescheduling of the products would not change this in any way. So even if this bill were to pass the chamber, it would not have the effect its proponents seem to believe it would. It's important to understand that the special access scheme and authorised prescriber pathways were specifically designed to ensure both medical expertise and TGO oversight over the use of unapproved therapeutic goods for patients. These safeguards and this level of medical oversight over the use of unapproved therapeutic goods allow safety concerns to be quickly identified while balancing the importance of ensuring patient access to new treatments. Therapeutic goods that are not on the register can only be lawfully supplied under an exemption, authority or approval. This is to strike an appropriate balance between ensuring that therapeutic goods available to Australians are safe and of, ex of acceptable quality and making therapeutic goods available to Australians that need them. The current scheduling of substances contained in medicinal cannabis products was the result of a very extensive process to ensure that the scheduling of substances is appropriate. The proposals in this bill have not undergone such extensive consideration. Another matter to consider is because we are a federation that the states and territories play a major role. Each state and territory has its own laws that determine where consumers can access a particular drug and how it is to be packaged and labelled. The standard is given effect through state and territory legislation and it remains with the state and territory governments as to how they give effect to any decision to downschedule a substance in their own jurisdiction. This bill includes a downscheduling proposal to allow cannabis products with THC below 1% and CBD below 10% to be sold over the counter in a pharmacy or veterinarian practice to a person aged over 18. This is much greater than international practice. 
Article 30, 30 of the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs 1961 as amended by the 1972 Protocol, which is a treaty that Australia is a party to, requires drugs including cannabis and extracts, regardless of THC concentration, to be under medical prescription. So the proposal in this bill would not be consistent with Australia's obligations under the Single Convention. Medicinal cannabis is a very fast developing therapeutic product that not just here in Australia but across the world. There remains much to be done in this emerging area to improve access to safe, affordable and effective medicinal cannabis products. But this bill does not provide for a coherent way forward. It is not the solution to improve access to safe, affordable and effective medicinal cannabis products. It fails to take into account the processes our country uses, the nature of the Federation, the treaties we are signatories to, as well as the safety mechanisms we have in place when it comes to the prescription of medicinal cannabis products that are unapproved by the TGA. It is possible that this bill is the result of frustration as to what some may see as the slowness of the processes that allow the approval of products and their scheduling on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. Therapeutic goods are assessed according to their level of risk against acceptable standards uh, of quality, safety and efficacy or performance. The scheduling of substances contained in medicinal cannabis products is the result of a carefully and considered assessment of the most appropriate pathways to access medicinal cannabis products, based on available scientific knowledge and input from scheduling committees and expert clinical advice. Those processes and assessments are there to ensure medicinal canna cannabis products are safe, effective and meet specific manufacturing and product quality requirements. These processes and assessments take time. Progress is being made, however, and at this time two medicinal cannabis products have been evaluated and approved by the TGA and are included on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. Sativex, which is used to treat certain pac patients with multiple sclerosis, and Epidilox, epi which is used for patients with certain epileptic conditions. I've first heard, uh, I've heard firsthand of the great benefits of these that have brought to some sufferers of ep epilepsy, epilepsy and certain um, multiple sclerosis, and I'm excited by the science and the discoveries that are being made. As our medical practitioners are increasingly finding, access to medicinal cannabis products in Australia is straightforward, and almost 300,000 prescriptions for medicinal cannabis have been written in recent years. Most of these medicinal cannabis products are unapproved therapeutic goods. Through the Special Access Scheme, the TGA can approve any medical practitioner to supply an unapproved medicinal cannabis product for an individual patient, typically within just a few days. In addition, under the Authorised Prescriber Scheme, scheme a suitably authorised doctor can pres prescribe products with, without obtaining patient-by-patient -patient approvals from the TGA. And as the evidence base is increasing, more prescribers are accessing unapproved medicinal cannabis products for their patients through these access pathways. As we learn more and as the science and research is done, more products will become available both as unapproved medicinal products and as medicines on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. I have no doubt there is a lot yet to learn about the possibilities and benefits of these products but this bill will do nothing to advance them, make them safer or more available. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be able to stand and give, make a brief contribution uh, to the Therapeutic Goods um, Poisons Standards February 2023, Instrument 2023, the Poison Standards. <laughs> um, this particular bill um, seeks to reschedule medicinal can cannabis to Schedule 4 allowing prescription by any medical practitioner. Uh, adopting a definition of cannabis that allows higher levels of uh, THC uh, up from 0.1 per cent to 1 per cent, which is below the recognised level for uh, any hallucinogenic response and harmonises Commonwealth law with state law, uh, and allowing a whole plant cannabis product with a limit of 1 per cent THC and 10 per cent cannabinoid uh, to be sold over the counter at a chemist or a veterinarian to persons over the age of 18 and retains the listing for hemp as a product for, uh, with existing limits unchanged. 
So, as I said, this bill provides for medical practitioners to be allowed to prescribe med medicinal cannabis for human and animal uh, applications, with supply made through any chemist for humans and veterinarians for animals. Um, the bill offers three categories. Um, if, uh, if the product is hemp seed and hemp seed oil containing 75 milligrams per kilogram or less of cannabinoid, cannabinoid uh, oil um, and 10 milligrams per kilogram or less of THC, it is a food product and excluded from the schedule. Um, if the product is above the allowable levels for food and below 1 per cent THC and 10 per cent C, uh, CBD, it is uh, a chemist vet only product. If the product is above 1 per cent THC or above 10 per cent CBD, the product is a prescription product only. So, in government, the coalition delivered the biggest reforms um, to medicinal cannabis that has changed the life of so many Australians through the Narcotic Drugs Amendment Medical Cannabis Bill in 2021. The bill amended the Narcotic Drugs Act to support an innovative Australian uh, medicinal cannabis industry for the benefit of Australian patients. It did so by reducing the burden of regulation in the licence assessment uh, process by providing for a single medicinal cannabis licence to replace the, the previous suite of licences required for cultivation, production, manufacture and research, and provided greater certainty to businesses uh, and reduced duplicative processes by providing for the majority of licences to be permanent. It also um, reaffirmed our commitment um, to patient availability for safe, legal and sustainable supply of cannabis derivative medicines. The Coalition's uh, Medicinal Cam Cannabis Bill replaced uh, the obligation for separate licences for any cultivation, production, manufacture and research activity with a single licence. Significantly, the majority of these single licences uh, are perpetual, uh, thus reducing the regulatory burden. The Coalition's bill maintained uh, the current um, specific supply pathways for medicinal cannabis, including for clinical trials under the Therapeutics Goods Act and approval for, um, approvals or authorities under the Act. Uh, they were supplemented by additional powers for medical scientific research uh, and additional clinical trials, provided that it did not involve administration to humans and the development of a reference standard. We also introduced a separate regulation-making power to prescribe additional supply pathways anticipated to ensure compliance with the goods manufacturing requirements under the Therapeutic Goods Act. Reminding us all of the reasons for the Medicinal Cannabis Regulatory Scheme, our bill also included a clear statement of its purpose and assurance that medical cannabis products are available to patients for therapeutic purposes. These changes maintained uh, the careful balance that, that the Act strikes between facilitating cultivation, production and manufacture of a cannabis drug, implementing Australia's obligations under the single covenant on narcotic drugs to safeguard against illegal practices, to provide for safe and sustainable pathways for patient access to medicinal cannabis therapies. Whilst the Coalition appreciates the work that One Nation has done with this bill and the intent of this bill, there remain some serious concerns around the details that would allow the scheduling of a medicinal cannabis product to a schedule for item. The Coalition has some further concerns about how this rescheduling would allow access through a medical practitioner. So at this time, the coalition is not in a position to support this bill. Senator Still, John. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Pres. Um, Deputy Pres, sorry. Uh, the Greens have a um, have a long history of campaigning uh, for uh, medical cannabis to be accessible and affordable uh, to the Australian community, and we welcome reforms that assist in achieving that goal. Um, and we're very proud to, to be here in the Senate as a party and as a political movement um, that have worked alongside advocates for the uh, greater access of medicinal cannabis uh, for decades, um, as well as campaigners who are working right now uh, to bring us to where we need to be in relation to the broader-based uh, legalisation of cannabis uh, more broadly um, as part of proper uh, drug law reform. Uh, 
Um, the Greens were part of the push uh, in this place uh, to start treating medical cannabis as a therapeutic drug. And I want to, play, uh, I want to pay really heartfelt tribute um, in my contribution uh, today um, to our former leader, Richard Di Natale, who championed uh, medical cannabis and drug law reform uh, more broadly. Uh, we know that medical cannabis uh, is an important drug. It is an important drug that is used to treat um, or alleviate mental health conditions. Let's just, let's just say this really clearly. right? Medical cannabis is a medicine, and it should be accessible to people that need that medicine in an affordable way. It is not good enough to say, well, this is theoretically available if you can jump through the many hoops that exist, if you can afford uh, the many additional charges that come with it. That does not, in fact, constitute an actual framework that is accessible uh, to the people uh, who actually need it. Um, we also know really clearly from the evidence that is given by so many in our community um, that this medicine uh, is used to relieve serious health conditions, um, such as epilepsy in children and adults, uh, treat the symptoms of multiple sclerosis, chronic pain, chemotherapy, uh, particularly uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea, uh, nausea uh, and, of course, uh, to, to ease the various, uh, the various symptoms um, and experiences of those uh, during palliative care. Uh, we knew uh, in the Greens that Australia needed to make this drug available as a therapeutic drug. Um, but most Australians who need medical cannabis still have no real way to access it. So it was very clear from the work that Richard did, that advocates have done for, very, for a very long time, that we needed to make this available as a therapeutic drug, and yet we sit here in 2023 in a, in a reality um, where most Australians who need medical cannabis still have no real way to access it. Because, as I said, if there is a theoretical legal pathway, that is fine. But if that legal pathway to access a medicine is full of uh, institutional and administrative barriers and is critically very expensive, then it is not practically available um, to the broad swathe of the community that actually need it. Um, now, this is resulting uh, in a reality where there is still a black market um, in Australia for medical cannabis because the government has not taken the necessary steps to make it fully available and to treat it as a legitimate therapeutic drug. Um, and I'm very uh, happy to be joined in the, the chamber by uh, Senator David Shoebridge, who is doing fantastic work um, on this broader question um, of the uh, legalisation uh, of cannabis in Australia and the ways in which the federal government must engage itself um, in that work. Now, the Senate inquiry that examined uh, access to uh, medicinal cannabis in Australia, which reported in 2020, made a series of landmark recommendations to significantly uh, improve the lives of Australian patients. Uh, the Community Affairs References Committee um, which uh, was led by uh, Dr Di Natale in his former role as our health spokesperson, um, heard of many of the failings of the current arrangements um, for accessing legal uh, medicinal cannabis project, uh, products in this country. The committee recommended that if current arrangements were not improved um, sufficiently enough in the next 12 months, mm -hmm. the government should consider establishing an independent regulator for medical cannabis. It's now been 36 months since that recommendation was handed down. The arrangements have been improved uh, in that period of time, but they do not go far enough. People are still relying on a black market to access medical cannabis simply because they cannot afford it. Simply because they cannot afford it. Not because they don't need it, not because they don't qualify for it, but they simply cannot afford it. This critical medicine, 
that they may need in the management of their epilepsy, that they may need in the management of their multiple sclerosis, that they may need in the, ma in the management of the terrible nausea that comes with chemotherapy to ease them in that palliative uh, phase of health care. They can't access it because they can't afford it. The government must provide a pathway for medical cannabis to be supplied under the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. We know this in the Greens, and the community knows this. The current pathway through which people are required to travel is too expensive and too complicated. Now, in the last uh, sitting week, I moved a second reading amendment um, to the Therapeutic Goods uh, Act of 2022 uh, measures bill, which we considered. Now, this amendment called on the government to ensure the afford that affordable medicinal cannabis pro uh, products were made available to all patients who require them for therapeutic use and to consider and implement the outstanding recommendations of the 2022 Community Affairs References Committee inquiry. So I put that men amendment to the Senate in the last sitting, and what was the result of that amendment? Well, both parties voted it down. Now, this is really not good enough, folks. We've got a situation where people need, act, need access to medicine, and those people have taken the time to give evidence to a Senate committee detailing, often evidence to a, a Senate committee in the context of really serious health conditions. So they shared with this place what needs to change. That committee said, these changes need to come into place in the next 12 months, or the government needs to act. 36 months on, little bit of action, not enough. No leadership uh, from the government in this place on that issue, when there are recommendations sitting before you uh, which you could so easily enact. Um, it is far past time that the Labor government ensure that medicinal cannabis is affordable for the Australian public. The lived experience and the research support it. And so do all the families that have cried out during so many of these investigations and reports uh, and actually need to access it. The Greens will continue to fight um, for access and affordability of medical cannabis alongside our broader work to legalise cannabis uh, for all Australians, which Senator Shoebridge uh, will shortly outline for the Chamber. Uh, lastly, I will say this for everybody um, that may be watching this debate feeling a bit frustrated uh, by the inaction of this government. Um, I think there is deep, deep cause for hope here. We saw uh, many uh, community campaigners um, across the country uh, pushing for years um, to see the rescheduling uh, of MDMA um, and psilocybin for the treatment uh, of PTSD and depression. Um, and the TGA and the government of the day dug its bloody heels in on that one for year after year. And the Greens, working with the community, and I want to particularly shout out uh, the wonderful campaigners and scientists and advocates and mental health professionals at Mind Medicine Australia for their continued uh, advocacy on this issue, they won. In February, they won. The TGA was forced to do a 180-degree turn on this and to reschedule it for the treatment at psilocybin and MDMA for the treatment of uh, PTSD and depression, opening up an incredible field of practice for the treatment of those really, really de debilitating conditions. So this can be done. Continued pressure will see change. By continuing to work together with the community, the Greens are committed to seeing an accessible and affordable pathway for medicinal cannabis for everyone. Thanks, Senator Still John. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to commend the words of my colleague, Senator Steele John, and the work that he's done in this space over a number of years. Uh, the Greens firmly believe that 
cannabis should be legalised. Recreational and medicinal cannabis should be legalised. So I note this bill is dealing um, with seeking to provide greater access to medicinal cannabis, and the Greens are on record as repeatedly pushing for greater access to medicinal cannabis. So um, I commend the Senator for bringing the bill to the House. The, the truth of the matter is that this parliament and different state and territory parliaments have legalised access to medicinal cannabis, but done so in a way that only people with wealth can access legalised cannabis um, through the current laws. So yes, if you have chronic pain, uh, if you have untreatable nausea, if you have uh, uh, untreatable depression, if you have a variety of extraordinarily debilitating illnesses where medicinal cannabis has been proven to be of enormous benefit and you have money, then you can access legalised cannabis in Australia. That's the combination. Um, but if you, if you have untreatable chronic pain, untreatable ongoing nausea, terrible effects potentially from an array of traditional medicines um, to, to deal with pain and nausea, and you go to a doctor and your doctor says, I think you could be best served by cannabis. Here's a prescription by can for cannabis. You then go to the pharmacy and then you realise it's $500 a month and you're on Centrelink. Mm -hmm. You're not getting legalised cannabis. You're not getting the medicine you need to help you. That's the state of the law in Australia at the moment. It's the state of the law and it's the reality. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality we need to fix. Mm -hmm. uh, in my work as the drug law reform spokesperson for the Greens, the issues with medicinal cannabis have kept coming back and back and back to my office as we've been moving to legalise recreational cannabis in this country. And, and indeed, I was at a public rally only in the last few weeks um, in regional New South Wales. And a woman came and saw me and said um, that she had had a cannabis prescription from her doctor for the better part of two years. And she'd had one round of cannabis prescription. She'd gone to the pharmacist, paid the three to four hundred dollars to get the cannabis prescription. It was amazingly beneficial. It was everything she'd wanted. Uh, it took her off a variety of uh, prescription painkillers. It was amazingly effective. But she could only afford it once. And since then, she'd had to go back on the drip of the highly addictive, deeply um, um, uh, uh, troubling uh, traditional painkillers under a traditional prescription, which she felt dumped her down, gave her nausea, affected her appetite, mm -hmm. affected her life, mm -hmm. because she couldn't afford the legalised cannabis. And then she said um, that, in fact, on occasion, she'd just been getting black market recreational cannabis, and that had been really helpful, and and um, and had been having the same effect. But she lived in regional New South Wales. And she had a choice then. She could get the black market recreational cannabis, which was having the same health benefits as the legalised cannabis at a fraction of the cost, um, uh, but then she couldn't drive. And if she couldn't drive, she couldn't go see a doctor. She couldn't go shopping. She couldn't ca catch up with her family. And so again, because of the way the laws operate, she then stopped taking the recreational cannabis and went back onto the prescription medicines again. There's this toxic mix of broken laws in relation to cannabis that all are founded on this political, damaging political consensus amongst the Labor Party and the coalition that says, and big pharmaceutical, I accept that interjection, that say we need to continue to legalise cannabis, it, we need to continue to criminalise cannabis in order to drive the profits of the pharmaceutical industries and in order to drive the moral agenda of the ALP and the coalition. And who's paying the cost of that? People who desperately need access to medicine. That's who's paying the cost of that. So yes, let's get on and radically reduce the cost of legalised cannabis. And let's come to this position that no matter what's in your wallet, no matter who your mum and your dad are, no matter what property you own, if you go to a doctor and a doctor says you need legalised cannabis, then you should be able to get it and afford it and treat your chronic pain, treat your health conditions. That's the way the world should operate in a country like Australia. And then when we do that, 
Let's also just legalise cannabis. Let's get the police and the courts and the criminal justice system out of something like 80,000 Australians' lives a year who are being prosecuted, criminalised, dragged through the criminal justice system because they're caught possessing one or two joints. Let's do that. Let's take perhaps what is a $25 billion a year market out of the hands of criminals and organised crime and bikey gangs because, according to the National Criminal Intelligence Commission and the data they have about the, the prevalence of cannabis use in the country, that's the size of the annual market on, ca on recreational cannabis at the moment, $25 billion a year. Let's take that out of the hands of the wrong people who use it to corrupt our political system, to corrupt our police, to corrupt our courts. Let's take it out of their hands. Let's legalise it. Let's put safety controls on it. Let's put uh, a truth in advertising controls on it. Let's put advertising controls on it. Let's deal with it like we're rational human beings. And then we could also reap some $28 billion in tax revenue in the first decade of doing that. Let's maybe deal with this like grown-ups. And, and I note Senator Sealjohn's comment, comments on how we've finally got the TGA to permit MDMA and psilocybin to be used from 1 July to deal with um, untreatable, otherwise untreatable depression and PTSD. And that's a major step forward. But it's almost as though we haven't learnt from the legalised cannabis debate. Because we see in reports today that getting access to MDMA um, or psilocybin under the system that's been set up by the TGA is going to cost patients something like $25,000 a year because of all the restrictions that apply to those drugs because they remain class one drugs and they have to set up all of these additional checks and balances and further reporting protocols every time they seek to get access to a medicine that could save their lives. And again, we're going to see that yes, this medicine is available, but only for those with the wealth to access it. And Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, think about the veterans who don't have that money with chronic PTSD and who will be going to their psychiatrist with the hope that they can get one of these prescriptions come 1 July. Psychiatrists say, write out the subscription, the prescription, give it to them. And then they'll say, and by the way, they've got $25,000 because that's what it's going to cost you. A veteran on a veteran's pension, surviving with all the troubles. See, by, by legalising this in this such a narrow way for, med for medicinal purposes and then putting all of these constraints on it and making it unaffordable, you're offering false promise. So let's get on. Let's get on and, and, and seriously legalise medicinal cannabis. Let's make it available to everyone who needs it, regardless of what's in their wallet. And let's try and come together as a chamber and as a parliament and actually legislate for good. Thank you, Senator Shubri. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. Um, I also rise to um, make some comments and add my support to the excellent contributions uh, from Senator Stilljohn and Senator Shoebridge. Uh, and I'd also like to start by acknowledging uh, the work uh, of many advocates over many years to get um, medicinal cannabis to where it is today. Uh, and particularly uh, Senator Richard Di Natale, who was a drugs and alcohol doctor before he went into politics, and he's continuing his work in that area post-politics. Uh, and he, uh, I remember him uh, speaking about it relentlessly in this chamber and having meetings um, for all parliamentarians in, in, in uh, the, co the committee meeting rooms with uh, people who are suffering terrible illnesses who were calling for the legalisation uh, of medicinal cannabis. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge the um, LNP for taking their first steps uh, in this regard, uh, especially in relation to uh, the limited access to medicinal cannabis we have today. Um, I remember, um, as agricultural spokesperson for the Greens, the, the irony uh, of seeing Minister Hunt at the time reducing uh, or removing restrictions for the, the growing uh, of medicinal cannabis in Australia f solely for the export market because we were able to grow uh, 
cannabis to uh, create CBD products and THC products uh, and sell into this um, you know, massively burgeoning uh, export market, but we weren't able to sell those Australian-grown products to Australian patients, which was obviously a ludicrous position to be in. And uh, I, I remember his media really specifically saying, you know, this is one of the biggest growth markets uh, in, in the world in terms of uh, agricultural products, high-value agricultural products. And that was a very similar time where we were seeing Canada remove restrictions and legalise uh, cannabis and other countries. And uh, it just seems so ironic that Australian patients couldn't access it at all legally. Yeah. Um, but look, that has changed. There is uh, limited access, and for those Australians who don't understand how it works, and it's still remarkable how many don't know that uh, you can access cannabis legally, um, you need to go to your GP, and your GP needs to then essentially recommend you to a specialist group of doctors uh, who uh, often do their consults online. Uh, an example would be a company would be uh, Tetra Health. Um, and so there's a number of specialist doctors around the country that have done what's required by the TGA to be able to prescribe cannabis, but many GPs just don't know about it. Yep. Uh, and I've had discussions with a lot of really good GPs, and a couple of them are close friends, and they just say, Peter, we don't have time. Look, we are, we are under the pump. Uh, every day with waiting lists of up to six weeks just on, on common colds and, and COVID and a whole range of things. We don't have time to go and do the course to be able to prescribe this. And so what they do is if you get a GP that is even on side, they will then recommend you to uh, a series of specialists. And those specialists will, uh, provided you get that referral and, and the doctor has to provide a medical reason, a very specific medical reason as to why you should uh, have access to medicinal cannabis. You then go through a process where um, you're assessed and you've got to fill in a number of forms. Uh, and, then, um, and that's usually by a nurse at the time. Uh, and then that gets passed on to uh, a doctor who's a specialist in this area. And, and, and then what happens is the doctor will work with you over a period of time in an assisted therapy. So they'll, they'll prescribe cannabis to you based on their consults with you, which can be quite extensive, uh, and they will then have a regular catch up with you to make sure that the medicine that they're prescribing is working for you and there's feedback loops. But it is really expensive. Um, these, these, these doctors uh, will charge a one-off fee just to start the process of, I think it's at least $300, and that's without even paying for your cannabis. Uh, and so, look, it's not accessible, as uh, Senator Shoebridge so eloquently put. It's not, ac it's not accessible to ordinary, everyday Australians. We asked the TGA, uh, Senator Steeljohn asked the TGA uh, at the uh, last estimates how many, I think it may have been Senator Shoebridge, I'm not sure, either one, they're both doing fantastic work in this area. What is the current number of Australians who are legally on uh, medicinal cannabis? And it's over 300,000 Australians have accessed the scheme, but we know that uh, estimates are for at least 800,000 Australians uh, using cannabis products. So there's a massive gap there of half a million Australians are using black market products that aren't regulated. Uh, and, this, and the sole reason for that is they don't have the money to afford the medicinal cannabis scheme. Um, so look, it, it, it's, it's good first steps, uh, what we've seen, and I do thank the previous government for the work that they've done on getting it to this stage. Um, I would also like to uh, throw my support behind the comments made uh, by both my colleagues in relation to MDMA and, and psilocybin. Um, this has been a long road, uh, and I would also very much like to thank Mind Medicine and, and a number of other advocates for their leadership on this issue. Australians shouldn't be denied the treatment and therapies that they need. Uh, and the thing about it's very similar to medical cannabis in the sense that if you're lucky enough to be eligible for this treatment now, um, it's very specialist and very expensive. And there's a number of bottlenecks that we need to get through. And I think Mind Medicine recently, I was on a uh, on a conference call with them, uh, with I think three or four hundred other Australians who were interested in this trial. Many of them doctors, by the way. Uh, and they did recognise there would be bottlenecks, for example, around um, the who could prescribe these products, how much they would cost, what that would look like, 
So it's very early days, and I, I would urge the government and the TGA to get through these as quickly as possible, because we know there are people who desperately need this, this treatment. And what Australians don't understand around MDMA and psilocybin is that the, the results have been so stunning in trials overseas that often, uh, and it's an assisted therapy also, you don't get given uh, an MDMA medicine script from your doctor. You go and work with a psychotherapist, usually a highly trained psychiatrist, uh, who at the moment, under the current TGA rules that were announced in February, um, need to register with the TGA, and that's another process in itself. We're not quite sure exactly what that looks like. Um, and these trials have been so stunning in their success, often it takes only two assisted therapy sessions for people like veterans with severe PTSD or end-of-life illnesses who are suffering you know, significant anxiety. Um, and Thankfully, uh, many of us aren't in, in that cohort of Australians that have been diagnosed with a terminal illness. They're obviously suffering pain, but the, the, the mental pain and stress, not just for them but for their families who are dealing with this, can be extraordinary and, and significant and dehabilitating. And a couple of assisted therapy sessions for people with these illnesses can make a significant difference. And um, we're not quite sure exactly how it works, but there's a lot of evidence that psilocybin, for example, and MDMA can essentially rewire the synapses in your brain that are failing. And this is also for another cohort um, of what's classified as terminally suicidal people, people who, who have got to the point in their life where they're literally going to take their own lives. All existing therapies have failed. And these drugs have this incredible ability to rewire your brain. Um, the plastic... The, the, it, it rolls around the plasticity of how your brain works, but for some people, parts of their brain have literally switched off. They don't work. And these drugs can actually connect those synapses and get... And I've, and I've seen the videos of it under, under uh, you know, using medical technology, looking at scans of brains. It literally lights up parts of the brains that have died in many people. And working with a trained psych uh, psychiatrist, um, they're able to bring these issues to, literally bring people's brains to life. Now, there's been a lot of stigma around the use of these drugs for many years. The whole war on drugs is a crikey, we could, we could talk about that for many, many hours, about what a waste of, waste of money and time and human life that has been, and energy. But I want to make this really clear. If you, if you look at the Greens policy on drugs, and you go to the website, and I invite all Australians to do that, where we do talk about decriminalising and legalising drugs, the very first sentence says, we recognise drugs can do harm. And that's why we need to take a harm minimisation approach to the use of drugs. We also recognise they can do a lot of good, such as the applications, the right applications of things like psilocybin or magic mushrooms and, uh, and MDMA. But this whole stigma around the, the, the war on drugs has essentially cut off the head of the medical applications of these drugs for so many years, and it's great that we're at least taking the first baby steps to to explore uh, the potential of these drugs. It is a whole new frontier uh, of medical science, and a very exciting one. And I know um, my medicine; many of their followers are, are budding graduates, uh, psych psychology, psych psychiatry, medical, who want to get into this field because it offers so much promise. Um, but we're talking about people here with very severe illnesses that nothing else has worked. Uh, and that is essentially why the TGA approved. If you read their, 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 their announcement on their media release, they said, we accept that um, other therapies haven't worked and by definition we need to give this a go. Mm. Um, and of course that raises the problem that because there hasn't been phase one to phase three trials of some of these drugs in Australia, um, that we don't have the, the, the information there. We can learn from the trials that are happening overseas, which are very promising, but because of the inertia and inaction in this country for so many years, we don't have that data. Um, and these trials will actually be a live social uh, experiment to provide that data for us, which I think is going to be extremely valuable. And the same applies to medicinal cannabis. The 300,000 Australians out there that are on 
this medicine, who are working with doctors, who are trained in this area, will provide us with very valuable information, I hope, to propel us to the next stage. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, the side that the other thing that we very rarely talk about is the potential in our agricultural communities. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, there are senators in this room that know uh, producers currently of, um, of medicinal cannabis or hemp. Um, hemp hemp's generally used for industrial applications and productions and has been used for thousands of years, as, as has cannabis. But hemp can be used for CBD products. Um, so basically your brain has cannabinoid receptors. I don't know if senators know that, but it's actually the most common receptor in the human brain. Why do our brains have cannabinoid receptors? Well, we've obviously evolved that way. So we know that these drugs can actually, uh, can actually light up parts of our brain. Uh, and we can use the CBD from hemp. However, um, the higher value uh, applications are in the growing of cannabis for either CBD oil, which has no THC in it, so you, you can take it and you're not, going to get, you're not going to get high, but it has very valuable properties for people with a, a number of illnesses. And then, of course, we have uh, THC products. And these are high value products for our agricultural communities. We have a number of growers in Tasmania. I think Tasmania is currently the biggest producer of cannabis. Much of it is still exported overseas. Um, Senator Urquhart knows some of the producers in her area in the northwest of Tasmania. I've been down and visited the compound of, Tas of, of Tasmanian Botanics uh, down outside of Hobart. Um, believe it, when I sat down with them for an hour, they had a, a number of complaints about how the process works, which I don't have time to go into today. Um, but clearly, we're still we're still getting this right, and there's things we can learn from our overseas the legalisation of drugs uh, overseas. Um, but they produce products that are now available through the Australian scheme, but they admit they are really expensive and hard to access. Mm. And of course, if we do legalise these, these drugs completely, they, you know, they will obviously be uh, able to grow these as well. But we do see overseas in California, um, there are a number of uh, growers in Northern California who are growing illegally for many years, and the government essentially sat down and worked with them to, to feed them into the legal scheme. Uh, and they became regulated, and um, I think it's been a big, a big success. So, um, look, this is—it's very encouraging that we're having a discussion today about how we can continue to advance this very exciting uh, frontier of medicine that I think is going to open up huge possibilities. I hope for also human development. Um, we can start seeing our world differently. Uh, we can start seeing each other differently. We can start exploring this frontier. Um, but it's got to be done the right way, and I, I think, um, you know, the bigger debate around legalising cannabis and removing this, again, finally walking away from this terrible war on drugs, uh, that literally has achieved nothing. Um, it's available it, on every street corner. We have people going and buying cannabis and other products in car parks or, you know, in dodgy circumstances. We have people on highly addictive drugs uh, with addiction issues. That is a health problem who are dying because we, we're, we're basically not assisting them in the way we should. Um, um, these people need our help. They don't need to be put into a criminal system where they're, essentially they're condemned for the rest of their life. Not to be able to get a loan, not be, not be able to get a job. We're creating a subclass of people in our <coughs> society. So the Greens are, are very pleased to be debating this bill today. Thanks, Senator Bush Wilson. Senator Roberts. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question before the Senate is the motion moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Government business order of the day. Number one, referendum machinery provisions amendment bill 2022. Resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Hume. Thank you. Senator MacDonald. Deputy President, uh, I continue my remarks from last night, and I had started speaking about uh, the history of pamphlets and the uh, ability for the government to to provide information on a yes and a no case to the Australian people. It is the first time, or it would have been the first time since 1928, that a pamphlet was not supplied to Australians. That sets a dangerous precedent. The pamphlet has been required since 1912, and there have been three referenda that have not had a pamphlet. That was in 1919, when there was insufficient time to produce one. In 1926, 
when there was no agreement on the yes argument, and so a pamphlet was not produced, and in 1928 agreement between parties and the government that there was no requirement for a pamphlet to be produced. Now, in 2023, none of those circumstances apply. And so uh, it is important that Australians have uh, a document produced that allows a neutral civic uh, education program on the yes and the no argument for this important decision which will change the constitution. We have to get agreement on how to argue the cases. Now, I've heard it said that there shouldn't be a pamphlet produced, that it is just creating a whole lot of material uh, to be pulped. And I think that is a really strange argument to say that the government shouldn't produce an important document because the uh, paper that it's written on will need to be recycled. Uh, I think that that is uh, really um, shortchanging Australians and their ability to have an informed decision. Now, official material is important. Uh, the AEC says that 40 per cent of voters use mail material as information when they come in to vote. And for all of us who stand on uh, booths and hand out how to vote at elections, uh, we would know that to be true, because at each time we see more people coming in with their material from the Australian Electoral Commission or if it's a state election from the, from the State Electoral Commission, because official material has weight and gravitas. Misinformation is incredibly dangerous and in this modern world of social media it is very easy and very fast for misinformation to be spread. And so official documents give voters peace of mind that this is something that has been weighed and considered and has been put to them and that they can trust that. And the parliament has a responsibility to ensure that Australians are well informed because constitutional change is not a minor thing. Referenda can be life-changing and that the onus is on government to remain the single reliable source of information in this regard. The ACCC has highlighted public concern with online information and journalism and it has also published data that's reported that, and I'm going to quote the ACCC, 92 per cent of the respondents to the ACCC news survey had some concern about the quality of news and journalism that they were consuming. And that is a major risk to the integrity of this debate. So official material increases trust in government and increases trust in the process. So simpler, a simpler regulatory environment and better conduct of the referendum are two uh, other issues that will make it easier for people to see, uh, see and feel confident uh, in the process. Because uh, it will be a terrible failure of this government to have not enacted a transparent, trusted process for this referendum to go ahead. Uh, because in the absence of that, Australians will feel they have no choice but to vote against it. And so that is the responsibility of the government to ensure that Australians are provided suitable materials and that they feel well informed, that they can trust and see the process uh, and they have confidence in that. The official campaign should bring structure, should bring clarity around the guidelines. Uh, and it is important, very important, that this education of electoral processes and, enfor and enforcement of the law are carried out. Um, that's why the disclosure and donation regime, which is the most complex part of the Electoral Act, uh, it is important that there is good disclosure for the integrity of the process to stand up. Uh, and it is incredibly important that we don't risk uh, uh, influence from unseen players, overseas players, who may seek to influence the outcome of this referendum. And so the disclosure of donations uh, is incredibly important. It may be that people will f uh, fall under the electoral law without their knowledge. It means that people may be breaking the law without realising it because they don't understand the complex part of the guidelines 
uh, for disclosure of donations under the Electoral Act. That is bad for integrity, but it's also not right that people should be breaking the law unintentionally, uh, because even the most well-informed people, political parties who are, have to understand this process, uh, don't always get it right. And official campaigns reduce the risk of this happening. Equal funding is also important, and the coalition had requested assurance of equal funding if any government funding is going to be provided because equal funding provides equal footing for both campaigns. Australia is a land of a fair go, and I don't think that Australians would like to think that one side of the argument is being supported with government funding, government institutions uh, and other processes where the other side of the argument is not equally supported. That doesn't seem fair. It's not right. And so equal funding levels that playing field. I've touched on the concern of foreign interference. Uh, ASIO has, has raised uh, these concerns. We are facing our greatest level of interference yet. Uh, it is a serious risk to national security, uh, to the strength of government, to online safety and misinformation. And there are simple steps that we could be taking to alleviate those risks. Uh, there are global examples of interference uh, in, in elections around the world. And Australia is not immune, despite being an island nation, a long way from other places. Uh, in this digital world, we are not immune to that kind of interference. And so we must guarantee integrity and trust in government processes. So I have been on the record that I uh, do not support the voice, but I absolutely support this referendum. I absolutely support the right of every Australian to be able to go to a voting booth and have their say. But I do think that it is equally important that this machinery of referendum uh, legislation that we're talking about now uh, does include these critical elements, uh, these critical elements of having uh, a, a pamphlet with the yes and no case provided in an independent and impartial manner by the government, uh, that there should be provision for both a yes and a no campaign and there should be equal funding. That is the fair thing to do, that is the right thing to do for Australians who are making this very, very important decision to change our constitution, a document that has served us incredibly well, that has allowed us to be a very stable nation uh, for the last hundred years. So I'm not speaking against this bill, but I'm raising the very real concerns that I have uh, and I will wait for the government's responses on these important points. I hope that they work constructively to strengthen the referendum process because, as I said previously, it will be the government's failure uh, to have a successful referendum if they do not provide a transparent, trusted process of integrity that allows Australians to vote with confidence. In the absence of their confidence, uh, then uh, Australians will have no choice but to vote no. They will have no choice because that is the conservative, cautious thing to do. So it is in the government's best interest, as they have clearly stated, as they support the voice uh, referendum and change to the constitution, it is in their interest to make sure that this process is as fully fleshed out uh, as possible. Because I have to tell you that as I get around uh, my parts of the country, northern Australia in particular, most people have never heard of The Voice. They've never heard uh, that there's going to be a referendum within the next 12 months. It is not something that is on people's minds and lips, and, uh, and particularly given that we've just had flooding right across northern Australia. Uh, the government um, seems to be treating it fairly lightly. There's been very, very poor response despite the fact that we had floods in northern Australia uh, only uh, in 2019. That response, uh, I've just had mayors from local councils uh, in my office, they're telling me that that response then was faster, more effective, more comprehensive than this response now. And I hope that given all the advice that uh, Minister Watt has provided to government in the past, that he is now able to have learnt from his uh, 
his experience in the past. So I look forward to uh, further amendments to this legislation. Thank you. Senator Payne. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In speaking to uh, the bill before the chamber this morning, the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022, I want to start by recognising the importance of this bill and the importance of the issues that will be considered should this bill be successful uh, and uh, a referendum bill brought back to this parliament. I acknowledge this is a machinery bill. It's not the substantive referendum question. But I have to say, like a number of my colleagues have commented in the chamber, and uh, may I commend Senator Macdonald on her very, very good remarks here this morning, I am somewhat mystified by the approach of the government, who apparently seriously and genuinely want to progress a referendum on this matter to a successful outcome. But personally, I am not seeing an approach that I find persuasive, that I think Australians find persuasive, from the government to achieving that successful outcome. And that, frankly, concerns me, because it needs to be a constructive and positive process. I do think governments in a position where they are advancing a change to the founding document of our nation, I do think governments need to be prepared to listen and to engage and to take on board constructive suggestions, criticism even, of the content, if you like, of the substance uh, that they are intending to put before the Australian people so that it has the best chance of success. One of the mystifying aspects of this process is even the reference to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters of this bill in the first place, referred on the 1st of December 2022, the day the parliament rose for the year is when it was referred to the committee. Now, we were prepared to work and we did. Deputy Chair Senator McGrath is here in the chamber with me this morning. We had hearings uh, on the 19th of December and on the 9th of January, but really a reference to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters on a bill as important to this over the Christmas break and the new year doesn't smack to me of seriousness from government in wanting it genuinely considered. But I particularly want to thank uh, the members of the committee and the chair and the deputy chair, but those who took the effort, notwithstanding the time of year, to make submissions and to participate in that process because their insights were very valuable to the committee. And it is important to look at the Referendum Act. As the committee report observes, that act has not been substantially updated uh, to reflect the modernisations in Australia's federal electoral framework, let alone uh, the other challenges that we face. And a uh, number of speakers in the chamber have adverted to those, particularly in terms of misinformation, disinformation, manipulation of electoral processes, social media, uh, technology advances and all the things that go with it. But it hasn't been updated for, uh, for many years. In fact, not since, uh, certainly not since the last referendum was held in 1999. Now, I was substantially involved in that referendum in 1999, for better or for worse. Uh, and I do acknowledge that there need to be changes made to contemporise uh, the, the legislation. My involvement in, uh, in that referendum at the time uh, was as uh, particularly a former deputy chair of the Australian Republican movement, uh, and I know, I know what a negative referendum outcome feels like if you are a strong proponent of the case being put before the Australian people. Uh, and I know how important it is to try to take a constructive approach to, uh, to avoid that, I would say, Madam Acting Deputy President. One of the key matters that has been of concern to the opposition is the provision of an official pamphlet. And it was certainly of concern to the coalition members of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters uh, as well. And uh, we produced a dissenting report uh, to that, uh, to that um, 
committee uh, report, uh, which made certain observations about uh, the importance of uh, the official pamphlet. And the evidence that was given to the committee on the official pamphlet was, in many cases, compelling. Not everybody agreed. Absolutely acknowledge that. But I found um, it persuasive uh, that that evidence that came before us uh, from a number of, uh, of witnesses and a number of submitters uh, was, uh, was very strong. The Australian Human Rights Commission, for example, uh, submitted that while it might be um, appropriate to modernise the form in the distribution of the pamphlet, it remains a valuable document which provides electors with the views of their elected officials. Central Land Council. They expressed their concern, a very important body uh, in, uh, in remote Australia for Indigenous Australians, that, the, that not providing a physical posted pamphlet in remote areas would leave some people, particularly older people and elders, without reliable access to information about the referendum, especially given the barriers to tele telecommunications access in some communities. And that is from paragraph 1.32 of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters report uh, on this matter. We heard a range of arguments in that committee process uh, for improving rather than suspending the official pamphlet to address concerns about its content and its method of distribution. Uh, and it was not part of the government's plan when they uh, initiated this bill in December last year to include a pamphlet. Uh, but I note that uh, we have made progress on that, and, uh, and I think it is uh, very important. The explanatory memorandum uh, for the bill originally said that there may be a more effective way to engage and inform the Australian public about the constitution and proposed constitutional change. I find that um, the explanatory memorandum particularly informative um, about those ways. And that's the problem here with the government's current approach to the referendum question itself uh, as well. I don't think that Australians feel particularly well informed about the specific amendment to the constitution that is being proposed. So the pamphlet, while not always perfect, and certainly uh, some of the imperfections were highlighted in, uh, of, of historic imperfections were highlighted in parts of the evidence given to the committee, it has been an important tool. Madam Acting Deputy President, to try to understand uh, the government's approach to uh, these matters, matters of considerable substance in terms of the operation of a referendum. Uh, the committee coalition members and senators sought to ask relevant ministers uh, to, uh, to, to meet with the committee, to provide evidence to the committee, Minister Burney and Minister Farrell. Now, I stand to be corrected, but to the best of my knowledge, um, the letter sent by the deputy chair in relation to that uh, to the chair of the committee, uh, Ms Thwaites, uh, did receive a response from Ms Thwaites, but I don't believe that Senator McGrath received a response to his correspondence from Minister Burney or from Minister Farrell. So they, they remain outstanding. And I don't understand that. I don't understand why ministers with a positive disposition to try to achieve a successful outcome for this referendum question would not be prepared to talk to a committee of parliamentary colleagues. That request was declined, as I said, by the committee chair, Ms Thwaites, and we were pointed to the second reading speech. Uh, we were told by um, Ms Thwaites that the government's rationale for the proposed legislative changes is contained in the second reading speech of the bill. Well, taking that advice, I went to the second reading speech, and I would say that it was a remarkable speech in at least one way, not for its content, but rather for its absence of content. I reread it as directed by the chair to try to determine the government's rationale for some of the changes they are making in this bill, but after rereading it, uh, I was indeed none the wiser. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, there are other issues of concern to the coalition in this bill, and they've been well articulated by a number of my colleagues, and particularly by Senator Hume, the Shadow Minister. Senator Hume said in her second reading speech uh, yesterday uh, that 
We should treat the changes to the machinery of referenda without consideration of what the referendum question might be. That uh, the rules that are established under uh, the, uh, the Act and, uh, through this, and that will be established through this bill should be rules that keep, and she said, balance, fairness, legitimacy and trust in how we change our founding document. I absolutely concur with Senator Hume's words. Our founding document is important. It is precious to many Australians. Some aspects of the bill we have supported. Uh, including in the Joint Standing Committee on electoral, uh, electoral Matters process, as I have uh, outlined. I don't underestimate the importance of the substantive matter which will be the subject of this referendum. Not for a moment. I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition, Peter Dutton, and the Shadow Attorney General and Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Julian Lisa, for the considered way that these matters are being engaged upon within the coalition. For my own part, I come to these matters with goodwill. I have a generally constructive disposition to this bill and on the substantive issue, but I hold very deep, serious concerns in relation to the approach being taken by the government. In the broad, Australians respect our constitution. We amend it rarely and sparingly. Many a referendum question has gone down, notwithstanding the best, most well-intentioned efforts of its strongest advocates. I refer again to the referendum on Australia becoming a republic. I was the deputy chair of the Australian Republican movement before I entered the Senate. I was the strongest supporter of that constitutional change, of the, operation, of the formation and operation of Liberals and Nationals for an Australian head of state. But it failed. We went everywhere. We did everything we could. We stood alongside all of our colleagues from across the parliament, Labor and coalition colleagues, together to campaign. But it failed. For those standing in that position now, for those strongest advocates of the proposition that will be put forward through this referendum, and again seeking clarity on that from the government is, I think, very important. For those in that position now, the Australian people do want clarity. They want to know the answers to the sorts of questions that the opposition leader has proposed to the Prime Minister. They want to know the clear wording that it's proposed to use in changing our constitution. For Australians to be able to have the opportunity to express their views, we don't want to stand in the way of that process. But I do think it is so important for those concerns of genuine, committed Australians that are being raised for those concerns to be taken on board by government if they are genuinely seeking a successful outcome to a substantive referendum. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President. Of the 44 referenda held in this country, only eight have passed. The last referendum proposal to pass was in 1977. Not only does this show that Australians take referenda very seriously, but also that, as Robert Menzies said, to get an affirmative vote from the Australian people on a referendum proposal is one of the labours of Hercules. It is of the essence of any referendum that the Australian people are presented with a question to which they answer yes or no. This seemingly simple setup belies the complex sets of reasons people might have for choosing one answer over the other. This is why it is crucial to present voters with a clear and comprehensive yes and no case so that all Australians can make an informed decision. Every government since 1928 has agreed with this and provided pamphlets to voters. If it proceeds, the referendum on an Indigenous voice to parliament will be one of the defining political moments of our time. 
The voice has the potential to change the way our Federation is governed. It does not represent a merely procedural amendment to our Constitution. This referendum deserves fairly funded yes and no campaigns. And I am deeply concerned about the consequences if that does not occur. This referendum deserves yes and no pamphlets. It deserves the full attention of this parliament and this government. Instead, very regrettably, what this government has given the Australian people reflects a process which is undermined by a profound lack of fairness. The government has declined to fund yes and no campaigns, setting a dangerous precedent for future referenda, uh, but of course, most significantly, undermining the integrity of this referendum process. The Australian people deserve better. It is patronising to assume that Australians do not need to receive official material associated with referenda. The Australian Electoral Commission reports that 40 per cent of recipients use its mailed material, a pamphlet setting out the yes and no case, as a main source of information in casting their vote. That said, Acting Madam Deputy President, we are encouraged by indications from the government that it will reverse its decision and agree to a yes and no pamphlet. This is not just a matter of fairness, but critical to our democratic process. It is, I will and put on the record very strongly, it is deeply concerning, however, that the government thought it could get away with a smoke and mirrors approach to this referendum. And I hope and trust that on this point, common sense will prevail and there will be a yes and no pamphlet received by all Australians. We know that electoral events, and this is a very important point to make in relation to ensuring that all Australians receive appropriate information. We know that electoral events are opportunities for bad actors to use misinformation to influence voters. The ACCC reports that 92 per cent of the respondents to the ACCC news survey had some concern about the quality of news and journalism they were consuming, and that analysis has identified concerning consumer and competition harms across a range of digital platform services that are widespread, entrenched and systemic. Only weeks ago, the Director-General of ASIO told Australians that we are currently experiencing the greatest level of foreign interference in Australia's history. Let me just say that again. The greatest level of foreign interference in Australia's history. It would be naive in the extreme to think that foreign actors who desire to disrupt and undermine our democracy will not seek to spread misinformation in relation to the referendum on The Voice. Uh, we have seen foreign influence at work in Canada and in Europe very openly, and we know that we are not immune. So in the name of fairness, integrity and democracy, the Albanese government must fund official yes and no campaigns. This will give Australians the confidence that the referendum is being conducted transparently, fairly and with integrity. Having official yes and no campaigns would minimise the risk that the referendum process will be undermined by any sort of misinformation campaign, no matter the source of that misinformation campaign. The government has said it will fund a fax campaign to the tune of 9.4 million. I am concerned that this may be an underhanded attempt to ensure that its own view on the voice prevails. The Prime Minister recently told, reportedly, the Labor caucus that the government needs to minimise scare campaigns in relation to The Voice. Instead of doing the right thing and funding both sides equally, the government has decided to fund 
arguably the Yes case by proxy through its fax campaign, and that's why it's so critically important that any factual campaign must be delivered in a way that is completely neutral. How can we trust the government to ensure a fair referendum process when, and I say this respectfully, uh, the government has already broken so many of its promises to the Australian people? Promises on power prices, on interest rates, on mortgages, on superannuation and even on registered nurses in aged care homes. So, Australians deserve to have the absolute crystal clear clarity in relation to the machinery as to how this referendum will be conducted. All Australians have a right to have their say, and that's why getting this machinery bill is so important. Unlike the government, we do not want to stand in the way of Australians having their say fairly and with integrity. We want Australians to be free to exercise their free will, their free choice, free of foreign interference, free of foreign influence, free of government pressure, free of misinformation. This freedom is fundamental to the maintenance of our democracy and the integrity of our constitution. Democracies are not merely measured by what their citizens vote for, but how they vote. The framers of our constitution understood this, which is why they inserted section 128, the referendum provision. Referenda represent the soul of representative democracy in this country. They are a means by which Australians are meant to express their true view on matters of fundamental importance. It was with a referendum that Indigenous people were counted as Australians in 1967. Once again, Australians have been called to vote on a matter of fundamental importance, the establishment of an Indigenous voice. Why does the government continue to insist that Australians can't make an informed decision about this? by denying them an official yes and no campaign. There is no doubt that the legitimacy of the referendum result will depend heavily on the manner in which the referendum process is conducted by the government. The government needs to ensure that, especially on a matter as important as the voice, the referendum is conducted with complete impartiality and unquestionable integrity. Why does it hesitate to do this? Surely, surely this is counterproductive. Shortly, surely there is the risk that the government may in fact harm its own case for a yes result in the referendum. Regrettably, the government has tried to wriggle out of its responsibility to ensure a fair referendum process ever since it announced its intention to hold one. And I think this says a lot about the trust and the way the government trusts the Australian people to make their own choices. Um, this is too important for the government to attempt to make the choices for Australians. I also want to flag my deep concerns about other matters concerning the referendum. The refusal of the Prime Minister to answer 15 very reasonable questions put to the Prime Minister by the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Dutton. And it is also deeply concerning that within a number of months before Australians are meant to go to this referendum, uh, we still don't know the wording, the proposed wording that would be put to the Australian people. There is also a very live debate which continues about the scope of the powers of the voice, along with many other questions. And I have to say, I think in many respects the government has made a real mess of this and undermined this process because it has not been able to 
it has not been able to address so many fundamental questions. And the bottom line is Australians do have a right to know those questions. And Australians should not be required to answer yes or no until those questions are answered. So I stand here today to defend the right of all Australians to be presented with a real choice at this referendum, a genuine choice informed by fair and balanced information from yes and no campaigns receiving fair and equal funding. Um, like my colleagues and most recently um, Senator Payne in her contribution, I too want to adopt a constructive approach to this bill. But the government must establish a level playing field. <coughs> Getting this bill right is so important. If this bill is not right, this is going to do this whole process fundamental damage. It has never been more important to ensure that our referendum machinery provisions are fit for purpose. And again, and I say Senator Farrell is in the chamber, and I say to Senator Farrell, we really need to get this right. So I call on the government to do the right thing by the Australian people and let them have their say in a manner which is fair and in a manner which is, does, not, does not undermine the integrity of this very important process and the decision that all Australians must make. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Senator Birmingham. Thank you very much. Acting Deputy President, as colleagues have noted, Australians do not change the Constitution of Australia lightly. Only eight of 44 referenda conducted in Australia have been successful. And the last successful referendum was conducted in 1977. Many members of this parliament, of this place, many voters were not alive at the time the last successful referendum proposal was put to the Australian people. Nor should Australians change our constitution lightly. It is our foundational document as a nation that brought the colonies, the states together as states of the Commonwealth of Australia, of a new and independent nation. And we have been an incredibly successful nation, a successful nation that stands tall in the world in terms of the success of our democracy underpinned by our constitution. We have been successful in terms of the harmony of our nation. Not perfect, and indeed we have many lessons in our history that we should learn and that we should seek to address continuously throughout our efforts as leaders. But this important foundational document doesn't just have a proud history, it also has profound legal implications. It is the document upon which our High Court ultimately determines a range of different factors about the validity of laws passed through this parliament and their application in Australia, and it makes those determinations critically uh, against the fundamental foundational document of our nation, the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia. And so to be able to change that constitution against the backdrop of such limited embrace of change by Australians over such a long period of time, a successful referendum has many prerequisites. The first of those is confidence, confidence in the process of that referendum. That, Acting Deputy President, is where this bill comes in. This bill comes in in ensuring that we have a process, if we are to approach a referendum later this year, that has integrity and that Australians recognise has integrity. A process that is fair and that Australians consider to be fair. And a process that will underpin respectful debate during the conduct of the referendum. It is against those pillars of ensuring the integrity, 
the fairness and the respect in the conduct of this debate that the coalition and the opposition have engaged in the debate about the referendum machinery amendment bill before this chamber. We have engaged through the process of the committee work, which my colleagues, Senator McGrath, Senator Payne and others have spoken about and engaged so comprehensively in. We have engaged through this chamber and, indeed, we have engaged uh, under the leadership of Senator Hume directly in dialogue and discussions with the government to seek to ensure that integrity, that fairness and that respect through the conduct of the referendum. We have asked particularly for there to be a restoration of uh, the traditional means of communication of a formal yes and no case through the pamphlet that has been part of, a feature of, uh, those 44 previous referenda. We have asked for there to be recognition officially of yes and no campaign organisations, and we have asked for uh, an appropriate level of funding in relation to those organisations. It's my understanding, Acting Deputy President, from uh, the comments of the government that they have accepted the import of providing uh, the official yes and no case through the traditional means of communication with the Australian people. That is important because it provides particularly for greater confidence in the respect of the debate that will be had, confidence around some of the guardrails that may exist around that debate. From my perspective, the fact that there will be a proper process for proper arguments to be laid out in a considered way and shared with all Australians for the yes case and the no case, hopefully can ensure that the debate is conducted with the greatest degree of respect, with the greatest degree of consideration for opposing views uh, and in a manner that leaves the worst sometimes uh, of political and democratic debate uh, outside uh, of this important issue and the way in which it's considered. In terms of campaign organisations, of course, there are many seeking to engage in this campaign. Some are doing so through the establishment of separate organisations, and I know the government has already provided deductible gift recipient status uh, to an organisation committed to advocating for a voice, and I trust that they will work in an equitable way uh, to provide uh, the same status uh, to a deductible gift recipient organisation uh, who is committed uh, to campaigning uh, for the no case all in the interest of fairness and equity in relation to these matters. Acting Deputy President, in relation to the third of those requests that we have uh, around the question of funding, I'm on the public record as saying I don't wish to see many millions of taxpayer dollars uh, committed uh, to massive television advertising campaigns for the yes and no case, but that I did believe that, uh, that some element of at least seed funding for organisations to be able to meet basic requirements would be sensible. I continue to urge the government uh, to think about that carefully, but I also urge them to ensure that in relation to the expenditure of public funds, they maintain the integrity uh, of our electoral systems where the government does not spend taxpayer dollars favouring one side of a debate or the other and that that is important for them to do that in relation to any aspect of public spending uh, on this matter, uh, and that they approach this in a way where if government funds are to be spent, they should be spent solely in relation to the conduct of the referendum, in relation to the turnout of the vote, in relation to the basic facts that apply uh, to this uh, referendum, and not, not acting deputy president uh, in terms of favouring one side or the other through this campaign. I hope we can, through the committee stage, hear the government address those issues and that we can reach a point where there will be bipartisan support for the terms upon which this referendum will be conducted. It may not address absolutely every point uh, that my coalition colleagues have made through this debate uh, and in the public arena prior to it entering this chamber, but I hope that we can reach a point where there will be sufficient confidence that the process going forward has integrity, is fair and will help to enhance respect for this debate. I do, while speaking on this, on this topic, wish to touch a little on the substantive issue of the voice. 
the voice to parliament, which of course was a proposal put in the Uluru Statement from the heart that grew out of initial proposals for constitutional recognition of First Australians, of our Indigenous peoples. I'm somebody who's long supported the concept of constitutional recognition. The voice adds another layer to that. And we should be honest, it adds a complexity to the debate uh, that will be had in terms of the referendum. As I've indicated, change is not made easily to our constitution and change will not be easily achieved in relation to this referendum. There's that history of failure in relation to constitutional change that we should be mindful of. Australians are more likely to say no than yes. History tells us that, uh, and that is because of uh, a cautious approach that they bring to the changes to our constitution, to the changes to that foundational document. We should not see this proposal for the voice and the constitutional change for it to be directly analogous to the very successful 1967 referendum. That referendum was a remarkable point in Australian history, but if we look carefully at the detail of it, it was a referendum that sought to remove specific aspects of discrimination against Indigenous Australians. That was right, it was proper, and we can be proud that as a nation it was embraced as comprehensively as it was. This referendum, though, will seek to apply a form of affirmative action, if you like, in relation to Indigenous Australians, which by its very means, by its uh, very nature, will mean that fair-minded Australians, supportive of equality of treatment of each and every one of us, will require slightly greater persuasion, slightly greater convincing to support that type of affirmative action principle to establish a unique, differential voice, a constitutionally enshrined voice uh, that will provide for Indigenous Australians to have that particular right enshrined within our constitution. That's not to say that it shouldn't occur, but it is to acknowledge that, unlike the removal of a form of discrimination, that type of approach of enshrining a form of affirmative action will require greater persuasion and convincing of Australians as to the merits of doing so and greater reassurance against any risks in doing so. This referendum also will not be analogous to the more recent same-sex marriage plebiscite, one that we all lived through and indeed most of the members of this chamber participated in in one way or another. There are the obvious differences between those. Uh, that, uh, that, of course, was not a change to the constitution, but simply uh, a legislative proposal. It was not a referendum uh, in the full sense of the meaning of that, but a postal vote plebiscite. But there is also a fundamental difference between the two in that the question of complexity is different. Changing the Marriage Act was easily understood by Australians. They're all either married or they know plenty of people who are married. And there was nothing complex about the concept of enabling two people of the same sex to get married, just the same as we enabled two people of opposing sex to get married. People had strong views and differences of opinions, absolutely, but it was an easily understood change. The voice, however, raises many questions. Questions of its scope, questions of its structure, questions of its construct, questions of its powers, and Australians will consider those questions during the debate on The Voice. The challenge of this referendum is shaping as more akin to the challenge that Australia faced in the last attempted constitutional change, which of course was for a republic. My friend and colleague Senator Payne spoke about her involvement uh, in that. Uh, as indeed was I involved in that debate, both of us unsuccessfully. And so we recognise, as others should, the difficulty and complexity that comes with achieving that type of constitutional change in persuading Australians to make the change. Therefore, governments and advocates need to do everything they can to make this proposal succeed. 
I say that as someone who has long supported constitutional recognition, and I say that as someone who doesn't wish to see a referendum put to voters and fail, because I believe there would be negative consequences of that occurring. So what does the government need to do to give it the maximum chance of success? Firstly, to ensure fairness in the conduct of the referendum, hence the debate we're having in this place about the way in which the referendum is structured. Secondly, to ensure they pursue constitutionally minimalist change. The government should be seeking to ensure that the most conservative of constitutional scholars accept the narrowness of the constitutional change that is proposed, the fact that it will purely, solely empower the parliament in the establishment of a voice and the scope of that voice and the powers of that voice and the construct of that voice so as to provide maximum confidence that, whilst, that this question will achieve recognition and will establish a voice but will in absolutely no way uh, create other legal challenges or considerations in relation to the power of the parliament or the operation of government. And thirdly, the government needs to make sure that it provides details to give Australians confidence that those questions have been answered and that when they vote, the details have been considered in advance. Yes, it will be a voice established by the parliament, but in providing the details in advance, Australians will have greater confidence than if they simply hear answers that say those are matters to be resolved later. I urge the government to act on all three pillars because I don't wish to see this put and fail. I do wish to see us achieve constitutional recognition, and it starts with getting this bill right. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Mr uh, Acting uh, Deputy uh, President, uh, I'd, um, <coughs> I welcome those uh, comments uh, of um, uh, Senator Birmingham and hope that in the course of the next few minutes or hours, um, hopefully not days, uh, I can answer uh, <coughs> all of the issues that uh, you've uh, um, <coughs> raised in a uh, satisfactory uh, fashion that will result in uh, this chamber uh, um, passing the referendum machinery provisions amendment bill um, with um, a very strong support from uh, the chamber. Uh, I'd like to thank all of those in this chamber who have made and contributed uh, to the debate on this uh, referendum machinery provisions amendment bill of 2022. Uh, I'd especially like to thank uh, Senator Hume and her staff for the uh, terrific in engagement that uh, we've had over the last uh, few days and weeks um, about this uh, legislation. I'd also like to thank uh, Senator Waters and her staff uh, for their <coughs> very uh, constructive uh, contribution uh, to, the, uh, to the debate. And also uh, Senators po Pocock, Thorpe, um, <coughs> Lambie, um, Babette and uh, Senator Roberts and his uh, team. Uh, for their uh, constructive uh, uh, engagement in this uh, bill. I think it's an example of how um, we get the best out of the Senate uh, with, uh, uh, with as much consultation as, uh, as we possibly can and as much engagement uh, with all of the relevant uh, groups as we can. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank my staff um, uh, who've worked very dil diligently, particularly overnight, um, to um, um, get the best possible uh, result for the Australian community out of this uh, very significant uh, um, change to the referendum legislation. Uh, I'd also uh, take the opportunity to recognise and thank the members of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters for their review of the bill uh, and for their continued consideration of matters relating to electoral laws and practices. Uh, which we hope to bring back to the parliament uh, later, uh, later in this year. Um, referenda are an integ integral, integral part of our democracy. However, the last referendum was held over 22 years ago, Mr Acting Deputy President, as you will recall. Since that time, the Referendum Machinery Provision Act <coughs> of 1984 uh, has not kept pace with the changes to the Commonwealth Electoral Act of 1918. <clears throat> the bill makes amendments to replicate current electoral machinery provisions into the referendum context to ensure the voting processes and experiences 
are similar to that of a federal election. The bill will also ensure that integrity and transparency measures that currently apply to federal elections will also apply to referenda. This includes the establishment of a financial disclosure framework for referenda to support transparency and accountability with respect to the funding and expenditure. A decision to change our constitution is a significant national event and it has been more than two decades since a change has been proposed. It's therefore important that the government uh, can uh, fund a civics can education uh, campaign uh, in relation to the up and coming referendum on the, on the voice. And I can also confirm that uh, a no campaign um, application for DGR status uh, will be treated under exactly the same processes uh, as those who uh, may apply for the yes campaigns. Um, the government notes the recommendations of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters inquiry into the bill and intends to further consider uh, the committee's recommendations relating to increased enrolment and the participation and the provision of information to voters. The amendments in this bill are important and necessary to deliver a modern referendum um, in which the voting processes and the experience is similar to that of a federal election. And once again, I thank my colleagues for their contribution and commend the bill. Thank you, Minister. Now, um, I have an amendment uh, moved by Senator Hume on behalf of the Opposition on page 1817. The question is that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by uh, Senator Hume be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Pratt as teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 36 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. There is a further second reading amendment, but I understand it has not yet been moved. I'm going to move on. I'm now going to move that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson. I had an amendment to that second reading. Senator Hanson, I did call you twice. You need to pay attention. I have read the bill a second time. I'll seek advice from the clerk.
I am uh, happy to seek the indulgence of the Senate, um, Senator Hanson. Thank you. So there, uh, we have agreement. You can now move the second reading amendment. All right. I move the, my uh, second reading amendment. So the question is that the amendment, as moved by Senator Hanson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes. One minute. Uh, close the doors. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts, teller for the ayes, and Senator Cadell, teller for the noes.
Uh, the result of the division is ayes 3, noes 54. The question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to referendums and for related purposes. I understand that will be a committee stage, and so we will uh, move into committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills stand as printed. And I will throw to. Uh, who do I. Uh, I'll throw to the minister. Yeah, I, um, thank you, um, uh, Chair. I table two supplementary explanatory memoran memoranda relating to the uh, government amendments uh, to be moved uh, to this bill. Thank you, Minister. And I will throw to Senator, um, Senator Farrell. Could you repeat what you just did, then, please, for the assistance of Senator Waters? So the Minister tabled two supplementary explanatory memoranda relating to government amendments being moved into this bill. Okay. I will now throw to Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Minister, can you confirm? that if a no campaign organisation sufficiently applied for deductible gift recipient status, that it would be granted? Minister. Uh, yes, uh, Senator. Uh, the, um, uh, the rules applying to um, the uh, no case are the same as uh, those applying to the, uh, the yes case. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I also be very clear in my understanding that while there is no funding that will be provided for campaigns for or against the proposal, uh, that there will be equal treatment to the campaigns for or against the proposal? Minister. Um, yes, that's correct, uh, Senator. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I also note that while there is a prohibition on government expenditure that is included in these amendments, uh, that that uh, prohibition on government expenditure uh, will uh, not preclude expenditure on a neutral civics education campaign and activity? Minister. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, that's correct, uh, Senator. <laughs> Senator Hume. Can I also, Minister, confirm that any activity in, uh, a, new, in, a, in a civics or education program or activity is, in fact, going to be neutral? Minister. That's correct, uh, Senator. Senator Hume. Uh, Thank you, Chair. I would like to note that the opposition will be supporting the amendment and that we would very much like to thank the constructive way in which it has engaged, um, uh, the, the government has engaged with the opposition to ensure that this bill, in its final form, is in a way that the opposition can support it. Uh, Mr Minister Farrell, in particular, and his staff have um, demonstrated good faith and have worked very hard with me and my office on this bill. We have many more questions that we will be asking of the government throughout this process, but I can confirm that we will be supporting this amendment. Minister. Can I thank uh, that uh, confirmation from uh, Senator Hume and uh, again reiterate my thanks to her and her staff for the constructive way in which they have engaged with the government. Um, about this legislation, and I think it's an example of um, how um, constructive the government uh, and opposition can work together to get the best result for the Australian people. 
Thank you. I, just so I can clarify the question before the chair, I think I might need you, Senator Farrell, to move um, amendments one and two on sheet QE100. If we, if that's what you're talking about, um, Chair, I'd like to move all government amendments together. Um, so, just to be clear, um, we're not proceeding with amendments on sh sheet ZD205, um, um, but I do seek uh, leave to move government amendments on sheet PX. Uh, 151, <coughs> PX149, PX150, QE100, um, <coughs> uh, ZB195, but noting that Senator Pocock uh, has uh, Senator D. Pocock, I think that would be, um, <coughs> circulated an amendment to this amendment. <coughs> and I seek uh, to uh, seek leave to move all of those uh, together. Uh, is, is leave granted for that? Uh, leave is granted. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. I'd just like so, to. So, sorry, sorry, Senator Waters, sorry. Okay, Senator, Senator Walters, you have the call. Thank oh, you. sorry, oh, sorry, um, Minister. Chair, sorry, I just need to speak to the okay. amendments. I think. Yes, so, Minister. Um, um, so, in respect of these uh, amendments, um, uh, they're obviously um, government uh, amendments, and we're seeking to amend the Referendum Machinery Provision Amendment Bill of 2022. <clears throat> Firstly, in respect of the pamphlet, uh, the bill uh, will also retain the requirement for the Electoral Commissioner to distribute an official <clears throat> yes and no pamphlet containing uh, arguments for and against a proposal to alter the Constitution authorised by parliamentarians um, to all enrolled Australian households. <clears throat> this change has been made following consultation and reflects bipartisan approach on electoral reform. Now, the amendment to uh, expenditure restrictions in section uh, uh, 11.4, a decision to change our constitution, is a significant national event and uh, it has been more than two decades since uh, a change has been uh, proposed. In order to make an informed decision, the Australian people must have access to relevant information about our system of government. It is therefore important that the government can fund civics education activities in relation to the upcoming referendum on The Voice. To enable such activities to be funded, the bill temporarily suspends expenditure restrictions in section 11 of the Referendum Act. However, following further consultation, the government has decided to amend rather than suspend section 14.4. This amendment will leave the expenditure restrictions relating to funding yes and no arguments in place, but will ensure uh, that these restrictions do not prevent funding of neutral civics awareness activities to provide the information needed to ensure all Australians can cast an informed uh, vote. <coughs> neutral civics education activities are an important way to assist in combating misinformation about the Constitution, Australia's system of government and the referendum process. Importantly, this amendment also ensures that the government can continue to support consultation with the referendum working group, the referendum engagement group and the constitutional expert group. The Referendum Act does not provide for public funding of yes or no campaigns, and the government has confirmed on many occasions that it will not provide public funding for either a yes or a no campaign. These exemptions will automatically be repealed uh, at the end of the current uh, parliament. <coughs> On the uh, expansion of the mobile polling period, the government supports the committee's recommendation to uh, strengthen opportunities for enfranchisement and participation in the referendum, particularly of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including in remote communities. 
To support this outcome, the bill will expand the mobile polling period for referendum from 12 days to 19 days. Mo mobile polling is the primary voting mechanism for people living in remote locations. This will support the Australian Electoral Commission <coughs> to conduct voting services in remote parts of Australia over an additional time period to increase participation and ensure that <coughs> all voters have the chance to exercise their right and obligation to vote. The government also made the Electoral and Referendum Amendment and Rolling Franchisement Regulation 2030 to expand the forms of identification a voter is able to produce in order to enrol or update their enrolment to include Medicare numbers and the Australian Citizenship Notice numbers. This will allow those individuals who have previously faced barriers uh, to enrolment as a result of not having the required evidence of identification documents to participate in elections and referenda. <coughs> Um, on the broadcasting blackout, the bill will be amended to extend the broadcasting blackout period of political and election advertisements to referendums in the Broadcasting Services Act 1992. Uh, this will ensure there is consistency in the blackout of advertisements in the three days prior to polling day access across television and radio, consistent with arrangements for federal elections. Consequential amendments will also be made to the Special Broadcasting Services Act 1991 to extend this broadcasting blackout to the SBS. And on uh, scrutineers, <coughs> scrutineers play a significant role in supporting the integrity of a referendum and trust in Australian democratic processes. Uh, the bill will be amended to align the number of persons the Governor General, State Governors, Chief Ministers of the Australian Capital Territory and the Administrator of the Northern Territory may appoint as scrutineers at a counting centre during the uh, counting process with the entitlement of registered political parties. This will support public confidence in the outcome <coughs> of a referendum and is consistent with the entitlements of registered political parties. <coughs> uh, on the issue of uh, the disclosure threshold in indexation, the bill introduces a tr transitional provision to freeze the financial disclosure threshold from the bill um, from the time uh, the bill commences until the next, ge um, next uh, general federal election. This will mean that the referendum in in entities and uh, donors can have certainty that the disclosure threshold for this referendum will be $15,200. Finally, Australia's electoral system is one in which we can be proud. This bill will modernise the legislation that will govern how this referendum will be conducted. The bill will, will advance the Prime Minister's commitment to hold a referendum to recognise uh, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution through a voice uh, to Parliament. I commend this bill. Thank you, Senator Hume, and then Senator Waters. I Thank you, Chair. Can I just confirm, Minister, you said that you were going to amend uh, uh, rather than suspend section 14.4. In fact, did you mean section 11.4? Minister. Good pick up, uh, Senator Hume. Yes, that was what I meant. <coughs> okay, Senator Walters. Thanks very much, Chair. I just rise to make uh, some comments in relation to the Greens' position on the government amendments. And as we said earlier, uh, this week we will be supporting uh, this bill. We do support modernising the conduct of referenda and in particular we want the voice referendum to succeed. Um, so in relation to the government amendments which have been uh, moved together, um, we're comfortable with the most recent amendment um, which clarifies that the civics campaign will not be a de facto yes or no campaign but will be uh, a neutral campaign, so happy to support uh, QE 100. Um, but we just note that there is a real need for truth in advertising, uh, political advertising laws, and that in fact that should also have been addressed in this referenda. There will be some amendments by our crossbench colleagues that we will be supporting um, in relation to the drafting of the pamphlet, but the Greens' position remains that we want truth in political advertising laws, as we have advocated for for decades now, um, and we will continue to pursue that um, through various other means. 
Now, in relation to the extension of remote mobile polling from 12 to 19 days, we strongly support this. In the 2022 election, too many voters, particularly those in remote areas, were effectively disenfranchised uh, because the remote mobile polling services didn't actually make it to their community. Bad weather, large distances, mechanical issues and limited resources meant that some remote communities were only visited for a few hours by those remote polling uh, units, and some missed out altogether. We heard about poor communication, meaning that people didn't know when the polling station would be in town. So it's clear that we need to do better, and I welcome this amendment to extend out the remote polling uh, period from 12 to 19 days as an important step. Um, I note that in the recent JSCM hearing, uh, hearing the AEC uh, responded to some questions uh, from me and confirmed that it was aiming to attend 100 remote areas during the referendum polling on the basis of the extension uh, that the government's proposed. But I also want to note that it will be critical to make sure that referendum material is available in language and that interpreters are available at polling places for the duration of their time in the community. We need to facilitate people in remote areas participating actively in our democracy and having the information they need to do that. This referendum is the perfect place to start uh, that. In relation to amendment uh, PX150, which uh, prevents the indexation of the disclosure threshold, uh, that's uncontroversial. We support that, but we note that we have an amendment, uh, which I'll move shortly, to lower the disclosure threshold to $1,000. People have a right to know who's funding what, um, not just in elections but also in referenda. So whilst we support the um, decision to not allow an indexation to occur, 15200 is too high a threshold. People actually want to know that information and they deserve uh, to know. Now, um, I'll note that uh, Senator David Pocock has an amendment to one of the amendments the government has moved, the effect of which would be to extend out the uh, media blackout to include social media. I'll just flag, even though that hasn't been moved, although I imagine that's imminent, that the Greens will be supporting that extension as well. And I'll have quite a lot more to say when it comes to our amendments, because this is a crucial opportunity to enfranchise as many people as possible. This is an important referendum. It's been a long time since we've had one, and these are weighty decisions. We should be maximising the participation of people in having their voice heard. And it's somewhat ironic that the amendments that the Greens will move to allow on the day enrolment, I believe, will not be supported by the government or the opposition. And I say ironic because we're having a referendum about having a voice, and yet you won't allow people to have a voice about having a voice by having this insurance policy of allowing on the day enrolment. So I'll, I'll be speaking. Uh, to that when the time comes, but I would urge the chamber to reconsider their opposition to that because we can't wait. This, uh, voting is a right, um, it's not a privilege, and we should be maximising participation by allowing on the day enrolment. Senator Thorpe, and then I'll come to you, Senator David Pocock. So do I seek leave to make a brief comment? No, you don't need question? to seek leave. Okay. Um, thank you. I just have a question for the minister. Uh, around the Commonwealth expenditure uh, and I'd like an explanation about um, the constitutional expert group, the referendum engagement group or the referendum working group. I understand they're all yes voters and yes people. So if the government are paying for yes people on your um, groups, and your working group, your engagement group and your working group who are going around selling your song sheet and singing from your song sheet, then where's the accountability and transparency in paying your yes people to say yes? Minister. I thank uh, Senator Thorpe for her, um, uh, her, um, her question and thank her for her engagement in this, uh, in this process uh, with myself and uh, my, uh, my office. Um, look, the, the, the funding for those organisations that you've just mentioned are um, groups that are currently working uh, with, the, uh, with the government. It's a, uh, uh, a reflection of uh, <coughs> what the government has been doing in terms of uh, consultation uh, with, um, uh, with those people who are interested in supporting uh, the voice to parliament, and uh, it's an appropriate uh, expenditure of uh, federal government uh, funds. Senator Thorpe. I thought the um, 
excuse me for my ignorance or not understanding this, but I thought there was no money for a yes campaign and there was no money for a no campaign. So why are you paying <coughs> yes people to say yes and then tell, in fact, bully blackfellas out there to say yes as well? So how much money are these people being paid to say yes to you and to allow the assimilation of black people into the constitution? Minister. I thank uh, Senator Thorpe um, <coughs> for um, her um, question. Uh, look, I, I would absolutely reject the proposition that um, the purpose of this group is to uh, bully Indigenous uh, voters uh, one way um, or another. Um, this is. Um, um, look, I, I can't be clearer than this. I don't think, Senator Thorpe, the government uh, proposes to um, give Indigenous um, Australians a voice, uh, a voice to Parliament. Um, we took that proposition to the last election. Um, that was endorsed by the uh, Australian people, and. Uh, um, we are in the process of <coughs> working out all of the constitutional arrangements that would be required to um, implement um, that, that voice to parliament. And it's appropriate that those individuals who are engaged in that process, who are providing uh, the advice and, the, and uh, support to the government, that, uh, that they be paid in those circumstances. Senator Thorpe. Uh, could you tell me uh, who from the Black Sovereign Movement who have a progressive no, how do they participate in decision making, given you've only got the far right blackfellas in the country saying yes, and you have a growing Black Sovereign Movement who are concerned about assimilating into the colonial constitution? Um, is there an opportunity in terms of transparency and accountability? Uh, to include the progressive no sovereign Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people in this country as part of your paid yes people um, on the referendum engagement group and the referendum working group. Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator Thorpe. Um, no, it's not the intention of the government to in in include those uh, groups in this particular uh, process. Um, but. Um, any, any organisation in this country is free um, to express uh, their point of view, either yes or no, um, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the referendum. Um, the great thing about Australia, Senator Thorpe, is that we are a democracy. People do have the right to express uh, yes or no. Um, the whole point of a referendum is um, asking the Australian people um, what do they think about this constitutional change? Uh, in order to get, as we've heard earlier from um, very many of the, uh, particularly the coalition speakers, on this topic, just how difficult it is to pass a constitutional amendment in this uh, in this country. The requirement is that uh, you have four of the six states uh, voting in favour at least, and then a majority of Australians uh, voting in favour. So. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult hurdle to, to get over. Um, the government supports the voice. I'm um, you know, very clear on that. And uh, of course, we've got a couple of <coughs> our colleagues in the chamber who've been very actively uh, engaged uh, in that process. Uh, uh, Senator Dodson and Senator McCarthy uh, have been uh, very active uh, in, that, in that process. Um, but <coughs> the people that um, you were referring to well, they're free to participate in the uh, in the in the process, um, and like everybody, will be a, will 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 Order. will have an opportunity to uh, express their point of view. Um, I mean, I hope they are not successful, uh, because uh, I believe um, that this referendum should uh, should succeed. But uh, good luck to them in uh, presenting their arguments. Senator Thorpe. So in uh, subsection 4, saying where, where you've included, does not prevent the Commonwealth from expending money in relation to meetings of the constitutional expert group, the referendum engagement group, 
or the referendum working group, who were all yes people, who were all you know, pretty well paid CEOs in their own right, who are now being paid by the government to say yes, who don't have the consent of the people that they say that they represent. The Prime Minister was asked to meet with the Black Sovereign Movement one month ago with no response, with no opportunity for black sovereigns in this country to have a conversation about their future. Uh, I don't understand the transparency and accountability if you're paying only yes blackfellas and not allowing the progressive no blackfellas even a seat at the table. I, I don't see the transparency and accountability or fairness um, to be precise. So can you explain that to the black sovereign movement who are watching today, who have been denied a seat at the table, who have asked the Prime Minister to have a conversation and where only yes people are being paid at this point in time by your government because it's your agenda? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, again, Senator Thorpe, for your question. Um, look, I can't say much more, um, in honesty, than I said um, in the uh, answer to your previous uh, question. Um, these groups, and I, I don't accept your uh, <coughs> categorisation uh, of them, of, of simply being yes people, um, but they're people who are there to give the government advice on the best way of achieving an Indigenous voice to Parliament. Um, that's the purpose. Um, their, their objective is not to <coughs> give the government advice on how not to do that, which I think is what you're uh, asking to do. Um, you may not like the position that the federal government has taken on the voice, but we are the government. We are entitled to uh, present the position that we took to the Australian people at the last election in support of an Indigenous voice to Parliament. Um, and that's what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. And uh, um, um, it's appropriate that the people who um, <coughs> are um, giving us that advice um, are treated in the way that this bill um, seeks to do. Um, but um, uh, that's their, that's their job. That's what they're doing. They're doing a very good job at it. Um, this is not an easy process. Constitutional, constitutional, Order. constitutional change is not easy in this country, uh, uh, Senator Thorpe. Um, we, I personally support a voice to, uh, to Parliament. Of course, my home state of South Australia, um, I think this week or in the next few days, is in fact doing that. The, <coughs> South Australia, as it always has been, has been a, a leader in, uh, in social change in this country. Uh, and of course, um, that's what they're doing. Now it's time for Australia to catch up. We need to catch up um, with, with the, move, the moves in, uh, in South Australia. Well, there are activities right around the country in terms of, uh, of treaty. Um, <coughs> but we have chosen to go down this course, um, as I said, People are free to vote no if they, if they wish. I don't want them to vote no. I want them to vote yes. This group has been um, working tirelessly to make sure that happens. And um, that's the intention of the government. That's what we've announced that we're going to do. And we're going to continue to do it. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Minister, for your um, lovely white splaining of how good this assimilation um, policy will be and the assimilation referendum coming up um, for a powerless voice. Uh, we're used to that. We've been putting up with that for over 200 years. I won't be supporting this particular amendment. I think it's just a um, secure way that the government pays their yes people to provide exactly um, the yes sir, yes sir, no sir. Um, tokenistic gesture that many, many advisory bodies that government handpick themselves actually, um, unfortunately, uh, do to us all the time. So, um, on behalf of the Black Sovereign Movement, we won't be allowing yes people to get paid any more than what they already are to sell us out. Senator David Pocock. Yeah. Uh, 
I move amendment uh, number one on sheet uh, 1861. Uh, this is a very simple amendment that uh, seeks to amend the government's amendment ZB 195 to simply add social media to the uh, blackout period. We have the advertising blackout period for a very good reason and uh, I welcome the updates uh, to the machinery of, of how a referendum take, takes place. It's 2023. There have been much changes, many changes since the Republic referendum, uh, including social media. I, I don't think social media featured in that uh, campaign. And so it makes sense to me to ensure that, that we're not seeing advertising on social media you know, during that period. Thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, thank uh, Senator Pocock for his engagement uh, over this period, which uh, we very much uh, appreciate. Um, but um, the government will not uh, be supporting uh, this uh, particular amendment. Um, and while we do um, appreciate that um, the world has changed since that uh, first broadcasting ban uh, was introduced and social media uh, is a feature of uh, modern day communication, um, the objective of all of these changes to the Referenda Act is to try and ensure that the experience that the Australian people get in this upcoming uh, referendum will be the same as they would get in a general election. Now, why was that necessary? Well, the last election was more than 22 years ago. Um, we've made a whole series of changes to the Electoral Act. We need to bring that into um, uh, in, you know, Make, make sure that the, that experience is, is now the same. Um, like it or not, currently in a federal election there is no ban on social media. There is a ban on other forms of media. Um, so all we're trying to do is link the normal processes that would apply in a federal election, make sure they apply to, uh, to, a, to a referendum. Um, the matters that you raise, um, I welcome discussion on them in the JSCAM report. There are a whole lot of changes that uh, the government intends to make to um, the, um, the way in which we conduct federal elections uh, in, this, uh, in this country. Um, but this is not the time to move this particular amendment. The time to deal with that issue is when JSCAM is considering um, how we need to uh, update our electoral laws um, and there's plenty of time to, to deal with that um, uh, in the, the weeks and months ahead, and uh, I welcome your contribution uh, in those processes. Thank you. Oh, Senator Pocock. Chair, thank you, Minister, for the explanation. Uh, Minister, can you, can you give the Senate a guarantee that once that JSCAM review is tabled, should a social media blackout uh, be part of that, that that will be brought before Parliament to ensure that the referendum isn't uh, disadvantaged. Uh, I really don't believe that the re referendum should um, have to put up with potentially a huge amount of advertising uh, in the few days before the uh, Australians go to vote on this very important issue just because we haven't kept up with you know, electoral reform and we, we're not reflecting in um, our laws, what I think is an expectation from the community. Social media now is a very legitimate advertising channel. In fact, millions and millions of dollars are spent on social media advertising. It seems, rather than getting ahead, it just seems common sense to bring this up to date. So uh, I accept your, your uh, sort of reason that you don't want this to be ahead of uh, JSCAM, but should JSCAM before the referendum conclude that social media should be included, will the government seek to address this before the referendum? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Pocock um, for what is a very sensible um, question. Um, uh, look, we'll participate like you will have the chance to in the JSCAM uh, processes. Um, the issue is more complicated with social media. Um, I will make this observation about social media, and there might be people in the uh, parliament that um, 
disagree with my assessment of it, but um, um, social a person who looks at a particular social media site for their their news um, is more likely to be a person who agrees with that particular um, social media um, uh, point of view that's being um, projected. Uh, one of the problems with modern forms of communication like social media is that you're often only getting the news that you want to hear. Um, so in a sense, um, social media is different, for instance, than uh, an, an advertisement in, in the middle of the, the nightly news. If you look at the way in which people get um, or form, form, form judgments and views, um, the most significant um, influencer of um, uh, a decision to change your mind about a particular issue is what you see on the evening television news. Um, and that hasn't really changed um, very much over the, over the years. Um, and you can sort of go down the list of all the ways in which you can communicate. Of course, the, the one at the bottom, interestingly enough, is Twitter. Twitter is the one um, source of information that um, uh, virtually makes nobody change their mind. So everybody who's listening to your Twitter feed at the moment, if you've got one, I, I, I don't happen to have one, but um, they're not going to change their mind about anything that they hear on, uh, on Twitter. Um, so I think there are different, different considerations. Um, but look, that's the job. I, I'm not preempting uh, what JSCAM is going to do. Um, I'm happy if they discuss this issue because I think it's an, it's an important issue. My only point is that um, whatever changes, um, I mean, the, the whole purpose of this particular bill is to ensure that we have common treatment between referendum and general elections. That's what this bill does, and we appreciate your support um, for ensuring that blockout uh, period. Um, but any further changes, let's see what uh, JSKIM comes up with. I'm not going to preempt any, um, any decision that they might make. Senator Pocock. On, on. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Minister, for the for the uh, for the explanation. I, I, uh, I'm in no way suggesting that people's views be curtailed on social media, but there is a huge amount of advertising on on Meta, on on Facebook, and Instagram, and then on Twitter. And uh, I haven't seen the research that you cite, but it, it makes no sense to me to include all of these other um, advertising um, mediums and then to not include social media. So my question was, and I, I, again, I take your point on not wanting it to be ahead and waiting for JSCAM, but if JSCAM says social media should be included in the blackout period and that is before the referendum, will the government include that? I, I don't see why we should disadvantage um, the referendum and, and risk having uh, advertising that really can't be scrutinised, given that a lot of the ads on social media are, are dark ads. They're not, they're not visible to everyone. They're being served to people individually, and there's not a lot of transparency. But we know that political advertising on social media is well regulated, so it, it, it's fairly simple for the, advertising, for the uh, social media companies to simply not allow political ads in those last few days. Minister, uh, thank uh, thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Thorpe, uh, uh, Pocock for his um, his um, question. Look, I don't think I can say anything more than I've already said. Um, I'm not disagreeing that this is an important uh, topic. Um, it is a, a, a modern form of uh, communication that we need to, to look at. Um, the issue um, is is complex. It's more complex because you're dealing with the the internet and a range of other um, issues about how people can avoid um, having their um, information um, delivered to them. Um, but, you know, the issue will be discussed by, um, uh, by JSCAM. They will come up with uh, a considered uh, view on that, and let's have a look at what that view is. Senator Waters, and then I'll be going to Senator Hume. Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've already flagged the Greens' support for Senator David Pocock's amendment in this respect. 
Um, but I neglected to ask the minister one detailed question which pertains to Government Amendment PX150. Um, and this is on behalf of some non-government organisations who've asked for clarification. So on proposed section 109E, can you confirm that referendum entities are only required to disclose donations that they receive in the six months prior to the referendum? Will any disclosure be required for donations made earlier if the funds are spent during the referendum period? Thanks for clarifying that. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, um, I want to make sure I give you the right uh, answer. Um, the amounts donated within six months before the writ and up to polling day need to be disclosed. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Chair. So just for clarity, if the donation is received prior to the six months, even if it's spent during the six months, it was not subject to the disclosure requirements. Is that correct? Minister. The answer is it would be declared as an expenditure but not a receipt. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now that there's been a number of amendments moved, I thought I should put the opposition's position on each of those, starting with uh, yours, Senator Pocock. Um, the, um, the opposition notes the, the views of uh, Senator Pocock on this issue of the blackout, um, but the opposition believes that the blackout period as imposed by the government's amendments on sheet ZB195 should apply, as it does to other electoral events, such as election, federal elections. Um, to expand the application of this would be to set a precedent that has not yet been fully investigated as uh, Minister Farrell has um, explained any expansion of the blackout period should be subject to the proper processes, including consideration by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters before the Parliament can consider it effectively. So the opposition will be opposing this amendment. On the government's uh, other amendments, um, on um, on the one to around the number of scrutineers on sheet PX one four nine. Uh, the opposition position is to support this amendment uh, because of the need to ensure that an appropriate number of scrutineers can be appointed to provide the additional assurance that referenda can be conducted with the appropriate level of integrity. We would note, however, that this does not address the issue of how scrutineers will be appointed by um, uh, formal or informal uh, yes or no campaign organisations and how to ensure that each side has the adequate number of scrutineers or indeed how scrutineers behave and report back the information that they are seeing at voting, um, at voting places. Uh, on um, uh, um, the government's amendment around pausing the indexation event for the donation disclosure amount for the period of the referendum, the opposition will be supporting this amendment. Uh, it's a sensible step to ensure that participants who may be caught by donation activity prior to the referendum will have the same regulatory amount regardless of when they donate. On the government's amendment that creates an advertising blackout for the referendum in line with the blackout that applies during the Commonwealth elections, we'll be supporting that amendment too. 
we have said that this referendum should be as closely possible similar to other electoral events so that participants have some familiarity with the way that it will be conducted. This is a good addition to the bill to ensure that the blackout period which applies to federal elections also applies to the referendum. And finally, um, the government's uh, amendment to allow for the extension of remote area polling activities, ramp activities as the AEC refer to them for the purposes of this referendum, uh, the locations at those pre-poll um, locations in addition to remote area polling locations operating earlier than the prescribed pre-poll period. Um, the opposition will be supporting this amendment. We think this too is a sensible measure that will take into account the potential for adverse weather events, particularly during the wet season in uh, remote communities, which may delay the access of those ramp teams to get to those remote communities. We are very conscious that the ramp program service remote um, services um, they, they service remote and many Indigenous communities, and that every effort should be made for those communities to be provided with an opportunity to cast their ballots at a referendum. Uh, so those are the government's positions on um, the. Uh, sorry, these are the opposition's positions on both the government's amendments and also Senator Pocock's amendments. Um, I do want to ask a question, though, of the minister regarding uh, some questions that were asked by Senator Thorpe um, regarding um, the provision for limits on expenditure to meetings of the government's referendum groups, the um, con constitutional expert group, the referendum engagement group, and the referendum working group. Um, can I just confirm that those uh, limits on expenditure are for meetings um, of uh, are there, it, the expenditure is limited to meetings of those groups? Minister, sorry. Um, Chair. Thank you. Can I ask, sorry, just can I just ask a, a couple more questions around some of AEC resourcing? Uh, um, obviously, this is going to be. A, a, a referendum which unusually is driven, I think the, the phrase that you've used, Senator Farrell, uh, Minister Farrell, and also that the Prime Minister has used, uh, that is going to be driven by civil society, that it, civil society is going to be able to um, run and manage their own campaigns, whether they be for yes or whether they be for no. Obviously, uh, from the opposition's perspective, this creates some risks. While it sounds like a terrific uh, proposition, it is very different from the way we run federal elections, with registered political parties that are responsible for maintaining the integrity structure around those, uh, around those elections. For instance, around foreign donation laws, around donation caps, around foreign interference laws. All of that is run within the sphere of political, registered political parties. When you turn a referendum over to civil society, you are going to deal with a whole new raft of organisations that have never potentially dealt with the political process before, and that opens up the, uh, the system, opens up the referendum, opens up the electoral process to some risks, and the opposition would like some assurances from the government as to how those risks will be managed. So, um, is the government going to resource, for instance, the, um, the Australian Electoral Commission? in order for them to provide education to referendum participants and around things like the donations and disclosure regimes that are, that are contained in this bill. Minister. Thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Hume for her question. Uh, look, I met with the um, uh, Commissioner for the um, Australian Electoral Commission yesterday, um, and I'm very confident um, that um, their full bottle on uh, all of, uh, all of the issues that might arise in the course of uh, the referendum. Um, we have, um, of course, set aside um, a uh, significant amount of funding to, uh, uh, to conduct the, the referendum, and uh, I would be confident, um, based on my discussions with the uh, Australian Electoral Commission, that um, uh, this uh, referendum will be um, run in the same professional uh, manner in which a general election uh, would be run, and all of the required um, uh, rules um, around um, donations, etc., will be applied as they always are by the Australian Electoral Commission. Senator Hume. Thank you, Chair. May I ask: Is the AEC going to hold a register of uh, participating organisations in the same way that it holds a register? of political parties at an election? 
Minister. Look, the AEC will be doing everything it needs to do um, to ensure um, that this uh, referendum is conducted in the professional way in which um, uh, Australian elections uh, are always uh, conducted. Um, I'm very proud of uh, the Australian um, or the AEC and the way in which they conduct uh, elections. I think we've got one of the finest electoral um, organisations uh, in the world. Um, they know what their job is and I'm sure that's exactly what they're going to do. And they're very focused on the referendum. Uh, uh, Senator Hume. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister. But that wasn't an answer to the question. I am very concerned that potentially you haven't even spoken to the AEC about whether they will hold a list of organisations that are going to participate in this referendum, whether those organisations have to register at all with the AEC. Uh, is this something that you have spoken to the AEC about? And if you have, what has been their response? And should I, I just should put a caveat on that to say that in no way is the opposition uh, casting aspersions on the professionalism of the AEC. We feel that the AEC does an exceptional job at federal elections. The problem is we are concerned that because of the way that this referendum is going to be run, that the AEC has one hand tied behind its back. So we want to understand what it is that the government is doing to ensure that that is not the case. Minister. Thank you. Um, well, we were in furious uh, agreement about how well the uh, AEC is going to conduct this uh, election. Let's leave it uh, to them. They know what their job uh, is. They're professional, uh, professional um, people. Um, if there is likely to be an issue, I'm sure I'll hear from the uh, electoral uh, commissioner himself, because he, uh, in the past, when I've been the shadow um, smoz, he's uh, contacted me about uh, this issue or that of, uh, of concern, and I'm sure. Uh, during the last uh, federal election, he made contact with the uh, the government um, about uh, issues that he might have been concerned about. But look, um, I don't think we should have any fear uh, whatsoever. This is going to be a professionally conducted referendum to the standard that we are used to expect. Um, and these changes that we are um, bringing about today are going to assist in that process. Thank you. thank you, Chair, and thank you again, Minister. So what I'm hearing you say is that there is no plan at this point in time for a register of participants in the upcoming referendum, uh, that the AEC is not necessarily going to hold a list of all of the organisations that are participating. They're not going to hold a list of all the organisations that could potentially breach the very laws that we are imposing upon those organisations today as part of this machinery bill. From the opposition's perspective, this is exactly the reason why we have requested a, an official yes and an official no campaign, to maintain the structural integrity around the referendum so that Australians know that those donation laws have been applied, that the organisations have complied, that foreign interference is limited, that foreign donations are banned. This is simply an impossible thing to manage, an impossible thing to oversee, unless there is either an official yes or official no campaign or, at the very least, a register of organisations that the AEC and our, in, and our intelligence agencies can go to to make sure that these organisations are complying with these very laws. Can I ask then of the minister, what is the quantum of funding that the government has provided the, to allow the AEC to undertake its duties as part of this referendum? Minister. Is this <clears throat> so um, just just on the general um, before I get to the specific uh, question, 
Um, I'm, I'm happy if the opposition, in fact, I'm happy if any um, member of parliament wants to meet with the uh, AUC and uh, discuss uh, any concerns they might have about issues that might uh, arise uh, and how the AEC uh, would, um, uh, would answer those questions. I happen to know one of the reasons the AEC was in the building yesterday, <coughs> they were doing exactly that with uh, one member of parliament who did have some concerns, uh, not in relation to the, the, this issue, uh, but uh, more, more general issues. Um, and I'm happy to facilitate um, any discussion that you might have. If you've got concerns about um, how the AEC are going to conduct uh, this uh, referendum, um, I'm happy for the AEC to make themselves available to, uh, to answer those questions um, and, in a sense, put your mind at rest that this is going to be a professionally conducted um, uh, referendum. So just in terms of some of the funding that um, um, we, um, uh, we've set aside, so at the 2022-23 October budget, the uh, measure for delivery of the First Nations voice to the Parliament referendum, preparatory work was announced to provide funding of $75.1 million over two years from 2022-23 for the AC and other agencies to commence uh, preparations and support work to deliver the referendum. This comprises of $50.2 million in the 2022-23 for the Australian Electoral Commission to commence preparations to deliver the referendum, $1.6 million over two years from 2022-23 for the Attorney General's Department and $0.8 million over two years for the 2023 for the Department of Finance. And then $160 million in the contingency reserve a previous uh, government decision for further funding towards the referendum will be, uh, and the details will be announced in the 2023-24 budget. Um, and the final cost of the budget uh, will be settled in the 2023-24 budget, as you would expect. Senator Patterson. Yeah, uh, Minister, what advice has the government received about the risk of foreign interference in the upcoming referendum? Minister. Yeah, look, I'm not aware of any specific advice that we've received um, in relation to uh, foreign interference in the, uh, in the, in the referendum. Um, but as always, I'm sure the AEC uh, monitors um, these issues. Uh, and of course, we, we know <coughs> um, from previous legislation that has passed the Senate um, that um, prohibits uh, the involvement of um, foreign entities in Australian electoral processes. Um, and I'm sure the uh, AEC is very alert um, to those issues and uh, would be watching very closely. Senator Patterson. The minister might like to check that answer um, because your own attorney general has publicly discussed the risk of foreign interference in the upcoming referendum. I am sure, and I would hope not, that the Attorney General wouldn't be publicly speculating about a foreign interference risk without receiving advice about it. Could the Minister clarify? Minister. I'm not, I'm need, not sure that I need to check my answer. Um, the um, Attorney General might, might have uh, received some advice uh, uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. Uh, but your, your question to me was what advice have I received from the AEC? And, uh, Minister, uh, sorry, Senator Patterson. Minister, you'll have to check the hands hard. Um, I'll read exactly the question that I asked, which didn't mention you and didn't mention the AAC. I said, what advice has the government received about the risk of foreign interference in the referendum, full stop? Um, uh, it wasn't limited to you. It was the government. Uh, and I'd appreciate your answer to that question. Minister, order. I was, I was referring to uh, the advice I uh, had received. I thought that was the context in which the question was being asked. Uh, but I'm happy to check with the uh, Attorney General to see what advice he's received. Senator Patterson. You are the minister responsible for this legislation and the successful delivery of this referendum, and you've received no advice 
on the risk of foreign interference that your own Attorney General has publicly speculated about? If that is true, that is extraordinary and negligent. What questions have you asked and what information have you sought about this risk which your own government is talking about publicly? Minister. Look, I'm very confident, uh, Senator uh, Patterson, that uh, uh, the AEC um, are dealing with any issues that might relate to uh, foreign interference in the, exactly the same way they deal with it at general elections. That is very competently. Um, and uh, if there were any uh, issues uh, that I needed to be made aware of, I'm sure the AEC uh, would have done that. Um, as I said, I was uh, in conversation with the uh, Commissioner only yesterday afternoon. <coughs> he uh, certainly didn't raise with me any issues uh, in relation to, uh, to foreign interference. Um, the government continues, of course, to monitor these things in a, in, in a variety of ways, which I'm sure you're uh, very familiar with. Um, um, we don't want any foreign interference um, in, this, uh, in this referendum. We want it to be an election uh, about the Australian people, uh, and we want it to be the Australian people and not uh, foreign uh, entities who make the ultimate decision about um, whether or not uh, we uh, have a voice to parliament. <laughs> Senator Patterson. I'm conscious of the time and that we're soon going to hit a hard marker and obviously we'll be returning to this issue. Can I ask that the minister in the intervening time uh, away from the chamber go and seek answers to these questions so that you can come back to the chamber when we return to the committee stage later today and answer them adequately. Um, the government should be able to provide some information about what advice it has received or sought uh, on the risk of foreign interference, given that your own government has publicly speculated about it. I'd, I'd also like to know uh, whether you or any government minister has met with any of the tech platforms about the risk of foreign interference in the uh, upcoming referendum. Minister. Uh, look, I'll come back to you uh, in respect of those uh, answers when we uh, resume debate on this bill. Senator Thorpe. Uh, I just have two more questions. Uh, one is you've, I heard both you and the opposition talk about how wonderful the AEC is and how uh, much higher regard you hold the AEC. And, um, the head of the AEC also supported provisional voting uh, and advised or strongly um, said that we that he supported provisional voting on the day what is the problem with that um, I understand there's a there's some racism around why um, only Aboriginal people are being stopped from voting on the day uh, I, I've been hearing that that could be a reason of voter fraud we don't want black fellas being fraudulent towards the voting system, uh, why won't the government allow voting on the day, enrolment and voting on the day, as the head of the AAC has suggested and supported? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Thorpe for her question. Um, Look, I reject that any decision that we've made to either support or oppose um, a, um, an amendment to this legislation is based on um, racism. Um, that's um, um, certainly not, not the case, and every decision we've made is based on uh, our commitment to ensuring an um, Indigenous voice to, uh, to Parliament. Um, on the issue of voting on the day, um, I don't know how many times I can say this to you, Senator Thorpe, but the objective of this piece of legislation is to create the experience— Thank you, Minister. It now being 12.15, uh, uh, the committee will report to the Senate. The committee reports progress and pursuant to order, uh, I now call on Senator's statements and I call uh, Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Earlier this year, I spent some time 
visiting logistics and road safety organisations in Victoria. Thanks to the assistance of Peter Anderson from the Victorian Transport Association, I spent time with the team at Mirat Logistics at the Port of Melbourne. Mirat is an impressive Australian logistics company who support the import of vehicles to Australia. With a purpose-built facility at the Port of Melbourne, Mirat has enough room for 14,500 cars and two dedicated quarantine wash bays. The conversation with Mirat focused strongly on how supply chain issues were impacting the importation of vehicles into Australia. On the day we were meeting, there were three cargo ships full of new vehicles anchored in Port Melbourne, waiting to be unloaded. By handling all this, they have also managed to run almost entirely, almost entirely on renewable energy, which is sourced from their very own solar panels. Why also in Victoria, I, I had the opportunity to visit Lynn Fox's uh, Australian Automo Automotive Research, Research Centre with one of their tenants, the Australian New Car Assessment Program, ANCAP. ANCAP provides consumers with independent, transparent and trusted information and advice on the level of protection offered to vehicle drivers and passengers in the most common types of crashes. Further, the testing provides information about the ability of a vehicle to avoid or mitigate the severity of a crash with other vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists and, and from this year, motorcyclists. Since 1992, ANCAP has published safety ratings for thousands of vehicle makers, models and variants sold across Australia and New Zealand using a star rating system of zero to five stars. ANCAP has had a long-standing relationship with the Automotive Research Centre in Anglesey, which provides organisations, companies and government to uh, test a range of automotive automotive vehicles from cars, trucks, motorcycles through to defence machinery. The purpose of my visit was to test out the auto automatic braking and lane support systems in two vehicles, and I am pleased to say both passed. I have also had the chance to see Australia's first motorcyclist test dummy. As of 2023, vehicles will be assessed for their ability to avoid a crash with a motorcycle. The dummy will be used in a range of um, emergency braking and, land, and land, lane support testing scenarios. The dummy sits atop a motorcycle and is propelled on a platform. ANCAP has played a key role over the last 30 years to encourage vehicle manufacturers to continually improve the safety features and technologies offered in their vehicles ahead of regulations. It was great to see ANCAP's work firsthand and to see the vast variety of needs the Australian Automob Automotive Research Centre is able to cater for. I'm also proud that the Australian Government, through the National Road Safety Action Plan, has committed to continuing to fund the fantastic work ANCAP does. I would like to give a big thank you to ANCAP's CEO, Carla Huweg, and her team for making the day so informative and memorable. I then had the opportunity to sit down with some of the world's leading road safety researchers at the Monash University Accident Research Centre, MUARC. MUARC is one of the world's most comprehensive injury prevention research institutions, with extensive research being conducted in a wide range of fields. MUARC has 40 staff and 30 students, all of whom believe that the translation and implications of research should be able to be understood by policy makers and advocates alike. Sitting outside of, of other uh, faculties at Monash University, MUARC is able to lean into many different research specialties while conducting road safety research in an ethical manner. The MUARC professors and researchers I met, uh, met with came from fields of engineering, psychology and public health, all of whom worked together in collaboration on various pieces of research. 
In recent years, MUAC has launched several professional road safety programs, including the Road Safety Management Leadership Program. The Road Safety Manage Management Leadership Program aims to develop a leader's cap uh, capability to, in delivering change through a five-day intensive program. The program focuses on participants leaving with an in-depth understanding of road safety management, including the safe systems approach and its underpinning, underpinning scientific principles. Past programs have, been, have attracted international attendance from road safety leaders from countries including South Africa, India, Indone Indonesia, India and New Zealand. At home, the program is highly regarded by state and territory police forces and local governments across the country. One of the programs MUARC runs is a complementary program to the ANCAP safety rating program, known as the Use Car Safety Ratings. The, the freely available ratings are available on a number of used vehicles and are presented using a star rating scale of one to five stars. Used car safety ratings provide an indication of the relative risk of, of death and serious injury to the driver of the vehicle in a crash compared to other vehicles on the road. Cars which, re which receive a five-star driver protection rating provide greater protection to the driver, are less likely to result in serious injuries to the other drivers, pedestrians, cyclists and motorcyclists, and have a lower risk of being involved in a crash in the first place. I'm also proud that the recent uh, National Road Safety Action Plan contains a federal government action of continuing to contribute funding to MUARC's used car safety rating program. I look forward to visiting MUARC again to see the testing they undertake for the used car safety program in person. While in Melbourne, I had the opportunity to visit the Road to Zero, the road, uh, road safety experience, which has been developed by the Transport Accident Commission. The Transport Accident Commission is a Victorian government-owned organisation set up to support survivors of road trauma. TAC does, does impressive work in the road safety space, including their exhibition at the M Melbourne Museum. The Road to Zero exhibition is a world-first road safety education exhibition with interactive technologies for people to explore the impact road crashes both on the body both on the body and socially. While at the exhibition, I had the opportunity to use the virtual reality experience, which had me travelling in a car from 1970 through to 2055 and learning the history of road and, and vehicle safety in Victoria. At the beginning of the experience in 1970, roads were mostly wide and undivided, and a total of uh, 1,034 Victorians died in, on Victorian roads. By 2055, the simulator shows that how future upgrades to infrastructure, network and improvements in car vehicle standards will lead to zero deaths and zero injuries. Last but not least, I had the opportunity to visit the National Transport Research Organisation, formerly known as the Australian Road Research, Research Board. NTRO work alongside all levels of government to deliver innovative, impactful solutions that benefit all road users. NTRO does extensive work on both the measurement of current road conditions as well as the creation of new or modified road surface materials. One of NTRO's core beliefs is that if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. So to complement this ideology, NTRO have a full suite of data and analysis services which are used by state and territory and local governments across the country. During my time at NTRO, I had the opportunity to see some of the vehicles they use for the infrastructure measurement, including the network survey vehicle. I was at the NTRO office in Melbourne when one of the IPAVs, which is a, a vehicle, a dedicated truck, which can be used as, which has a series of lasers mounted on the trailer to measure the state of the road underneath. And when I was there, it was conducting post-flood assessments of roads in Victoria. And another um, truck was uh, IPAVE truck was in Queensland. All in all, I would like to thank all of the remarkable organisations and research institutes I was able to meet while in Melbourne, and I look forward to keeping up to date with the work each of the organisations continue to do well into the future. Thank you.
Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about a couple of issues that are vitally important to my home state of Western Australia. I'll start with the GST sharing arrangement. The GST sharing arrangements are not top of mind for people across Australia. In fact, if you talk about GST relativities, most people's eyes probably start glazing over. But that's certainly not true in my home state of Western Australia, and it's certainly not true amongst the Western Australian Liberal team. Uh, for those, for those who are interested, and I think this is a really important point to make, what does, what does a GST relativity actually mean? We hear these numbers bandied round, 70 cents, 15 cents, a dollar and one cent. Well, a relativity above one means that a state is effectively subsidised because it receives more than its population share of GST. So it's a pretty, pretty straightforward concept. More than its population share of GST if that number is above one. And in the past, Western Australia was in danger of falling to a catastrophically low level, uh, a, a number of, of 10 cents in the dollar, a relativity of 0.1 or even lower. Uh, and the WA Liberal team fought very, very hard indeed to ensure that that system was repaired that the failures within that system, the failures to take into account the unique attributes of Western Australia uh, needed to be taken into account to make sure that that ridiculous circumstance where literally one-tenth of the GST revenue delivered from Western Australia to all the other states was returning to WA. So in government, we fixed that problem. The WA team led by then Finance Minister, Senator Matthias Cormann, uh, but the whole WA team fought hard, convinced the government that that needed to be changed, and it was changed. And that was a team effort. I was very proud to be a very, very, very small part of that team, uh, having newly arrived in this place. Uh, but we delivered. We delivered for the people of Western Australia. We delivered the 70 cent going to 75 cent floor in the GST sharing arrangements. And we are watching this government. Senator Matt O'Sullivan, who's in the chamber with me now, uh, some of the great work that's being done by my colleague Senator Dean Smith on this issue, uh, Senator Michaelia Cash, Senator Linda Reynolds, we are all. We are all watching the government and 100 per cent committed to ensuring that the fair GST carve-up that we saw put in place stays in place. And why are we watching so closely? Because we can see pressure building in the Labor Party. The New South Wales Labor leader, Chris Minns, what did he say? Came, went to WA recently, went, met with Mark McGowan. They did a nice friendly visit in WA didn't really get into the GST, that would have been a bit too touchy. But once he got back to New South Wales, what did he say about the GST? We're entitled to more. And that's an implicit criticism of the current arrangement. It's all up for negotiation in the next few years, and I'm not going to take a backward step. That's what the putative Premier of New South Wales said just after, just after he had his friendly visit with Premier McGowan in Western Australia. So let's look at Western Australia and New South Wales in the current circumstances. Under an assessed relativity, so remember, remember what, what we're looking at when we're looking at relativity, if a number is above one, it's a state being subsidised, it's being subsidised in terms of its GST share, New South Wales would actually be at one dollar and one cent. New South Wales would actually be getting more GST than uh, than uh, its share by population. And what would Western Australia be getting under a straight assessed relativity at the moment? 15 cents in the dollar, 0.15. Thanks to the deal secured by the Liberal WA team in this place, that is being boosted to the floor of 70 cents. 70 cents, ensuring that 70 cents in the dollar of GST uh, population share is returned to Western Australia. 70 cents and 
Mr Minns, the putative Premier of New South Wales, describes that as unfair, as we are entitled to more because WA gets back 70 cents in the dollar. So every Liberal member of this place and the other place is watching this government very closely in terms of its actions in relation to GST. Also wish to discuss trade. Australia is a trading nation and Western Australia is a trading state. If we draw lines on a map, the start and finish of those lines is invariably in Australia, be that plane routes, sea routes, telecommunications flows, monetary flows around the world. Australia is the start and end. We are a trading nation and Western Australia is a trading state. Be it our major commodities like iron ore, uh, gas, uh, agricultural commodities, Western Australia's lifeblood is our ability to trade with foreign nations and foreign purchases. And we're seeing those relationships and the great reputation Australia has as a reliable trading partner being undermined by this Labor government. And we've seen it across a few different areas. Uh, I think we'd all agree, I think we'd all agree in this place that Japan, Japan is an extremely important and extremely reliable trading partner and strategic partner. Probably up there with the US and the UK as our, uh, our top four uh, relationships in the world. And with this government, this Labor government's tinkering, tinkering intervention in the gas market, we've seen the Japanese government and Gap Japanese government representatives respond in a way that is very unusual. I mean, they are very, very reluctant to criticise, very, very reluctant to talk about relationships, always keen to keep a positive relationship. Yet we've had Japanese trade representatives go to uh, trade magazines with comments like this. We are concerned that the government's short-term market intervention could possibly threaten LNG business practice, which has been established over many years, and investment in the future." End quote. Putting current markets at risk and stifling investment. Now, this, this, this is what we said. Many people on this side, including myself, said was a major risk from the Labor government's intervention in the energy market, particularly in the gas market. We said this would happen, and now we see a clear demonstration from Japanese government representatives that this is affecting our trade relationship with Japan. The other clear example that affects my home state of Western Australia uh, not that the gas industry doesn't affect my home state because we are the largest exporter of LNG uh, at times in the world, um, is obviously the live export trade. Now, the live export trade, uh, particularly to the Middle East, has been a significant part of the WA agricultural industry for decades. It's very important to those markets. And those markets are clearly saying that this has potential to impact beyond just the trade in live sheep itself, to impact other aspects of our agricultural supply relationships with those countries and impact other aspects of our broader trade relationships with those countries. Those countries considered us to be a reliable supplier of protein to their domestic market, and we are putting not just that market at risk, not just the sheep farmers of Western Australia under extraordinary economic pressure. We are damaging. We are damaging Australia. We are damaging our trade relationships. The rest of the world is looking at us and saying, are we the same trading partner we used to be? Are we the reliable, the dependable trading partner for gas? for agricultural products that Australia used to be. And I find that personally extraordinarily 
dangerous for the future of Australia in this world because we are a trading nation and Western Australia is a trading state. Thank you, Senator Waters. Ding Deputy President, since Gina Masaramini's murder in custody six months ago, we've seen brave women and allies stand up against the oppressive Iranian government. Hundreds have been killed and thousands have been arrested. Rallies around Australia have called for solidarity. We've chanted Jean, Jandeji, Adaji, women, life, freedom, and we've listened to the Iranian community in Australia. Many fear for their families still in Iran, and they have asked us to be their voice. Today, I want to give voice to members of Queensland's Iranian community by reading their words, of course with their consent, and partially anonymised at their request for their own safety. When I met with these formidable and very uh, impressive women recently, they were calling for Mag Magnitsky sanctions on those directly affiliated with the Islamic regime. Now, earlier this week, we learned that the Australian government has issued new Mag Magnitsky sanctions against senior Iranian military, the morality police involving the death of Gina Masaramini, government officials and entities and individuals involved in human rights abuses. This is important progress. It's welcome, but still more must be done. Rosa, a university lecturer, told me, and I quote, I'm committed to the future of my home country, Iran, and its people. As an Iranian Australian, I want to shed light on the recent developments concerning the Iran revolution from a diversity and inclusion perspective. The brave young Iranians have taken to the streets, risking their lives to demonstrate to the world that the Islamic regime does not represent their interests. They demand that the legitimacy of this regime be challenged on a larger scale by the leaders of the free world once and for all. The magnitude of this recent uprising is incomparable to previous nationwide protests in 2019 and 2009, and it is clear that this is a revolution. She continues, for 44 years, the Islamic Republic of Iran has tried to eliminate the diversity embedded in Iran's history and culture by rewriting Persian history based on Shia ideologies and the gradual physical elimination of ethnic groups. However, the young generation's courageous unity has surmounted the regime's divide and conquer strategy and has made the world finally listen to their cry for a free, united Iran that celebrates its cultural diversity. Rosa urged Australia to oppose the Islamic regime and support the work of unified opposition groups working towards a free, secular and democratic Iran. She says that doing this would align with Australia's values and demonstrate that we stand in solidarity with the Iranian people to fight for their freedom, justice and human rights. <clears throat> Arti, a registered nurse working in Allied Health, expressed her concerns about the health catastrophe imposed on Iranians by the regime's security forces. She said, and I quote, medical centres have been ordered to refrain from admitting and treating injured protesters. They've been instructed to have a mandatory report to security forces about these injured protesters. On many occasions, injured protesters have been abducted from hospitals and medical centres to unknown locations for investigation and torture. Ambulances are being misused to transport security forces to the streets to suppress protesters and also to transport abducted protesters from medical centres to prisons and detention centres. Vehicles are seen painted to look like an ambulance, bearing a green number plate which indicate that the vehicle, indicates that the vehicle belongs to the military and law enforcement forces. This casts discredit on and makes people lose trust in the medical system. In any case, the vehicle that's supposed to save lives in, uh, is currently being used in Iran by forces that shoot directly at protesters, be they children, teenagers, old or young. Healthcare workers are being assaulted, prohibited and threatened to refrain provision of treatment and medical service to injured protesters. Many have been persecuted. Healthcare workers have been forced to provide false medical statements, including false death certificates, fabricated medical information and coroner's reports on protesters to the media. Arti also spoke of reports of school students being poisoned. She says, the first case, which was reported in Quorum on November 30, affected 18 students at a secondary school who fell ill with symptoms such as nausea, headaches, coughing, difficulty breathing, heart, palpita heart palpitations and lethargy. Some of these students lost movement in their limbs and had to be hospitalised. Since then, Ati has heard of over 900 young girls poisoned in schools across uh, 150 schools across Iran, with at least one girl, 11-year-old Fatima Raze, dying from the exposure. 
As he says, the Islamic regime is taking revenge on women for their brave resistance. Even parents who were complaining in front of schools over their daughters' safety were cracked down on. Fear, torture, violence are the IR's last tools to survive. What they're peddling to the world as security is nothing more than a deceitful mirage from terrorists who take revenge on schoolgirls in this way for their participation in the Women, Life, Freedom Revolution. These are just several examples from an endless list of the regime's incompetency and inhumane crimes endangering the health and life of Iranians. These catastrophic human rights violations deserve urgent attention. Now, the next uh, ladies that shared with me are Zara and um, Mary, not her real name. They talked about their family's experience of political violence and the suppression of any media that had tried to tell the truth about what's happening. Zara says, the current political climate in Iran is marked by a high degree of repression, with the regime censoring the media and cracking down on dissent and civil society groups advocating for reform. Despite efforts by some Iranians to gradually reform the political system, the prevalence of systemic corruption and political suppression has made this extremely difficult, leading to the arrest and suppression of many reformists and their families. It's important to note that the severe crackdowns occurred during the reformist administration in Iran. My family used to believe that Iran needs a gradual process of reform to address its problems. But despite being reformist, my brother was kidnapped and tortured by the IRGC security forces for several weeks, resulting in ongoing health issues and chronic pain. Another brother was physically attacked multiple times on the street, arrested and tortured. During his arrest, he was subjected to prolonged periods of solitary confinement. My sister was arrested and tortured simply for writing articles for journals and newspapers. Mary says, as taxpaying, law-abiding Australian Iranians, we are constantly living with the horror. We know they are surveilling us and that we are at risk within Australian borders and are also subjecting our family, relatives in Iran, to prosecution, detention, forced confessions and torture to pressure us into submission to IR. I'm so concerned for the rest of my family as they can be taken hostage at any moment to coerce me into submission. My nephew was severely assaulted during the early stages of the protest last September. He lost eight teeth and had 28 stitches in his forehead. Despite her experience, Zara remains hopeful. She says one of the protesters' greatest achievements is that they've raised a new Iranian political order. They've created solidarity amongst different social groups, and now we have a united opposition for the transition period that represents our voice. Uh, the last lady who would like to remain anonymous came to Australia as a student in 2016. She was raised by her grandmother after her mother, father, aunts and uncles were arrested by the Islamic Republic. She describes her childhood as travelling from one jail to the others to visit my family members. For her, the recent protests and arrests have brought back memories of her childhood. She talked to me about the thousands of people being imprisoned, the unpredictability of who would be convicted, who would be hanged, who would be released. And she said, and I quote, it shows it's not a legitimate system. There's no rule of law. Obviously, the community is desperately calling for more to be done to show the Iranian regime that these hateful acts will not be tolerated. Australia is capable of effective action, and it is time for Australia to join the US, Canada, UK and the Europeans in continuously imposing new tranches of sanctions. These incredibly brave women and their allies here and in Iran continue to battle against oppression, to stand up for basic human rights, the right to choose what they wear, what religion they practice, what careers they have and what they do with their bodies. These freedoms must not be denied. The courage and commitment of our sisters in Iran is an inspiration, but they're also a reminder that we must never be complacent and take rights for granted. Until Iran is free, until women all around the world are free and equal and able to go to school without being poisoned, we must raise our voices in this place and be the voices of those who cannot speak. We must raise our voices until we are louder than the oppressors. To these brave women, I promise you that the Greens hear you and we will keep fighting against oppression and for a world where women everywhere can live with dignity, respect and equality. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, this Saturday, the people of New South Wales are going to the polls. Now, when you enter that booth, you'll be presented with a choice between giving the reheated leftovers 
of the Liberals and Nationals a fourth consecutive term in office. Now, potentially, that will be 16 straight years in power, or a fresh start with New South Wales with Chris Minns and Labor. Now, when I look at this election, I'm struck by the similarities between it and the federal election last year. A tired, old, incumbent coalition government, plagued by scandals, addicted to pork barrelling and treating public money like Liberal and National Party campaign funds. On to its third, or in this New South Wales case, fourth leader, a government that has run out of ideas for how to deal with today's challenges. Where Prime Minister Morrison's great idea was getting children to drive forklifts, Premier Perrottet wants to spend $850 million on Australia's most complicated term deposit scheme. And just like Morrison, Perrottet is coming up against a Labor leader with serious ideas for fresh, meaningful reform and real solutions for the cost of living challenges facing the people of New South Wales. Now, those challenges are very serious. People across New South Wales, particularly in regional areas and in Western Sydney, are getting kicked in the teeth by the Coalition's failed agenda. Regional New South Wales has been allocated a grand sum of zero dollars in the next two years by the Coalition for Regional Road Upgrades. Zero dollars. No money for the next two years for regional roads under the Nationals. Now, does anyone remember when the Nationals used to be the party for the regions? Labor, by the way, has committed to $724 million in regional road investments. And we won't be pork barrelling regional funding like former Deputy Premier Balalaro did with the bushfire recovery grants either. But people in Sydney aren't doing much better under the Liberals because they are living the most told city on the planet. It costs some people in Western Sydney $60 a day to get to work in the CBD and back. $60 a day taken from your wallet and shoved straight into Transurban's pocket. And that's because of the Liberals' ideological obsession with privatisation. It's a kick in the teeth that every time you are charged to use a road you already paid for through your taxes. Take West Connects. It costs $21 billion to build, whilst the Premier, when he was Treasurer before the 2019 election, promised he would not privatise it. And then not only did he break his promise, but he flogged it off on the cheap to Transurban for just $20 billion. He flogged it off for less than it cost to build. And now, Western Sydney residents will be paying for it through the nose for the rest of their lives. Now, that is a forever tax on what should be our publicly owned and managed roads. Unlike the Perrottet government, which is making plans to privatise the new Western Harbour Tunnel, that will be another forever tax on residents of Western Sydney. The Labor is committed to ending the so-called administration's fees that Transurban slaps on top of your toll a rip-off on top of a rip-off, and Labor is committed to ending the secrecy around the privatisation contracts. We still have no idea what the Perrottet government signed the people of New South Wales up for when he flogged off West Connects and North Connects to Transurban, and Labor is committed to a $60 a week toll cap. Not $60 per day that some people are actually and currently paying, but $60 per week cap. Labor is committed to a review overhaul of the toll network led by former ACCC chairman Alan Fells. And on top of all that, Labor is committed to the end of the privatisation agenda in New South Wales. And I'm not just talking about roads. It's been revealed in recent days that the Perrottet government has spent $400,000 on consultants to advise on privatising Sydney water, privatising our roads, ports, electricity, public housing and land titles office isn't enough for them. They want to privatise water as well. Now that's an election season. The Premier is denying he wants to privatise Sydney water. Well, if that's the case, why spend almost half a million dollars on advice how to do it? Now, we already saw the Perrottet as Treasurer 
break his promise not to privatise Westconnex before the last election. And I don't think the people of New South Wales will be fooled for a second time. Modelling shows privatising Sydney water would increase water bills by 59 per cent. Another kick in the teeth to Sydney residents. Now, if the Minns Labor government is elected on Saturday, then the people of New South Wales will wake up on Sunday morning to a fresh start. You can wake up to a Saturday state government that will not be flogging off public assets to private consortiums on the cheap. You can't wake up to a state government that will actually make things in New South Wales again. You can wake up to a state government that will make things in Australia and in New South Wales again. The Perrottet government, meanwhile, has wasted billions of dollars on crack trams, trains that don't fit tracks and ferries that don't fit under bridges will decapitate you if you actually ride them on the top deck, and all of which were made overseas. Now, we actually have a rich, rich, rich history in New South Wales of domestic manufacturing, right across the state and particularly up in Newcastle. We've done it before. We've made trains. And a Minns Labor government has committed to building the Tangara replacement fleet, fleet, fleet right here again, an important step for skilling Australia and rebooting manufacturing. Bringing domestic manufacturing back is a massive opportunity for Australian industry, Australian skills and Australian jobs. Now That's why at the federal level we are launching the National Reconstruction Fund, and it would be so valuable to have a partner involving domestic manufacturing in our largest state. Now We don't share the Liberals and Nationals' ideological opposition to building things in Australia, just as we don't share their ideological opposition to fair wage rises for essential workers. The Perrottet government has imposed an arbitrary 2.5 per cent pay cap on nurses, healthcare workers, allied workers, teachers and other essential public workers since 2011. New South Wales allied health workers and nurses, teachers and other essential public workers are the only workers in Australia who are banned from negotiating pay increases with their employer. The Perrottet government was all too happy to praise nurses and allied health workers as heroes of the pandemic, but when it came to actually rewarding them with a fair pay increase, they were nowhere to be seen. Now, I bet just about every person in New South Wales has a parent, sibling, partner, neighbour or friend who is impacted by it. When the Perrottet government has its boot on the neck of such a large proportion of working people in New South Wales through its pay cap, it hurts the entire economy. Now, we came to office federally last year with a commitment to get wages moving again, and a Minns Labor government has that exact same commitment and has committed to scrapping the pay cap, not just because it's fair because it makes economic sense. Just as the Liberals and Nationals have robbed essential public workers of their fair pay, and just as they have robbed people in Western Sydney by flogging off their roads to Transurban, let's not forget they have also robbed people across Sydney of their nightlife. The Liberals' lockout laws decimated small business, decimated jobs and decimated nightlife in Sydney. The only people who benefited from the lockout laws were the casino wowsers and the wealthy property developers gentrifying inner Sydney. And if anyone is all confused by the term wowser, the Australian writer C.J. Dennis reportedly defined it as an ineffably pious person who mistakes this world for a penitentiary and himself for a water. Now, even now for the lockouts have been scrapped, the city is still struggling to come to, fire, come to life after dark. Sadly, we saw numerous iconic venues closed down in recent years. That's why I'm excited to see that the Minns Labor government $103 million investment in New South Wales' contemporary music scene. Sydney is an iconic global city. We deserve a lively nightlife, economy and live music at the heart of that, state, of that city. It's time for a fresh start. We have a fantastic members and candidates across the state, from Janelle Safran in Northern Rivers, to uh, who have done such a wonderful job in representing people in Lismore, right to Simon Earl and Miranda. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. It only takes a second 
a single second for our lives and for that of our families to be changed forever. It could be a car accident, a sporting injury, a fall from a roof or a swim at the beach. A catastrophic accident that results in a spinal cord injury, in years of rehabilitation, in specialist health care and a life in a wheelchair. It could happen to any one of us at any time. Today, 20,000 Australians and their families live with a spinal cord injury. And every single day in Australia, an Australian injures their spinal cord. In, addi in addition to the catastrophic impacts on their lives and the lives of their families, spinal injuries cost the nation uh, over nearly $4 billion a year. My home state of Western Australia accounts for 2,800 of Australians with spinal cord injuries, which cost over a half a billion dollars per year. And interestingly, and somewhat inexplicably, regional Western Australia has disp disproportionately more spinal cord injuries than in our metro areas. But the impacts on people's physical health, on their mental health, on their families, on their relationships are profound and are life-changing. All aspects of a person's life are impacted, and they have to adapt their lives to accommodate quite severe disabilities. These challenges are often exacerbated when people return to work after many months or many years of intense rehabilitation, having to adapt to very different ways of not only living but working. And today, there is still no treatment for people with a spinal cord injury. And it absolutely astounds me that globally spinal cord injuries have not received the research funding and attention they deserve, particularly given the severity of the impact of these injuries on the lives of so many. However, there is good news. And the good news is this, that Australian research bodies such as Neura and Spinal Cure Australia are now leading the way. Neura was founded in 1991 and it is an independent and non-for-profit research institute that is seeking to prevent, treat and cure brain and nervous system diseases, disorders and injuries through their world-leading research. Spinal Cure was founded in 1994 and Spinal Cure is now an Australian leader in funding and promoting cure-related spinal cord injury. They are a not-for-profit organisation relying solely on donations and grants to fund their groundbreaking research. And I'm delighted to have had the opportunity for several years now to work closely with Spinal Cure's passionate, very passionate CEO, Catherine Borkovic, and the inspirational executive director, Duncan Wallace. Duncan himself became a quadriplegic almost 40 years ago after being hit by a drunk driver. And in April 2022, Spinal Cure presented me and then Minister for Health Greg Hunt with a petition signed by more than 30,000 Australians calling for funding to establish a dedicated neurostimulation research and treatment program here in Australia. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank and also acknowledge Greg Hunt's passion and commitment uh, for support for this type of research here in Australia. And I'm delighted to advise colleagues that Spinal Cure recently received $6 million in funding under the Medical Research Future Fund towards their project SPARC, uh, which was, of course, delivered by the former coalition government. And this is the first time that government funding has been provided for core-focused spinal cord medical research in Australia. It is a well overdue development and the potential for this research is quite simply profound. Project SPARC is a national medical research collaboration led by Neura, which is working to develop the first treatments for Australians with spinal cord injuries through what they call neurostimulation clinical trials. And I've been working closely with Spinal Cure Australia to raise awareness for Project SPARC at a federal level. And I'm so proud to support the efforts of their amazing ambassadors, which include Sam Bloom and Kerry Ann Kennelly. Kerry Ann became a supporter of Spinal Cure after her beloved late husband John became paralysed 
after a tragic fall from a balcony that resulted in fractures to his C3 and C4 vertebrae. John was put into an induced coma. He spent six weeks in intensive care and had multiple operations. Doctors diagnosed him as an incomplete quadriplegic. Kerry Ann lovingly cared for him until he passed away in February 2019, three years after his accident. Since then, she has become a tireless advocate for research and support for those who have suffered a spinal cord injury. And Sam Bloom had an accident in Thailand when a balcony railing fell, causing her to fall six metres onto the concrete floor below. Miraculously, she did survive, but she suffered catastrophic injuries, becoming a paraplegic. Sam bravely shared her story in the book Sam Bloom, Heartache and Birdsong, where she tells her story about how her life and her family's life changed after that accident. Her inspirational book was turned into an absolutely magnificent movie called Penguin Bloom, which I encourage everybody to watch. It is deeply moving and it gives a wonderful insight into the lives who, of the families and the individuals whose lives have been changed forever by spinal cord injury. And Sam is not only a passionate advocate, she is a generous donor as well, and recently donated $100,000 of her own money to Project Spark. Neurostimulation is the world's leading experimental therapy for people with spinal cord injury. It is the use of tailored electrical currents to amplify messages between the brain and the body using the nerves that remain intact after an injury has occurred. It has already resulted in life-changing functional recovery, such as um, bowel and bladder control, hand movements and cardiovascular stability. Now, to most of us, this might not sound very significant, but regaining functions such as these are life-changing for a person with a spinal cord injury. And in some small but initial studies overseas, it has actually res restored the ability for some people to stand and to walk many years after this injury has occurred. And while the first trial will begin in Sydney, as a senator for Western Australia, I'm very excited that the second community-based clinical trial will be planned to be done in Perth. This trial will seek to improve hand, arm and respiratory function in quadriplegics. These two trials in Sydney and in Perth will treat over 200 Australians, hoping that we can restore some lost bodily functions. So my sincere thanks to the work of these amazing Australian research bodies. Treatments that will reverse the physical impacts of spinal cord injuries are now a very real possibility. People with spinal cord injuries have been waiting decades for the science to develop at the same speed as much other medical research has been done. Spinal Cure Australia is hopeful that they can reverse the cost of spinal injuries on the economy and expect the annual cost savings to be in the billions. But as we all know here in this place, that success cannot just be measured in dollars alone. The most important success is the improvement it will make to thousands of Australian lives. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, it is my great hope that Australia can cement its standing as a world leader in curing spinal cord injuries and also that we can play a pivotal role in global efforts to develop advanced therapies and ultimately, we hope, a cure. Once thought to be impossible, spinal cure may just make it possible to improve the lives of Australians living with a spinal cord injury. I strongly urge all colleagues uh, on all sides of this chamber to encourage and support the Albanese government uh, to ensure that they support uh, with further funding this important cause. I'm aware that there is a budget proposal that has been put forward to the government and I'd also like to take this opportunity to encourage the Health Minister to support and champion this proposal to, for additional funding to increase scientific research capability and expand, and expand um, clinical trials here domestically. So, to the team at Spinal Cure Australia, congratulations on your amazing work. You are already making a real difference in the lives of people and you're offering hope to so many more. I look forward to continuing to support your important research and your future life-changing findings for all Australians living with or supporting those who have uh, spinal cord injuries. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Senator Reynolds. Uh, Senator McKim. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm so proud of my home state of Tasmania today. A few days ago, on the steps of Parliament House in Spring Street and Melbourne, we saw a pathetically small group of transphobes stand next to actual Nazis as they, as they gave the Zig Heil salute. It was a disgraceful collusion between two absolutely hateful ideologies that represent actual fascism in this country. But yesterday, some of those same people, these Nazi sympathisers, these people who are transphobic and who play footsies with actual Nazis, came down to Nipaluna Hobart in my home state of Lutruwita, Tasmania. And you know what happened? They were run out of town. They were run out of town because they held what they thought would be a rally that turned into a pathetic agglomeration of about a dozen people and many hundreds of Tasmanians who believe in fairness, who believe in equality, who believe in love and who, to, who wanted to support their transgender siblings came out and shouted them down and ran them out of town. And it was a glorious day for my home state of Tasmania because Tasmanians came out and made it very clear that that hateful, transphobic, fascist agenda has no place, has no place in our society and it has to be stood up against and it has to be fought. And that's what happened yesterday and that was a beautiful, beautiful thing and I thank everyone who came out in Lutruwita, Tasmania yesterday to stand up for decency, to stand up for love, to stand up for compassion and to stand against the hateful ideologies of fascism and transphobia. I want to mention two people uh, in particular who represent the worst of those ideologies. Firstly, uh, Posey Parker, which is a pseudonym for Kelly J. Keane Minchell, who is a pathetic and disgusting excuse for a human being, who labelled my partner a groomer yesterday because she has a transgender son, my stepson, Jasper Lees. And I say to Posey Parker, or whatever pseudonym uh, Kelly J. Keen Minchell wants to go for, uh, wants to go by, that what she did yesterday was vile, disgraceful, untrue and disgusting, and it provided us with a window into her dark and warped soul. Yesterday also, um, another pathetic and vile excuse for a human being who goes by the name of Kim Allen on Twitter, or Kimberly Allen, dead named my, son, my stepson Jasper Lees on Twitter, deliberately misgendered him on Twitter and said the most vile and disgusting things about him on Twitter. Well, uh, Kimberly Allen, you can get in the bin alongside Posey Parker because Jasper has more humanity in his little toenail than either of you have in your entire bodies. He is an intelligent, funny, highly empathetic human, not to mention a very, very handsome young man, and his intelligence, his humour and his empathy are diametrically opposed to Posey Parker's and Kimberly Allen's. And Posey Parker belled the cat in Hobart yesterday when she admitted that she wasn't a feminist. She said that yesterday. And I agree with her that she's not a feminist. And there's plenty of transphobes like her who are not feminists. And we need to call Posey and Kimberly and their ilk what they actually are. And that is trans exclusionary right wing dropkicks. T E R D S. They're not turfs, they are turds. And that's how we should describe them. Turds. T E R D S. 
Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, update the Senate on an incredibly tragic event that occurred in the Northern Territory uh, in the past couple of days. <clears throat> on Sunday night, a 20-year-old Declan Laverty went to work a shift at one of the bottle shops in Darwin. Sadly, he never came back home after that shift. He was allegedly killed, and since then, a 19-year-old man has been charged with murder and taken into custody. It's the news that no parent, family, friend or a community ever wants to hear. No one expects to go to work or anywhere for that matter and to lose their life to violence. My heartfelt condolences go out to Declan's family, especially his mum and dad. We heard young Declan's father, Damien, still had his son's dinner waiting in the fridge for him that night. We also heard his mum, Samara, and dad, Damien, receive text messages from their son saying, love you, been stabbed. It's something we can't imagine the pain of any parent experiencing and something that is so heart-wrenching. No parent should ever worry about their child and about whether they will come home or not. Mr Acting Deputy President, we've been facing a lot of issues in the Northern Territory, most significantly these past couple of months. And I recognise that the issue of alcohol uh, is a deeply troubling issue uh, for many residents across the Northern Territory. And I know it's not just simply in the Northern Territory. Uh, it's also in many communities, in particular in Western Australia and, and in Queensland as well. But there is something going on across our country that we have to deal with here around uh, the, the scourge of violence that comes and emanates from alcohol. And whilst alcohol itself is not the complete cause, um, it is absolutely contributing to, to what we see occurring. And I say to the people of the Northern Territory that there is an increase here that has to be dealt with. But I also say to organisations like Larrakia Nation, for example, who do an incredible job under enormous stress and circumstances, and I say this personal message to the staff of the Larrakia Nation in Darwin. Darwin is on Larrakia country. And I have been out uh, with staff whether it's to see their work on the night and day patrol, uh, the way they interact with a lot of uh, families and uh, individuals who come in from communities who are either homeless or unable to return to their communities. The Larrakia Nation does a tremendous job in supporting and trying to work with individuals and families to assist them with whatever concerns they have. But I have heard... Uh, the, the CEO of Larrakia Nation also speak on radio that there is an expectation, Mr Acting Deputy President, that any First Nations people who come into onto Larrakia country need to also show respect, uh, need to show respect for uh, the place and the country of somewhere else and someone else, uh, but also for, for the people they come into contact with. And clearly this is a community call to all people, all groups and organisations uh, that things have to change. Uh, we cannot have uh, people walking in and out of bottle shops, taking off with alcohol and thinking that that's OK. And we cannot have uh, workers, uh, whether they're in bottle shops, whether they're in retail outlets uh, and stores across the Northern Territory, feeling unsafe and now feeling like they're so unsafe they may not get home. It is not good enough, Mr Acting Deputy President, and we have to ensure the safety of everyone. We stand here and talk about the importance of safety for women and children. Well, we stand here and say the safety of every person is absolutely critical. And I say to the people of the Northern Territory that every single person does matter and that what has occurred here this week uh, is a tragic incident and event. And my heart goes out to the families involved, but we have to do more and I'll certainly be looking at that when I get back to the Northern Territory. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, call Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. 
And today I have a personal story to convey, and it involves both my niece and her son. When she was just four years old, my niece Sarah was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Her readings were hard to stabilise, and at that time her insulin was administered via regular injections throughout the day. Sarah was kept alive and healthy through six injections a day. Starting school around that time, she was diagnosed. It involved her mother having to go to the school twice a day to take her readings and give her an insulin injection. As you can imagine, in the 30 years since then, Sarah has seen many benefits from improvements in technology, such as insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors, through to the many improvements in insulin types, particularly in the area of fast-acting insulins. Three years ago, Sarah's youngest son, Ollie, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at just two and a half. He was too young to tell his parents how he was feeling, let alone understand the need to have his finger pricked or a monitor and pump attached to him. It was a really difficult time for their family. Fiasp is a fast-acting insulin used by approximately 15,000 Australians with type 1 diabetes, and it is the most effective insulin for Sarah. It gives her flexibility in managing her diabetes and therefore improving her quality of life. And FIASP is the only insulin Ollie, who is only five, has ever used. Taking FIASP instead of a slower acting insulin means Sarah and Ollie can eat almost straight away. Without FIASP, they would have to take their insulin dose 15 to 20 minutes before eating and then wait. FIASP has helped this family manage meals better and any parent knows how hard it is to tell a hungry child they can't eat just yet. How does a child know they will be hungry in 20 minutes? When everyone else is eating, 20 minutes is a very long time for a child to wait. Type 1 diabetes is always there, but Sarah says FIASP provides one small element of normality at mealtimes. There is no other comparative insulin option for Sarah and Ollie. FIASP helps them to regulate their blood sugar levels so they don't spike too early or crash later. As an adult, Sarah knows how to live with and manage her diabetes, but parenting a child with type 1 diabetes is another matter altogether. A diabetes diagnosis disrupts the natural impulsiveness of childhood. You must always be prepared and have a plan to deal with every potential scenario. Sarah is on constant alert for Ollie, making him wait for his pump to be removed before he jumps into the pool for a swim or runs into the ocean. Taking finger pricks to me measure blood sugar levels and responding with a jelly bean or a drink of juice or administering insulin. It's constant interruptions to his day over and over again, she says. And Sarah has to be on alert for herself too. She needs to make sure she always has supplies at hand and check her blood sugar levels before she leaves the house to determine that she's okay to exercise, to eat, to drive. Sarah admits it can be relentless at times. So why am I telling, telling you about my family connection to this drug known as FIASP? Because it was recently announced that FIASP would be removed from the PBS on the 1st of April, leaving nearly 15,000 Australians like Sarah and Ollie facing a hike of $220 per script. They would be forced to find the hundreds of extra dollars each month when FIASP re reverts to a private prescription or find an alternative insulin, none of which have the same profile as FIASP. Last Friday, the Health Minister announced access to FIASP on the PBS would be extended by six months. Great news for Sarah, Ollie and the thousands of other Australians living with type 1 diabetes. However, this extension is only for six months, or 12 scripts each for Sarah and Ollie and it is under a supply-only arrangement to, pa to patients who already have a prescription on the 1st of April. So what happens when the 1st of October rolls around? Sarah, Ollie and the other 15,000 Australians who use FIASP deserve certainty about their future and their health. I don't want to simply accept my niece and great-nephew won't be able to access, access the medication that makes their lives easier, and I don't want to accept this situation for thousands of Australians in the same position as Sarah and Ollie either. Sarah is one of almost 40,000 people who have already signed the Change.org petition calling for FIAS to be reinstated to the PBS. Already impacted by the increasing costs of living with mortgages, energy and grocery prices, as well as medical visits rising, to add an extra cost of $400 plus a month for those people it is un unpalatable. I call on Minister Butler to negotiate a solution and keep FIAS on the PBS. 
Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. I'll call Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. March this year is the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, led by the United States and its lackeys, including shamefully this country. The Iraq war was bloody, aggressive, and illegal. It should be remembered as a crime against humanity. How can the atrocities at Abu Ghraib prison, the attacks on civilians in Baghdad's Nisur Square, and the bombardment of Fallujah be called anything other than a crime against humanity? The war destroyed Iraq, took hundreds of thousands of Iraqi lives, nine million people were displaced, five million Iraqi children were orphaned. Entire generations can never look at the sky the same way. And yet, the architects of this war and these war crimes walk free. Blair, Bush, and Howard have faced no accountability. The Bush administration manipulated the facts and deliberately deceived the public after 9-11. Hell-bent on invading Iraq, Bush stoked fear, hate, and Islamophobia to build support for war. Tony Blair exaggerated the case for war and rushed into conflict, the UK giving the US the diplomatic cover they needed for their criminal acts of aggression. John Howard gave false reasons for going to the war. Howard lied to Parliament and he lied to the public, and he remains unrepentant. Sadly, Iraq's people are not the only victims of the Western world's so-called war on terror, as the people of Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and others will attest to. Muslims throughout the world who felt the sear of Islamophobia because of the lies manufactured to enable the war were also victims of this so-called war on terror. Most offensive was the narrative that Iraqi people needed Western intervention to free them. Black and brown people have never needed white saviors. The reality is that they were seen and they are seen as just pawns in the game of imperialists, their pain and suffering completely ignored. Greed is often at the core of warmongering. Before the 2003 invasion, Iraq's domestic oil industry was state-owned and closed to Western oil companies. After the war, it was largely privatized and is now dominated by foreign firms. The likes of ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, and Chevron have all set up shop in Iraq. 20 years on, justice has not been served. The arrogant AUKUS dealers demonstrate the Western war machine remains as powerful and bloodthirsty as ever, including here in Australia. We see constant hysterical warmongering on our front pages and no regard for the impact on Chinese communities, just as there was no regard for Muslim communities 20 years ago. Disgracefully, the Albanese government is as eager as the Morrison government was to make Australia America's little lapdog. They are too cowardly to admit that nuclear submarines, missiles, bombs will not protect people. In Australia, we face the worst housing crisis ever. More and more people are living in poverty. Amidst the climate crisis, a code red for humanity has been declared. When it comes to these mammoth problems, the Labour government shrugs its shoulders and cries poor. There's not enough money to stop the growing homelessness crisis, they say. There's not enough money to raise income support so people don't have to live in poverty and children don't have to go hungry. There's not enough money to provide higher education without punishing students with mountain high debt. We are nowhere near the action so desperately needed to stop the ticking climate bomb. But there is unlimited money for dangerous weapons and war machines that we don't need. $360 billion of it, to be precise, pumped straight into the US weapon companies and the military industrial complex, courtesy of the Australian public. Austerity for people and planet, abundance for the war machine. Iraq deserves full accountability and reparations for what Western invaders did. We owe this to the people of Iraq and to the countries that were targeted and the victims of these wars. We need to push back against labor and the liberals' war agenda with every fiber of our being. We must mobilize against war and militarization. We must build a mass movement of peace. Let's learn the lessons from past colossal failures of entirely futile and bloody imperial wars that have been waged by Europe, the US, and their Western allies like Australia. Let's not repeat these unmitigated disasters. Thank you, Senator Fruku. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the ABS published uh, data today showing that 
nearly one in 200 people were homeless on census night in 2021. Uh, the data shows that 122,494 people were estimated to be experiencing homelessness at the time of the 2021 census, an increase of 6,067 people, or 5.2 per cent, since 2016. This is something that we should all be concerned about in this place. And many advocates believe that those figures are likely conservative as the census was conducted at the height of COVID lockdowns. Uh, this is an issue around the country and here in the ACT, uh, we're often perceived as a, an affluent community, but that masks a lot of acute poverty that exists outside these walls. Canberra has the highest rate of persistent homelessness in Australia, almost twice the national average. Uh, this is an embarrassing, uh, not only embarrassing, this is a, sh a shameful fact that needs addressing here uh, at a local ACT government level and through measures in this place. At the time of the last census, we also had the highest proportion of people in supported accommodation uh, for the homeless. And in light of concerns about housing and the proposed Housing Australia Future Fund, the ACT stands to lose the highest number of NRAS properties, the, the National Rental Affordability, Affordability Scheme properties, of any electorate over the next three years. Uh, more than half of our funding under the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement goes straight back to the Commonwealth coffers in historic housing debt repayments, a debt that has been forgiven for Tasmania a debt that's been forgiven for South Australia. Outside these doors of Parliament, here in the ACT, more than 8,000 Canberra children are living below the poverty line. Distressingly, the data released today shows that homelessness is impacting women and young people in increasing numbers. While the number of men experiencing homelessness increased by 1.6%, the number of women experiencing homelessness increased by 10.1%. Nearly a quarter of all people experiencing homelessness were aged between 12 and 24 years. We saw an increase in Indigenous people experiencing homelessness. We have to do better. Uh, we have to do much better and we can do better. And, and that's why I'm pushing the government to ensure that we have more ambition on the Housing Australia Future Fund. We can't afford to let this crisis get worse. Uh, and without more action from the feder federal government, it will. The federal government has a long history of, of building social and affordable housing. Under the Housing Australia Future Fund, the AC will be lucky to get an extra 500 houses over the next five years. That's against a shortfall that stands of more than 3,100. Uh, what, what do I say to the 2,600 households who, after five years, will still be waiting for somewhere to call home? Uh, what do we say to the increasing number of people sleeping rough in cars, couch surfing, or on the street in our communities? The ACT has received none of the $3.4 billion in finance from NIFIC since it commenced operation in 2018. Let's remember that housing is not a nice to have. Housing is a fundamental human right. And the, the blame game and the buck passing needs to end. Uh, this talk of, I know it's not enough, but it's a good start, is frankly not good enough. Uh, a $10 billion housing fund, while well welcome, needs to go further. You put that against the $20 billion medical research uh, future fund that was established and is doing great work. Uh, I'd argue that Housing is an issue across the country that deserves more than what is being offered up by the government. Uh, there's an opportunity to do more. We can do more. It comes down to political will in this place. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, Minister, I believe you're seeking the call. Sorry. Uh, I table the document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the GST. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll now go to. Do I need 
Sorry, Clark, do I need to? Correct. Thank you. And it's now time for two-minute statements. I'll call Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to make some statements about the New South Wales election on Saturday. I think it is a very important opportunity for people across New South Wales to make a judgment for our future, uh, which takes into account the recent past. Now, it was only 12 years ago since the Labor Party had 16 years in New South Wales where they ran the place into the ground. And anyone who's lived in Sydney or in New South Wales over the past decade knows that the city and the regions have been revitalised and rejuvenated by a dynamic leadership which has seen huge construction of roads and transport routes across the state of New South Wales. Sydney is almost unrecognisable as a city to commute around because of the bold leadership that has been undertaken by Barry O'Farrell, Mike Baird, Gladys Berejiklian and Dominic Perrottet. So I wanted to urge people uh, across New South Wales to think carefully about our future, think carefully about the investments that have been made in Sydney and across New South Wales, uh, not just in roads but also in public spaces, museums. And there has been enormous investment into clean energy and childcare in the, in the last couple of years uh, across New South Wales, which has set, set the state up for uh, success in the future. So it is, is a very big choice that the people of New South Wales have on Saturday between going back to uh, the dead hand of Labor and no progress and no investment or the very significant progress that's been seen under the Liberal National Coalition where Sydney and New South Wales is back to where it should be, which is the leading jurisdiction in Australia, a, a city and a state that we can be proud of. So I urge people to vote one, uh, Liberal or National, on Saturday across New South Wales. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Some 3.6 million Australians of all ages are living with arthritis. Many of them are, in fact, children, and it is a leading, leading cause of their pain and disability in children. Arthritis is, of course, a musculoskeletal condition and it has a variety of forms, and it's the second highest burden of disease group in Australia, only behind, um, and it's in fact uh, the highest non-fatal disease burden. Juvenile arthritis is as common as juvenile diabetes and causes permanent damage and disability. I want to thank uh, the Juvenile Arthritis Foundation and Arthritis Australia for the event that they supported in Parliament this week. They highlighted that children in Australia do not receive the same standard of care as they would in a comparable country like the UK. In Australia, we have fewer than 15 paediatric uh, rheumatologists in positions around Australia which is way too few for the thousands and thousands of children with arthritis. They can't get diagnosed and, as a result, they can't get treatment. We have the first ever comprehensive national survey of the cost of juvenile arthritis and childhood rheumatic disease uh, now taking place. And I want to thank Jed Carney for launching the register for children for these conditions so that children can find each other and families can support each other. I know with a strong commitment uh, from government and the community we can make a difference to these children. Thanks, Senator Pratt. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you. It has been a very tough time for the trans community. This weekend we saw a vile alliance of hate between the transphobes, neo-Nazis and other far-right extremists on the streets of Melbourne. Last night, One Nation's Mark Latham spoke at an anti-trans meeting in Sydney. That is disgusting on its own, but outside, LGBTQIA activists peacefully protesting were violently attacked. This chamber has seen much hate-mongering targeting trans people from the likes of One Nation. They are expanding their catalogue of hate from Asian Australians and Muslims to the entire trans community. They are constantly searching for new targets to whip up a frenzy against. 
The bigotry towards trans people has become one of the defining elements of far-right extremism. This is abhorrent. I vehemently condemn these merchants of hate. Their hate reverberates around the community and causes tremendous harm. Transgender people are some of, some of the most marginalized. Young transgender people face enormous stigma and are at much higher risk of serious mental health concerns, self-harm and suicide than their peers. The media outlets in the last few years, which have platformed hate against trans people and al allowed it to be spread, should be ashamed. The politicians in this place who spew transphobic bigotry don't really belong here. Fascism, transphobia and racism are all part of the same arc of hate that must be destroyed. My solidarity is with the courageous LGBTQIA plus and anti-fascist pro protesters who have been fighting against a sickening level of prejudice and hate this week. Transphobia has no place in politics, in media or in society. There should be zero tolerance for this. We should be loud and proud about the rights for trans and gender diverse people. Trans rights are human rights. Senator Henderson. Acting Deputy President, one of the great joys of my role as Shadow Minister for Education is to meet so many inspiring teachers and educators who are working so hard in our schools and university campuses to transform the lives of young Australians. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, last week it was a great pleasure to travel to Bendigo where I visited Holy Rosary Primary School and the Bendigo campus of La Trobe University. It was wonderful to meet with Grade 6 students who had plenty of good ideas about improving their school. And it was also fabulous to learn about the wide range of courses being offered at La Trobe Bendigo, including courses in dentistry, paramedicine and teaching. I was particularly inspired to learn about La Trobe's strong focus on the importance of phonics and the science of teaching children to read. Reading is foundational to a child's success at school and beyond. I am concerned that some of our teachers aren't being adequately prepared by our universities to teach the basics in Australian classrooms. I congratulate La Trobe, which in 2022 introduced the Solar Lab, short for the Science of Language and Reading, which is supporting schools adopt well-established scientific approaches to improve children to, to improve how they teach children to read. While the explicit teaching of phonics is now part of the national curriculum, concerningly there is a massive inconsistency in its adoption. Uh, in Victoria, the focus has been on balanced literacy, where students are taught to memorise words using a combination of whole language practices and phonics. Australian children need the best teaching methods to help them to reach their full potential. Senator, we live in the best country Senator, in the world, and I want to congratulate the tribe. Thank you. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Um, sorry, I have a different speaker's list. Senator, I'm Senator Brown, but... Is the Brown? Sorry, just trying to keep. Online, sorry. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, earlier this year, the Albanese uh, government released the first road safety action plan under the National Road Safety uh, Strategy. The action plan focuses on delivering tangible, measurable actions and clear responsibilities and timeframes. The action plan, like the strategy, contains nine key priority areas, including and included in the priority areas is infrastructure, planning and investment. Through the strategy, infrastructure and transport ministers from across the country have agreed that all investments in road infrastructure planning, design and construction must have the safe systems approach applied to them. The safe systems approach to road safety has a long-term goal for a road system which is eventually free from death and serious injury. The safe systems principle is based on the underlying principles that humans make mistakes that lead to road collisions and that there is a shared responsibility between road users, road managers and vehicle manufacturers to take appropriate action to ensure that road collision does not lead to death. Safe system requires a proactive approach to ensuring road safety is front of mind in not only road design and building but also vehicle manufacturer and road users. 
Through this action plan, the Australian Government has committed to coordinating a review of the Australian road rules and to, de and to development of a regulatory impact statement on reducing open road default speeds. The consultation will be conducted with state and territory governments, local governments and police. Further, the Fed Australian Government will develop an assessment and evaluation framework for the delivery of roads road safety upgrades funded by the Australian Government. This and the other eight actions provide a pathway to Vision Zero, our shared commitment for zero deaths and zero injuries Senator by 2050. Brown, your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Labor's aspiring New South Wales Premier Chris Minns apparently had a bit of a problem on the campaign trail yesterday. His electric campaign bus full of staffers and reporters ran out of power and we hear they had to be rescued by a bus with a more reliable diesel engine. In the end, it's only a minor embarrassment for Mr Minns, but once again, the incident was not a great look for those who say electric vehicles are going to save the planet from climate change. We're constantly told these vehicles will reduce fossil fuel use and carbon dioxide emissions. Companies falling over themselves to pander to green left climate activists have been quick to showcase their uptake of electric vehicle technology. These include mining companies, all too often the target of activists, even though without them there wouldn't be any of the raw materials needed to make wind turbines, solar panels and rechargeable batteries. This trend has been mi seen mining companies replace diesel powered haul dump trucks with electric diesel trucks in an effort to reduce their fossil fuel use and so-called carbon footprint. But those diesel trucks were burning 3,000 to 4,000 litres of diesel every 24 hours. However, the electric diesel trucks are burning no less than 5,000 litres of diesel fuel every 24 hours, at least 25 per cent more than diesel-only vehicles. Of course, the Green left activists will continue to signal the virtue of this wonderful fuel-saving technology. As I've said before, hypocrisy is a new green left virtue, and they never let the facts stand in the way of a good story. Senator Hanson. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The latest report by the energy market operator, AEMO, confirms our worst fears that Labor is driving Australia headlong towards a gas and energy crisis. In this latest report, southern states will be at risk of shortfalls from winter this year. From 2027, there will not be enough domestic gas to cover the eastern market, meaning blackouts and gas rationing across the east coast. AEMO has pointedly noted that the government's price intervention and mandatory code of conduct are key drivers in creating market uncertainty, which is leading to reduced investment in supply. That is real jobs for real people in regional Queensland that go. With skyrocketing energy bills already hitting Australian families and businesses, Australians now face energy blackouts and rationing across the years to come, thanks to Labor's disastrous market interventions. Despite repeated warnings from the Coalition over the last six months, Labor has chosen to ignore common sense and instead taken actions that will continue to destroy supply and result in gas and electricity shortages. Last October, they cut funding for gas development in the budget. Last December, they destroyed new supply from investors with their interventions, and in the last sitting, they banned additional federal funding for gas projects. AEMO and the ACCC are calling for further investments into supply, storage and infrastructure to avert the looming shortfalls and secure energy supplies. But under Labor's failed policies, gas investment has dried up. Southern import terminals have stalled, domestic supplies are inadequate and power prices are rising. The Coalition's record on gas is clear. We need to put in place measures to support new supply and address shortfall risk, but Labor has torn these plans up and Australian families and businesses are losing out as a result. The only way power prices are coming down under Labor is when there's no energy left to buy. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and I rise to speak today to the admirable works of nine religious leaders who have all openly endorsed the Voice to Parliament and the Yes campaign. Yeah. This referendum campaign will need the voices of civic society, of the faith groups that form the backbone of so much of our social fabric and our social services. They note in an open letter to federal parliamentarians that the Voice is, and I quote, necessary, right and reasonable, and that Future generations will not forgive us if we fail to grasp this historical moment. 
and the generous offer from our First Nations brothers and sisters. The civil society support for The Voice is wide and deep. National Australia Bank, Commonwealth Bank, ANZ, BHP, Rio Tinto, West Farmers, Woolworths and Coles have all endorsed The Voice to Parliament. The trade union movement stands four square with its Indigenous members in supporting the Yes campaign for the referendum. I note and thank the members of the Anglican Church, the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference, the Australian National Imams Council, the Australian Sangha Association, the Executive Council of Australian Jewry, the Hindu Council of Australia, the National Council of Churches, the National Sikh Council and the Uniting Church General Assembly for lending the proud civic leadership and moral authority that they bring to this vital campaign. I look forward to further work with these wide-ranging religious communities as we walk hand in hand with the First Nations community towards a successful yes vote in this year's referendum. Senator O'Neill. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I want to acknowledge the passing of a strong black matriarch, Auntie Alice. She was a strong woman born on the rabbit proof fence and she spent her whole life fighting for First Nations people. I know that I wouldn't be here in this place today without women like her who have spent their whole lives fighting for First Nations justice. She endured so much hardship, racism and injustice, but she tirelessly overcame every ob ob obstacle in her way, and I want to take this time to thank her. Thank her for her life's work. Thank her for her change that she helped create. We have a long way to go, but without aunties like her, we would not be where we are now. She was loved by her family and her communities right across Australia, uh, Western Australia, and I send my love to them as they are conducting their sorry business now. I was honoured to have been asked, alongside other incredible First Nations people, uh, to cre create a video that was played during her story business. And in that video, I shared a poem that I wrote and I would like to sh share with you here today. Born on the rabbit proof fence, her journey began along the rabbit proof fence. And for 96 years, she walked with us, witnessing our struggles and our joys, a fearless black matriarch leading us. Grandma Alice has gone from our arms but lives on in our songs. Her footsteps have shaped this land and our hearts. We still hear her words of hope and resilience, a wise black matriarch teaching us. We remember her strength, her smile, as she fought for us so that we could thrive. Beside us through heartbreak and struggles and trials, a loving grandma holding us. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Babette. Thank you. There's a famous saying in politics, and that is, never let a good crisis go to waste. Now, there's an argument to be made that the bank failures that we are seeing could be used as an excuse to usher in a brave new world of central bank digital currency. Now, you can think of CBDC as digital money, but it's very different to what you have in your net bank right now. It's based off the blockchain technology, so you need to think of it as more like a coupon or a voucher. That's a more accurate description. Now, this money is programmable. The government will be able to see exactly where your money is, where it goes, how it's spent, what it's spent on, etc. The CBDC, when you really think about it, is arguably more dangerous to your freedom than a standing army. I'll give you an example. The government could easily restrict what you spend your money on. Perhaps they restrict how much alcohol you can buy or what food you can buy. Perhaps they say you can only purchase a certain amount of red meat this month because you've reached your carbon quota. Perhaps the government sets an expiry date on your digital money or a negative interest rate. The potential for abuse of this technology is limitless. And at the end of the day, it's first and foremost about control of the population through the financial system. Now, anyone that might say oh, the government would never do that, it will never happen, you haven't been paying attention over the last two years. The government could absolutely do that. Now, people must push back against the central bank digital currency lest we lose what little freedom we have left. This is not a conspiracy theory. Our central bank is doing a trial of CBDC right now. Oh, Senator Babbitt, thank you. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. Clock. Sorry. As a boy, I read as much as I could about Simon Wiesenthal. 
Uh, he was a survivor of Nazi concentration camps. He was a survivor of, of a Nazi death march. And as a survivor of the Holocaust, he spent his remaining life gathering information on Nazis and hunting Nazis. But my family have no Jewish antecedents. But as a boy, I could never understand the hatred towards those who were Jewish. I couldn't understand the hatred of Nazis that they exhibited towards their fellow citizens. And it was hate. And as an adult and as a senator, I still can't understand that hatred, the hate towards those who are different. So I stand in this chamber and I cannot comprehend why any Australian would join the Nazi party or give the Nazi salute. I am proud that in my family, my grandfather's brother, Uncle Gray, with the surname Schneider, who grew up on a farm in Queensland where German was spoken within living memory, joined the Australian army to fight the Nazis. So I'm equally proud that earlier today, Peter Dutton moved in the House of Representatives to bring in a bill to allow the member for Barara, my friend Julian Lisa, to amend the criminal code to, to, to ban the display of Nazi symbols. Mr Dutton said that Nazi symbols must be condemned wherever and wherever they are found. And I would hope that all senators in this place and that all members of the House of Representatives join, join with Mr Dutton and Mr Lisa, who is Jewish, to bring forward and support this bill. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. I said I'd use my position in this place to elevate the voices in our communities. Today I want to share something with you from Your Town Kids Helpline. They do really important work with young people and mental health, so here are some words directly from their mouth. We tell young children to reach out and ask for mental health support. Kids Helpline is the critical safety net for every young person in Australia. And no matter where they live, no matter what time of the day or night, it's always there when they need it. Over 443,000 young people between 5 and 25 contacted Kids Helpline Help last financial year. It's unique in what it offers. It's 24-7 and it's free. It's often the only mental health service available after hours, on the weekends, or for young people who live in rural and remote areas. Last year, over half of the young people Kids Helpline supported contacted the service after hours and on weekends. One young person who used Kids Helpline said that they struggled with depression, anxiety and suicidal thoughts throughout their teens. There is no question the service saved their life many times. Right now, Kids Helpline needs your support. The technology that underpins this vital service needs urgent upgrading. And without it, we may not be able to support young people in the contemporary ways they want to engage in, a safe and non-judgmental environment. We need $10.5 million in funding to make this happen. This will future-proof the service, ensuring that Kids Helpline can keep supporting young people's mental health for many more years to come. And this is vital if, we're vital if we want to ensure every child that reaches out for help will have someone there to help them." End quote. Minister, this is straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I really hope you consider funding this. It's a vital service for the health and well-being of our young people. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about recent events in what they now call Queensland, where new laws have been passed to bring more and more young people into contact with the criminal legal system and be locked up. These incredibly harsh laws make breach of bail an offence while expanding electronic monitoring of young people. Human rights advocates and legal experts have warned this will not only be ineffective but lead to the number of children in detention skyrocketing. There is wide range evidence that youth imprisonment, which is what these laws seek to achieve, does not rehabilitate. It just creates a lifelong relationship with a criminal legal system. These laws are unjust, inhumane and violate several human rights commitments, including Queensland's very own Human Rights Act. 
Unfortunately, First Nation kids, of course, are the most targeted by these racist and unjust laws, including the racist police, thus continuing the genocidal project of governments in this country of separating First Nations kids from their families and their cultures and locking them behind bars. When a First Nations child is born, they inherit and learn cultural wisdom, knowledge and strength. If only it were a reality that our children could live out their birthright in this country, that they would live a journey of peace, culturally and spiritually safe. No First Nations child should be robbed of their birthright in so-called Australia. Our children need family and community to grow up and strive, not to be locked up. We must all fight for a world in which all children can live out their birthright and remain surrounded by their family and Thank culture. You, Stop Paul. the genocide. Senator Dunning. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I very much look forward to my contributions in this little part of the Senate uh, uh, agenda for the day. And my favourite topic is, of course, the state of Tasmania, which is what I'm going to talk about today, and in particular that amazing Tasmanian Liberal government, the Rockliffe government, that is putting energy, energy, energy into an amazing project, an upgrade of the Midland Highway, which runs between two population centres, Hobart and Monster Town, sorry, Launceston, a beautiful city in the north of the state. And it is a bit painful to get from one end of the state to the other, but I tell you what, that pain is worth the gain. And it's great to see the elbow Nisi government working in lockstep with the Rockliffe government, picking up from the former government, the Morrison government. But it's great to see all Tasmanians pulling in the same direction, uh, making sure that our, our state uh, and its economy grows. Whether you like sarsaparilla or whether you like coke, whether you cook on a George Foreman grill or whether you cook on a barbecue, all of these things are an amazing uh, quality for Tasmanians. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to, as a proud Tasmanian, uh, and, and I do acknowledge uh, the presence of my good friend and colleague, Senator Brown, who I work very closely with on a lot of these issues, and including preparation of some of these speeches. Um, <laughs> So, uh, to highlight the good things about our state, and I know she's a supporter of the Tasmanian government um, you know, and the good works they do as well, and we all pull in the same direction, as I said. Uh, and, and when it comes to energy, things like our amazing opportunity when it comes to pumped hydro, the Marinus interlink uh, that will one day connect Tasmania even more with the mainland and generate that clean green energy we have. I'm a proud Tasmanian, and I stand with my colleagues to make sure that. Uh, that we do a great job with that energy, energy, energy we all display energy. in this place. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I recently visited a class of Year 11 politics and law students at Duncraig High School, senior high school um, at my hometown, home state of Western Australia. Aside from an unwelcome reminder of how short I am, I was not sure what to expect. These students were only beginning their studies in this area, but after only a few moments, I could tell they were genuinely intrigued by, the, by politics and the work that the Albanese Labor government is doing to prepare for their futures. I shared with them my story as a migrant to this country and my path of now having the honour of being able to represent them in this place. And it's important to show how our young people that no matter the circumstances in a country like Australia, there are opportunities to succeed. However, the real joy of this visit was the depth and complexity of questions the students asked me across a wide range of issues. It was an incredibly refreshing change compared to what I'm about to experience hearing uh, during question time from those opposite. I was asked about tackling discrimination, gender equality, um, the environment, career opportunities, and even about Australian foreign affairs. I was very impressed and even more delighted to be able to tell them that our government is taking real action on issues like closing the gender pay gap, legislating emissions reductions targets to get us to net zero, fee-free TAFE places, and the list goes on. A huge thank you to the students at Duncraig Senior High School and their incredible teacher, Elizabeth Clark, for organising the visit. And I'm excited to keep meeting students across WA. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payman. We'll now move to question time. Senator McGrath. Thank you, President. 
My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Can the Minister name anywhere in Australia where power prices have been reduced since you've been in government? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam President, and thank Senator McGrath for his, um, his, um, his, uh, his question. Um, um, <clears throat> look, I have to say I, um, I'm, uh, I, I, I don't follow um, power prices as closely to be able to answer the the question, and I'm not sure that there's any any uh, any person in this chamber who is uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, closely watches uh, power prices to be able to give uh, uh, that answer. But what I can say what I can say is this, um, Senator McGrath, and <clears throat> um, I did say something uh, similar yesterday that. Um, it's the objective of the Albanese government to put downward pressure on power prices um, so that um, Australian consumers, household, uh, householders, but also Australian businesses um, don't have to pay the high electricity prices that have resulted from your years and years and years of neglect uh, in this uh, space. Um, we want Australian consumers, we want Australian businesses um, to um, be paying less for their power prices. And so the things that we've done, the caps that we've done, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to get, well firstly it wasn't easy to make that decision. It wasn't easy um, to get it through this parliament because your party, your party opposed all of those uh, changes that might have put downward pressure on electricity no, prices. No. So I think, I think it's a little bit rich, you coming into this question time, asking these questions when we're in a situation as a result of your neglect. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Your time uh, for answering that question has expired. Senator McGrath, first supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister identify a single mortgage holder who has seen their interest rate go down in the past 10 months? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. Se thank you, uh, President, and um, uh, thanks, Senator McGrath, for um, uh, for his uh, for his question. Um, look, I have great sympathy for uh, mortgage holders for the situation in which uh, they find themselves and the repeated increases in uh, in interest rates. But um, there's a whole. Uh, Sen Minister, um, please. Uh, Resume your seat. As Senator thought I was going to bring it to the Chamber's attention, I was just going to let this set of questions go. King photos, um, that's yes. all. Thank you. I remind all there apparently is a Senator taking photos. We all know that's inappropriate. I just remind the Chamber to, um, to not do that. And um, I expect I expect Senator Thorpe, I am responding. I expect the government will um, speak to the Senator concerned. Minister Farrell, please concern. Please continue. All right. Um, so where was I? Um, okay. Okay. So so um, we all know we all know the reasons why there's pressure on um, interest uh, rates in in this country and. Um, we're not unique in that regard because there's uh, pressure on, on re uh, uh, interest rates going up uh, right, right around the world. But again, this government is trying to do things to reduce um, cost of living. Um, um, well, uh, thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator McGrath, second supplementary. Can the minister identify a single person whose grocery bill is lower today? Than when you came into government. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator McGrath for his uh, question. Well, again, um, I, I can't say that I know um, the grocery price of you know every retail uh, store in the uh, in the country, and therefore you know what uh, the consumers themselves choose to uh, to buy. I do know I do know that uh, as a matter of practice, having uh, some experience in the retail industry and a former uh, former occupation. That uh, one thing people do do 
uh, when uh, prices start to rise is they change uh, the particular products that they uh, that, that, that they purchase. But again, um, it's the purpose. It's a purpose. It's the purpose of this. It's, it's the purpose. It's the purpose of this government to try and put downward pressure on the cost of living, and we're doing that. We're doing that in terms of things like uh, childcare. We're we're uh, doing that. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. <clears throat> My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Today, new homelessness data has been released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which shows that over 122,000 people were homeless on census night. Can the minister outline the practical measures the Albanese Labor government is taking to address cost of living pressures for people, particularly those experiencing housing stress or homelessness? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister Gallagher. Thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Walsh uh, for her question. The Albanese government wants every Australian to have the security of having a roof over their head. We know that too many Australians are being hit by growing rents and too many Australians are struggling to buy a home. It's unacceptable that it's getting more and more expensive to have a safe and secure home. And sadly, as we have found out today, as Senator Walsh alluded to in her question, far too many Australians are facing homelessness. As reported today on census night, nearly 123,000 Australians were homeless. This is unacceptable. We have also seen figures today that show in the five years to 2021, under the former government's watch, the number of homeless people grew each night by 6,000. This is what we need to improve. This is why we need to improve access to affordable and safe homes for all Australians. We were elected with a plan to clean up the mess that was left behind and help tackle the cost of accessing a home. Fundamental to our plan is increasing the supply of new housing. Australians do not have enough supply of new housing. The $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund will be the largest boost to social and affordable homes in a decade. The 30,000 homes the fund will deliver are one part of the Albanese government's ambitious housing agenda, which also includes broadening the National Housing Infrastructure Facility, the Housing Accord, the $1.6 billion National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, the Interim National Housing Supply and Affordability Council, a new National Housing and Homelessness Plan, the Help to Buy Scheme and the Regional First Home Buy Guarantee. Uh, the government is going to continue to push and argue in this chamber uh, to have the passage of that important piece of legislation so that we can put in place the fund that will provide an ongoing source of investment into the social and affordable housing sector. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, how will the Albanese Labor government's Housing Australia Future Fund help to support people with acute housing needs? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Walsh. The Housing Australia Future Fund will provide regular and reliable capital funds to build new social and affordable homes across Australia in perpetuity. As we have heard in the Senate hearing last week from experts, community housing providers, homelessness services and academics, this is urgently needed. National Shelter, the peak body that so many of us deal with on these matters, called it the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward for the past 10 years. In, in its first five years, this fund will be investing in building uh, 20,000 social housing properties with 4,000 properties for women and children fleeing domestic violence and older women who are at risk of homelessness, $100 million for crisis and transitional housing for women and children and $30 million to build more housing for veterans who are experiencing or at risk of, of homelessness. I hope that everyone in the Senate will consider these statistics when that legislation comes for a vote over this sitting Minister, fortnight. Minister, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Minister, why is it so important that the Housing Australia Future Fund is delivered? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And I thank Senator Walsh for the question and for her interest in um, the issue of social and affordable housing in Australia. It's so important that this fund is delivered. It is the first fund of its kind which would provide an ongoing revenue stream into the social and affordable housing sector. The first time that we would have set something up via legislation 
to make investments. And this is over and above the traditional areas of the Commonwealth investment through our national partnerships with the states and territories. But it's in recognition that um, there is not enough supply and there is not enough supply of housing going into the areas where it's needed the most, in First Nations communities, in, um, for women, for veterans, um, for especially single older women who um, have no retirement savings or, and who might be living on their own. Um, this is the area that we need to make these investments, and that is why this piece of legislation is so important, and that is why the opposition should change their position Thank you, on Minister. this bill. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Yesterday during question time, the Minister for Finance said, the fact is stage three tax cuts have been legislated by this chamber. They are in place. Stage three will commence in July next year. The policy we took to the election was that those tax cuts remain and our position has not changed. That is what I was saying yesterday. That continues to be our position. Minister, does Mr Albanese, the Prime Minister, remain committed to implementing the stage three tax cuts? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Farrell. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I thought the answer was yes, John. You just say yes. Order. You don't get to answer As much. Thank anymore, you, I'm President, right. and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Chandler. And um, I, um, with all due respect to Senator Birmingham, I am quite capable of answering my own questions and doesn't don't need his uh, don't 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 need Order. don't need Order. don't. And Minister Farrell, don't, please don't resume need, your seat, uh, Minister. Minister Farrell, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Thank you. Order on my left. Minister Farrell. Thank you, thank you, President. Thank you for that uh, protection. Um, um, look, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I find it. I find it difficult to understand why the coalition. This is the second question today. Um, that, that, that you've asked, uh, basically asking the same question that you answered yesterday, and would would you be surprised? Would you be surprised, Senator? Senator would would you be surprised, Senator Chandler, if the Prime Minister, um, who's doing a wonderful job, had any different had, he, had any different view about tax cuts than uh, the Finance Minister, who's doing just a, an amazing job, given? The, uh, the mess that uh, you left her uh, to, uh, to yes yes I forgot about that yes yes at least we have a finance minister who is trusted by uh, his uh, have, well Senator they Cash. trust him too they they trust him too they trust him too Senator Cash uh, Senator uh, Senator Cash you've got a minister on her, uh, a senator on her feet, Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. The point of order was relevance. It was a very specific question, and the minister has been going for 93 seconds now. It does require just a one-word answer, if you could provide it. Um, the minister is being the minister is being relevant. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Please continue, Minister Farrell. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yes, yes, yes. can I say to Senator? Yes, yes, thank you, uh, President. Um, can I say to Senator Chandler? Um, if, you want to, if you want to answer my questions, then there's no point um, you asking the questions to me. You might as well answer them yourself. But, um, but, 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 order. But, 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 look, look, um, look. Um, you've asked the same question to me that you asked to uh, Senator uh, Senator Gallagher Thank yesterday. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Chandler, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, yesterday in question time, the Minister for Finance also said our position on tax cuts hasn't changed, but we are in the position of having to repair a budget. Can the Prime Minister guarantee that his government's policy Order. in relation to stage three tax cuts will not change in the future? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Chandler, for your first supplementary question. Well, again, the, um, you've, got, you, you've got the answer because the finance minister, who's in charge of uh, this uh, area, um, answered that question. Answered the question um, yesterday. But look, can I try and put? Can I expand? You've, you've referred to. Um, the issues that uh, um, Senator Gallagher raised just to, yesterday. Can I expand um, on 
um, the financial mess that we discovered when we came to this country. And can I just can I just report on one 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 fact one fact that puts this into perspective? Um, when Labor lost their power in 2013, uh, our national debt was $300 billion. Uh, when, we came, when we came to power, when we came to power um, 12, almost 12 months ago, that figure had blown out to $1 Thank you, Minister. Trillion. The time for answering has expired. Senator Chandler, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, why can't you be honest with the Australian people and admit now that you Order. won't be implementing the stage three tax cuts? Order on my right, Minister Farrell. Thanks, sir. Thanks, um, thanks, sir, President. And I again thank uh, Senator Chandler for her uh, her question. Well, honesty, honesty. Hey? We're talking about honesty, honesty. Why didn't the former Prime Minister of this country tell us that he replaced five ministers of the uh, former government. Five, five, maybe even six. I think we've discovered it might even be six. And you, 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 you dare to talk about honesty. Now, what, what, what Prime Minister Albanese um, says, he does. So when he said he was going to put downward pressure, on, order, on. order, Senator Farrell, order, order on my left. Your leader is on his feet. Order, Senator Birmingham. President, I'm afraid Senator Farrell is misleading Senator the chamber Birmingham. because if the Prime Minister Senator says what Birmingham. he does, where are the $275 tax cuts? Senator Birmingham, thank you. Please continue, Minister Farrell. I, I reject that point of order. <coughs> um, he didn't even get to the point of order stage, Mr. <laughs> Please continue. Um, I'm not sure why they're all so happy today. What are you happy about? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Waters. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister. Responding to the latest IPCC synthesis report yesterday, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said no new coal oil or gas and no expansions of existing coal, oil or gas reserves. Why does Labor want to open the 116 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. And I thank, uh, uh, I thank uh, Senator Waters for her, uh, her question. Um, the Australian government, of course, uh, welcomes the IP CC report, and uh, I think even 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 uh, you, Senator uh, Waters, uh, would acknowledge that there's been a significant change in terms of the issues of uh, climate change, which, of course, the IPCC uh, were dealing with uh, in their um, uh, in their report uh, between our government and the former government, um, and in particular. And in particular, the greater commitments uh, that uh, we have made as a government uh, to addressing the issues of, uh, of climate change and starting the process of increasing the speed at which our economy is uh, decarbonised. Now, that unfortunately, it's not an easy thing to do. You can't snap your fingers like that and suddenly go from a fossil fuel supported economy to a renewable economy. You just, you just can't do it. You can't do it. And I, I wish you could. I wish, I, wish, I, wish, I wish you could do that uh, in, by uh, flicking my fingers, but, but we can't do it. So, so uh, this, government, this government is moving down uh, the, the path of decarbonisation, but we're doing it in a sensible way. We're doing it in a sensible way. Firstly, <clears throat> trying to bring the community with us, and I think we, we're doing that. We, we, we brought them with us. <clears throat> well, they voted for us at the last election, Senator McKim. They voted, they voted for us. They Order. voted for us. <clears throat> you don't like it. They voted for us as a government. They voted for our policies, not your policies. <clears throat> and they certainly didn't vote for your uh, policies. Minister Farrell, the time for answering has expired. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Uh, thanks, President. The the government has called for budget restraint. 
The UN Secretary General and the International Energy Agency have both called for cuts to public subsidies for fossil fuels, which incidentally would save your budget $11 billion every year. Will the government end fossil fuel subsidies to help tackle the economic and climate crises? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Farrell. Thank you, um, thank you uh, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, uh, Walters for her, uh, her question. Um, look, um, the issue of um, transition, which is what we're talking about here, transition from a fossil fuel economy uh, to a uh, renewable um, uh, economy uh, is not it's not an easy transition it's easy to say it's easy to talk about uh, e Senator Farrell please resume your seat Senator Waters thanks president I specifically asked about fossil fuel subsidies and when you're going to axe the 11 billion dollars a year you give in cheap uh, diesel and accelerated depreciation yep. to fossil fuel companies. Thank you, Senator Waters. I'll remind Senator Farrell of the question. So, Senator Farrell. Thank, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank, uh, thank Senator Waters for her uh, intervention there. Um, look, look. Um, if, as I was saying, if there was an easy way to solve this problem, like uh, simply uh, abolishing. Uh, uh, ab abolishing the sorts of. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. You help Senator Farrell. Uh, Senator, Senator Watt has already ruled this change Senator out being Birmingham. in the budget. Senator Bur Birmingham, please, that's not a point of order. Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, look, look. Um, um, yeah, yeah, look. Uh, thank you, I... Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Order. Order. Our Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thanks, President. <clears throat> will, will the Labor Party return the $960,000 it received in donations from the fossil fuel sector just in the last financial year so that you can start Senator making Watt. policy decisions based on science? Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Our Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, th thank you, uh, thank you, President. And uh, uh, the short answer is uh, no. We're not going to uh, return those uh, donations any more, any more, any more than you've uh, returned donations from companies that uh, donate to the uh, to the Greens, who uh, <coughs> who also have investments in uh, fossil uh, fuel. Um, and uh, I understand your your organisation has refused to uh, return those. Uh, nor, nor do you return um, you know, um, donations from companies uh, engaged in, uh, in, 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 in gambling. Um, so, but can I, say, can, I say, can I say this to you, Senator um, Waters? Minister Farrell, agree, please resume your... Agree, Minister Farrell, please. Senator Watt. Senator Watt, I have a senator on his feet. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, senator Shoebridge, resume your seat. Resume your seat. Senator Shoebridge. Order. If you rise to your feet during question time, it is to call a point of order, not to make a statement. You can make statements at other times in this place. Minister Farrell, please continue. Um. President, uh, obviously we touched a nerve uh, yeah. there, yeah. and uh, the Greens are embarrassed about their their donations. But can I can I say this to the Greens and to the coalition? Uh, we do need to reform the donation regime in this country. Thank you, Minister. And the time only for answering party. has expired. Uh, Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Skills and Training, Senator Watt. Um, the Albanese government has a clear agenda to create the jobs of the future by taking advantage of the transition to renewable energy and investing in skills and training. Um, how is the government's commitment to action on climate change supporting the jobs and skills of the future? Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Grogan, who, of course, has a very long history in supporting all of these issues, even before she arrived in this place. Right now, 
this parliament is faced with a very simple choice. For the first time in a decade, we can seize the opportunity to reduce emissions from Australia's big emitters, or we can squander that opportunity yet again. Reforms to the safeguard mechanism are crucial to meeting our legislated emissions reduction target, the target that most honourable senators voted for in this place last year. When this parliament voted for a 43 per cent emissions reductions target for our country, the very senators who argued for a higher target are now the ones who would have it be even lower. Without the changes that the safeguard mechanism involves, our nation is looking at a 35 per cent emissions reductions target by 2030, 8 per cent lower than what was legislated by this parliament last year. And those honourable senators who said the target should be higher now have a choice to make, because if they vote against these reforms, they are voting for a lower outcome than what was legislated just last year. Those senators would be voting against a 43 per cent emissions reduction target and against net zero by 2050. We all have the opportunity here to take 205 million tonnes of carbon out of the air by 2030, the equivalent of two-thirds of the cars on Australia's roads. We have the chance to drive change among the 215 biggest emitters in the country, who represent 28 per cent of Australia's overall emissions. Now, yesterday's IPCC report, which has been cited in here today, showed that this decade is the critical decade for action, the critical decade to make an urgent, rapid and far-reaching transformation across our economy, and that's exactly why all senators should vote for the changes we're proposing thank for the you, safeguards Senator mechanism. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. That was a wise advice that you've given there. Um, Given the jobs and skills of the future depend on industry and business having certainty and confidence, can the minister outline how a predictable trajectory for emissions reduction will give that certainty and confidence? Minister Watt. Thanks again, Senator Grogan. The government's safeguard mechanism reforms that all senators will have the opportunity to vote on in the next couple of weeks are the next step to ensure that Australian industry remains competitive in a decarbonising global economy while reducing their emissions. What this means for Australians is jobs, clean, green and renewable jobs of the future, jobs in green steel manufacturing, green hydrogen, offshore wind and other associated industries. If we get the policy settings right for business to decarbonise, we will achieve this ambition. And that's why the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Industry Group and the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry support these reforms, and 80 per cent of facilities are already covered by corporate net zero commitments. Interesting that the parties who say that they support big business aren't backing in those business groups on this point. Business knows that reducing emissions is essential to their long-term competitiveness in a global net zero economy, and that's why they're supporting the safeguards mechanism change. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, Senator Watt, are there any threats to delivering the skills, training and jobs of the future? Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Grogan. And unfortunately, there are a range of threats, and not always from the sources that you would expect. Uh, the truth is that Australia is starting way behind where we should, largely as a result of the Greens voting with the Liberals and Nationals against the CPRS in 2009, and I'd be pretty embarrassed about that too. And of course, it's also due to a decade of inaction from those on the other side. And now the Greens are faced with the same choice 14 years later. And I say to the Green senators, do you really want to find yourselves sitting next to Senator Rennick? Senator Antic, Senator Canavan, Senator Tanson, Senator Roberts, and all of those other people who say that climate change isn't real, do you really want to be sitting next to them when this comes to a vote in the next fortnight? Uh, or will you be on the right side of history? Will you listen to the appeals of groups like the Carbon Market Institute, the Investor Group on Climate Change, the Australian Conservation Foundation and the Climate Council, who all say that this Thank whole you, Senate Senator should Watt. back the safeguard mechanism? Your time has expired. Order. I remind you, Senator Watt, to please direct your comments and answers to the Chair. Senator Roberts. My question to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher, follows calls from concerned constituents and relates to Labor's bank deposits guarantee element of the financial claims scheme. Minister, can you assure constituents and assure the Senate 
that in the event of a banking failure, every cent in every Australian's bank accounts will be guaranteed under the Deposit Guarantee Scheme. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, I do welcome the opportunity to uh, talk to the Senate about the strength of our banking system, um, and because I think it is an important uh, issue to reassure Australians, uh, indeed, that we have a very strong, well-regulated, well-led, well-capitalised, uh, with good liquidity uh, banking system. Uh, I would also say, so I think that should provide reassurance um, to the Australian people about the system that we have in place. It's been strengthened considerably in the years since the GFC and think, since the Banking Royal Commission, uh, and it's a, obviously a, a vital uh, and important uh, sector for our, the overall functioning of our economy. I would also say that the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer uh, meet regularly and are getting updates regularly on the global uh, situation, the, what we've been seeing happening uh, overseas, about, and uh, including meeting with the regulators of our system uh, to get up-to-date advice. And well, oh, sorry, Minister Gallagher, Senator Roberts. Ask specifically for the minister to guarantee that to assure constituents that in the event of a banking failure, every cent in every Australian's bank accounts will be guaranteed. I'm not interested in overseas. just want uh, to know you, for every cent. Senator Roberts, I do believe the minister is being relevant to your question. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, President. And for, um, thank you, Senator Roberts. I, mean, the, I only briefly went overseas. I was giving that as additional reassurance. Um, the initial uh, part of my remarks, my answer was about the strength of the Australian banking system, where, which is where Australians have their deposits and have their money, uh, and I was providing that reassurance that Senator Roberts was seeking about the strength of the banking system uh, and uh, the fact that we are taking advice daily. In fact, the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer are getting briefings regularly about the situation overseas because that directly links to your question, which is uh, some of the concerns that we have seen in banks overseas. I mean, we are connected in a global world, and so we do keep an eye on that in order to keep an eye on what's happening in Australia. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. I note that twice the Minister has not assured people that every cent in every Australian's bank accounts will be guaranteed. So, Minister, what is the total figure for depositors' funds in Australia? And of that, what percentage does the Deposit Guarantee Scheme actually guarantee? Minister. Uh, thank you. On that, I don't have those details um, in front of mind uh, or actually in my um, papers, so I will come back to the Senator and the Senate with an update. If I can do that during question time, I will. But I would say that when, when we have faced challenges in the banking system in Australia, which we are not facing now, um, the government, um, and I would presume this would have been on either side of the political fence, would act quickly to respond to any concerns that we saw in the banking system, which goes to your question about guaranteeing deposits. Um, so, but we are not in that situation, and that is why my answer to your original question was about the strength of the banking system here and the fact that we are keeping close watch on what's happening internationally in case there are any impacts that come our way from it. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Since 2008, the Deposit Guarantee Scheme has been capped at $20 billion per bank and $80 billion total. Minister, do you have $80 billion sitting there ready to go? And if not, how much is immediately accessible to the scheme and how long will it take for the full guarantee amount to be available? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, in the event um, that we needed to respond, I can guarantee uh, that the government would move quickly to uh, ensure the stability and security of Australia's banking system. But that is not the situation we are in. Um, the regulators advise us uh, that the banks are well capitalised, with good liquidity, uh, they're well led, they're profitable. Um, they are engaged with regulators all the time, 
uh, and the government remains uh, absolutely aware to the issues overseas and engaged with all of those, uh, the banking system, the regulators and other stakeholders to ensure that remains the case. And if there was any concerns, the government would respond quickly. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cadell. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Earlier this week, the Prime Minister said it has been a good 10-month period because what we've been doing is going through fulfilling the election commitments we made at the election. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, families in New South Wales, including the parents of St Phillips College up above us, are facing double digit in energy costs. Where is the commitment to the $275 energy price card that you get? Uh, Senator Farrell. Order. Order. Sarah. Sarah, I'd be kept... Order. Order across the chamber. Or Senator Watt. Senator Gallagher. Order across the chamber. Minister Farrell. I'd, I'd stop talking, Sarah. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Um, Every time you How are you now, out, please? Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Watt, I've called you several times. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, President, and I uh, thank uh, Senator um, Cadell for his uh, question and welcome all of those the people up there uh, who uh, are taking an interest in uh, democracy. Um, uh, <laughs> they're not frightened of me. <laughs> even, even you're not frightened of me. <laughs> um, but getting back to the question at uh, hand, of course, um, uh, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister is deeply concerned about cost of living issues uh, that face uh, everyday, uh, everyday Australians. And um, what's he doing about it? Well, of course, he's uh, supported the uh, increase in the minimum wage uh, and a pay rise for aged care workers. <laughs> made childcare cheaper in this country, pushing down the price of uh, medicine, creating 180,000 uh, new fee-free fee -free, fee -free trade places to make up for all of those uh, <coughs> job shortages that uh, your policies uh, created, uh, delivering, delivering 20,000 new university, delivering 20,000 new university places establishing 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave. He convened a job uh, uh, and skills summit. He established a jobs and skills Australia. In fact, the question, the question you could almost ask is what, is, what is it that Prime Minister Albanese hasn't done to help the Australian people? He hasn't. And, and I, can, I, can, I can go on. I can um, go Minister on, Farrell, your time has expired. Senator Cadell, first supplementary. The same parents of these children are now facing an average of 9.2 per cent price rises in staples like bread, fruit, vegetables and dairy. After just 10 months, what specific relief has the government delivered for those New South Wales families struggling to buy those basics to put on the table to feed those children? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. Thank you, uh, Senator Cadell, for his uh, his question. Well, you obviously weren't listening to my previous answer because I listed I listed ten ten or more things ten or more things that the Albanese government is doing to put downward pressure on uh, uh, on the cost of living. Uh, nobody understand with a background. With a background like his, nobody understands cost of living pressures more than our, uh, than our Prime Minister. Yes, yeah, seriously. Yep, yeah, seriously. He understands, he, understands, he understands the cost of living pressures on ordinary Australians. But what could you have done? What could you have done in this what could you have done in these ten months that might have helped the parents of these children push down something like electricity prices? You could have voted. You could have voted. You could have voted for the cap on gas prices. Thank you, that Minister push... Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cadell, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Under your government, New South Wales families have also experienced 10 interest rate rises, meaning most families are now paying an extra 1,400 per month in uh, interest. 
No $275 energy bill cut, at least 9.2 per cent in the price of staples and 10 interest rate rises. Is that this government's idea of a good 10 months for Australia? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Goodell, for his uh, question. It's interesting you're focusing all of your questions about New South Wales. Well, maybe that's because there's uh, an election on in uh, New South Wales this coming Saturday, and and your Minister your, Farrell, your candidates, Minister your Farrell, candidates, Minister your Farrell, candidates who Minister represent Farrell, your please resume your seat. Order on my left, Senator Cash. I had to call the minister about four times because it was so noisy in here he couldn't hear. Minister Farrell, please continue. Please continue. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the direction to come and uh, stand, in which I'm doing right now. Um, and plus, I was getting a little bit of advice from my colleagues uh, behind me. So, well, they're all. They, I can't think of everything, um, President. You know. I've, uh, I need, I need. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson. I want relevance to the question because I want to hear an answer. I don't want to hear waffling on about the New Thank South you. Wales state election, Thank which you, has got Senator nothing Hanson. to do with the question. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Order. There are a lot of interjections across the chamber, including direct interjections to the minister. Please continue, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. Well, I'll go through them. I'll go through them. Cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, uh, 180,000 fee-free uh, TAFE places, 20,000 new university uh, places, uh, 10 days paid family and domestic leave. We convened. We convened a jobs and skills summit. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the time for answering has expired. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians. A recent FOI exposed a secret, dirty secret report to the National Indigenous Australians Agency that concluded traditional owners in the Beetaloo Basin won't benefit economically, socially or culturally from fracking their country. It also stated that the traditional owners are at a clear disadvantage when negotiating with gas giants. How do you justify fucking, sorry, fracking the Beetaloo after these revelations? Uh, thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. President, I thank Senator Thorpe for the question. I understand Senator Thorpe's question relates to the report commissioned uh, by the NIAA on Beedaloo, which was done under the previous government. Um, the NIAA commissioned the blueprint for Indigenous benefits realisation in the Beedaloo region report in 2020, um, done by external consultants who prepared the report. It doesn't constitute legal advice or represent uh, the government's uh, position. Um, we absolutely acknowledge First Nations people's uh, connection to country is central to their spiritual, cultural, physical and economic well-being, and that native title recognises First Nations people's pre-existing land and water rights and interests. Um, we also recognise the importance of thorough consultation with First Nations people with the cultural authority to speak for country in line with the principles of free, prior and informed consent. Uh, land councils have those statutory responsibilities under law to consult with traditional owners and native title holders regarding activities on their traditional land. And we are also taking action to ensure the voices of First Nations people are heard and listened to, of course, as we are um, through the uh, voice uh, to parliament. In specifically, um, in uh, relation to the Beedaloo Basin. Um, the Northern Land Council has uh, statutory responsibilities under law to consult the traditional owners and native title holders regarding the activities on their uh, traditional land, um, and we are uh, and committed uh, to working with them. Um, and this includes um, support via the Australian government and those ongoing uh, discussions. 
Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Thorpe, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Given the clear disadvantage of traditional owners when negotiating with these gas, dirty gas giants and their almost unanimous opposition to fracking, no free prior informed consent, I beg your pardon, will you withhold any fracking in the Beedaloo until and unless genuine consent has been obtained? If you have free prior informed consent, show us. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, I think um, the issues of the Beedaloo Basin uh, really fall under the responsibilities of the Northern Territory Government um, through the arrangements uh, they have and through the responsibilities they have at, you know, via the, the Territory laws. Um, but you know, I think the Federal Government remains open to working with any community on any issue um, where there are concerns and if, those, um, in, if the standard processes that have been put in place uh, aren't working, then of course um, the government would stand ready and able and willing to engage with them on any issue that they seek to raise. Senator O'Neill. Oh, sec sorry, Senator Thorpe. <laughs> Second supplementary. Thanks, President. Thanks, Minister, for your answers. So what this comes down to is whether the government stands with First Nations people or with gas, gas companies that fund your party. So whose side are you on? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, Senator Thorpe, you've asked your question. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, the Commonwealth has specific responsibilities in relation to approvals for particular projects. Um, I know this one has been controversial. Um, and I, I would just urge those that do have concerns, and if Senator Thorpe has, has uh, people that um, you know, don't feel that they are being spoken for or are able to have their voice heard, then I would encourage her to encourage them to come forward and to also, you know, the Commonwealth remains committed to be working in partnership with um, land councils, First Nations communities and the Northern Territory government uh, to sort through any of the concerns that may exist. But um, ultimately, um, you know, the Commonwealth has um, specific and set responsibilities in this area. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Farrell. What are the government's plans to build a strong and growing manufacturing industry in Australia? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and I thank uh, Senator O'Neill for her very uh, <coughs> deep interest in this area and, uh, of course, her interest in ensuring uh, a, uh, a new Labor government in New South Wales uh, this coming weekend. Um, Australia uh, must be a country that uh, makes things, uh, uh, President. Uh, the $115 billion National Reconstruction Fund is a key platform to support, diversify and transform Australian industry. The NRF will target projects and investments that help Australia capture new, high-value uh, market opportunities. This will help our businesses grow and succeed, both in the economy of today and of tomorrow. The NRF will provide finance to grow advanced manufacturing and support uh, businesses to innovate and to move up the technological ladder. But it also supports our national sovereign capability. In the early days of the pandemic, people were shocked that Australia couldn't make enough masks or PPEs for our population. It showed the vulnerability of being the last link in the global supply chain. But the National Reconstruction Fund is about more than helping us uh, produce things at short notice in times of crisis. It's about building a more resilient and more diversified economy with more jobs in regional Australia. Um, at the very heart uh, of the National Reconstruction Fund is an ironclad belief in the capability of Australian know-how. The Albanese government is committed to diversifying our industrial base and the National Reconstruction Fund is the key to unlocking Australia's potential. And I call on all senators in this chamber to support the National Reconstruction Fund. Uh, Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Thank you, Senator Farrell. My second question to you today is why is a vibrant Australian manufacturing industry important? 
And what challenges does the Australian ministry face? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator O'Neill again for her, uh, her question. Uh, manu manufacturing uh, does matter because it cre creates uh, sustainable, secure, well-paying jobs. Jobs from uh, coders, welders, uh, designers, researchers, process workers and everything in between. Jobs in regional Australia and our outer suburbs. For too long, the Australian manufacturing industry has been the subject to the threat of political games by the opposition. The NRF will be independently run on a commercial basis with decisions taken in the national interest, not marginal seat politics. No colour coded uh, spreadsheets, he spreadsheets here. Uh, again, I call on all senators in the chamber to realise this opportunity to support Australian manufacturing and support the National Reconstruction Fund. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you, Senator Farrell, and I appreciate your good wishes for the people of New South Wales on the weekend. What are the international market opportunities that will help our industry grow, and what threats are there to that bright future? Minister Farrell. <coughs> Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and again thank uh, Senator O'Neill <coughs> for her question. Um, we are supporting manufacturing through the NRF, but also by creating new international market opportunities for high-quality Australian products. The Albanese Labor government is opening up new and diversified markets for Australian goods in countries like India. On my recent visit to India with the Prime Minister, we were accompanied by the President of Australian-based hearing, um, hearing device manufacturer Cochlear. Uh, they are working hard to expand their distribution networks in India, so more Indian people have access to this incredible Australian innovation, which creates more jobs both here and at home. For too long, our exports have been concentrated in a single market. Under our trade diversification plan, more Australian-made products uh, will, be will be enjoyed around the world, including in India. Thank you, Minister Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. I refer to the confronting revelations exposed through a recent Four Corners expose on Perth Mint, which unearthed alleged gold doping, money laundering and a complete breakdown of compliance and reporting requirements. I also note Austrac's investigation into the Perth Mint, the London Bullion Market incident review process that's underway and revelations around the US state model commodity code coming to light. As important and importantly, comments from the, your treasurer who described these revelations as, and I quote, incredibly concerning and very troubling. Noting the West Australian opposition is calling for a royal commission, what is the response of the, royal, of the Albanese government? I thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister Gallagher. The one where there's more nats than libs. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator Brockman for the question. Matters relating to the Perth Mint's operations are a matter for the Perth Mint and the Western Australian Government as its owner. Uh, the federal government. Well, hang on a second, Order. Senator Scar. I know you like to answer my questions before I get the opportunity. Hang on. Put your seatbelt on for a second. Um, the federal government takes compliance matters uh, very seriously, and Austrac ordered audit of the Gold Corporation, which trades as the Perth Mint, uh, assessing compliance with anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism finances laws, is due to report in May 2023. They are the responsibilities of the federal government. Um, they are in place. Um, that is the position of uh, the Albanese government. This is largely a matter. Uh, calls for a, a royal commission by the opposition in uh, WA uh, should be matters that the WA parliament deals with and, and the suitable response should be there. But we are satisfied with the work that is uh, underway uh, via Austrac um, doing uh, their assessment, which is due to report to uh, the government or due to release its report uh, in May 2023. How are you? Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Brockman, first supplementary. The Perth Mint is a $21.8 billion business trading with customers in more than 130 countries. 
with a conflicted WA Premier refusing to instigate a royal commission through fear of what will be exposed, will the Albanese government take action, engage with Premier McGowan over the need for a royal commission into Goldcorp and Perth Mint to retain the confidence of our trading partners and the Australian public? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister Gallagher. Well, I don't agree with the sort of implied insinuations in um, in uh, Senator Brockman's uh, question. Uh, the uh, the West. Well, it was a pretty long preamble. It was a long preamble there. Um, the Western uh, Australian Premier, uh, Mark, uh, Mr. McGowan, has made it clear. Uh, that the government is aware of these matters and that there is presently an audit underway and that the Mint is also investing heavily in anti-criminal behaviour and compliance measures. As to whether there's a political dispute or that um, the opposition in WA is running, um, that you are running by proxy through this chamber, Senator Brockman, I think that's largely a matter for the Western Australian Parliament. And if you want to have a say in that, maybe you should stand over there and have a, have a say in the Parliament. They've, they, uh, they might need a couple of extra bodies over there, considering. But that is why, I mean, the, on the on the matter of substance, that is why there is an Austrac investigation underway due to report Thank in May. Minister, it is serious. Has it's been expired. handled. Senator Brockman, second supplementary. I will remind the minister that the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act is a Commonwealth Act. Has the government? had any conversations with the Premier to urge him Order. to take action over this important issue Order. regarding the reputation of Australia in the international marketplace? And if the Premier won't act, will the Albanese government? Uh, thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister Gallagher. Well, based on the information or the answers I've given you to the previous two questions, both governments are acting. There is an audit underway. There's an assessment underway by Austrac, which is appropriate, and a report to be provided in May. I mean, that I don't know how much faster you can be in assessing the concerns that have been raised, the serious concerns uh, that have been raised around the Perth Mint. Um, and Austrac's um, have, uh, with their responsibilities, um, to assist compliance with anti-money laundering and counter-terror terrorism financing laws, which is uh, something I did respond to in the first question, that is their responsibility. So the Commonwealth, through its agencies, is responding to the areas that it has responsibility for, and the report will be provided in May, which is two months away. And I think that is pretty swift uh, response. As to conversations between, uh, between governments, uh, I have no doubt Thank there have you, been Minister, some. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator uh, Watt. Over the last week, remote communities in my home state um, and of uh, your home state of Queensland have expanded, devastating, have had devastating flooding. Can the Minister please advise what the Albanese government is doing uh, to support these communities? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thanks again, Senator Sheldon, for your ongoing work uh, when it comes to disaster recovery. On Friday last week, I travelled to Normanton and Burketown, uh, Gulf of Carpentaria communities, and was able to meet with locals and see the devastating flooding that those communities have experienced firsthand. I want to thank and acknowledge the member for Kennedy, Mr Bob Catter, for his advocacy and for joining me as we toured some of the areas of highest impact. And I also thank Senator Green for her ongoing advocacy for these communities, both to the federal and state government. I also want to thank the mayors of Carpentaria and Berkshires, Jack Bowden and Ernie Camp, as well as other members of the Berkshire Council who gave me a tour of some of the damage in the community. In addition, I'll be meeting Mr Camp and the mayor of Dumaji Council, Mr Jason Ned, while they're in Canberra uh, this week. On the same day that I visited these communities, we made the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment available to residents in the Queensland local government areas of Bullia, Burke and Mount Isa. This is the one-off payment of $1,000 per eligible adult and $400 per eligible child who have suffered a significant loss as a result of the floods, including a severely damaged or destroyed home or a serious injury. Don't worry, Senator Macdonald, we'll come to you. Uh, we also activated the disaster recovery allowance for the same areas and extended it to the local government areas of Carpentaria, Cloncurry, Dumaji and Mornington. And this is in recognition of the fact that this event has caused significant disruption to people's livelihoods. 
The Disaster Recovery Allowance provides up to 13 weeks of federal income support to assist people who experience a loss of income as a direct result of a major disaster, such as being by, by being cut off from being able to get to their workplace or from the business that they operate. And there are many such people in our Gulf communities right now. I can inform the House that as of midnight on Monday this week, 1,300 people have received nearly $1 million in, in payments since claims opened just on Friday last week, and that of course followed other support that began within 24 hours of the flood peak. Thank you, Senator Watt. The time for answering has expired. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for those actions in uh, this very important time. What is the Albanese government doing to ensure that Australians are better prepared for the more intense and more frequent natural disasters? will be Minister. facing due to climate change. Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, Senator Sheldon. Uh, and as we have now demonstrated on numerous occasions in all parts of this country, no matter what state or territory you live in, no matter whether you live in a safe or a marginal seat, and no matter who, you, who represents you in parliament, when a disaster strikes somewhere in Australia, the Albanese government will stand by your side. That's why we always move quickly to offer immediate assistance, whether that be financial or logistical, in, in conjunction with state and territory governments, as well as with the ADF. Uh, we don't pick fights with state governments, and they continue to do that even in opposition. We just get on with the job, cooperating with people, regardless of their political colour, uh, to deliver the support that's needed. And in addition to that immediate help, the Albanese Labor government is also working proactively to fix the failure to prepare that we witnessed over the past decade. And I have noticed Senator Macdonald complaining uh, last night and in the media at the, about the exposure that remote communities have to disasters. What a shame she didn't do a single thing about that in any of the years she was in government. We've got on with the job. We're creating a disaster you, ready Minister, fund and we're keeping communities resilient. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Minister, are there any threats to the Albanese government's work to better prepare Australians for natural disasters? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, the fact is that for nearly a decade, the coalition failed to make our country more resilient to the impacts of natural disasters, mainly because they didn't believe in climate change. Not only did they not spend a single dollar of their emergency response fund, which was designed to specifically invest in disaster resilience, they also failed to guarantee the ongoing funding of our national, national disaster agencies beyond the July 1 this year. Uh, this is another one of these temporary measures that uh, Senator Gallagher is having to work her way through in the budget, funding that was running out on 30 June this year, and that included the natural disaster management agencies of the federal government. If the coalition had won the election, our national natural disaster agencies would have run out of money on the 30th of June this year. And as things currently stand, the new national, natural, national emergency management agency requires an injection of new funding simply to continue operating. These are the kind of economic vandals these people were Thank putting you, communities Minister, at risk, the and we're going to change it. Has expired, Minister Farrell. After that uh, terrific, uh, after that terrific answer, uh, President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Uh, Senator Brock. Something with you uh, before you potentially leave the chair, uh, Madam President. Um, there was a matter raised by Senator Thorpe earlier about a senator taking photographs. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask that that is that you address that directly and report back to the chamber? Uh, seek assurance that those photographs have been deleted. Thank it you. has been addressed, Senator Brockman, and um, uh, the Senator, Senator Pratt has been asked to uh, delete the photos from her phone. I was going to speak to Senator Thorpe privately because she's not in the chamber, but I'm happy to also make that information available to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Can senators please depart the chamber if that's of their choosing before I give the call? Senator McGrath. Uh, th thank you, Deputy President. I, I rise to, to take note of answers by Senator Farrell to the questions asked by Senator Cadell, um, my good friend from, from New South Wales. And what is interesting is the, the, the gap in reality between 
the government benches and what is happening out in the real world, because there is a massive gap in reality. When you have a Prime Minister who says, Mr Deputy President, it has been a good 10-month period because we've been what we've been doing is going through, fulfilling the commitments that we've made at the election. Well, first of all, they've been busy breaking their promises, and secondly of all, they do not understand the cost of living crisis that is impacting upon all Australians, and in particular in a particular, my colleague Senator Cadell asked about the price of electricity and what is happening to, to the government's commitment to cut people's power bills. Not by a dollar, not by a thousand dollars, but by $275. Now, before the last election, Prime Minister Albanese and the Labor Party promised 97 times. They promised 97 times that they would cut your power bills. So for the good people who are listening at home, the Labor Party promised to you they would cut your power bills by $275. They didn't do it once. It wasn't just like a brain burp that you know, sometimes politicians misspeak. It happened 97 times. And what happens is they get into power and it's just like, a bit like a Homer Simpson wandering through the staff room and Mr Burns is sort of you know, a nuclear reactor going, oh, it wasn't, wasn't me, boss. They just don't know, they've got no idea of how to use the levers of the economy to help the Australian people. Because what is happening under this government is that power prices are actually going up. They're not going to go down by $275, they're actually going to go up by more than that. Thanks, thanks to Labor. Thanks to Labor, who, have, who are very good at talking. And there's some fine wordsmiths on the Labor side. But when you look at the words and you study them, you realise they're very good at making promises, but they're particularly poor. They're particularly poor at delivering on those promises, but they are brilliant. They are gold medal winless medalists at breaking promises. So I'm going to go through some of the promises that, that the Labor government said they would deliver. Now, this is going to hurt people because I know most Australians think that, that politicians don't break promises. They think that politicians are honest, altruistic people. And guess what? On this side of the chamber, we are. We are honest, altruistic. We believe in what is good for Australia. But sadly, sadly, Deputy President, on the other side of the chamber, and I, I know you've, you've warned me before about saying rude things, so I won't, and I'm, I'm on best behaviour at the moment, is I, and I'm dis, I disappoint my fans who are listening, um, those who send the nice um, emails and the capital letters, um, is, that, is that the Labor Party are very, very good at breaking promises. So first of all, they said they would cut your power bills by $275. Well, broke. The thing is, they promised that 97 times. Well, guess what? They've broken it 97 times. Uh, they said there'd be cheaper mortgages. Well, guess what? Since Labor have been in power, mortgages keep going up and up and up. So, thanks, Labor. Thanks, Labor, for sending, making my mortgage payments go higher. They said there'd be no changes to super. Well, come in, spinner. We've got another broken promise from Labor. They are now going after your money in your super accounts. So first of all, they're putting up your power bills. Then they're putting up your mortgages. And heaven help you if, you've got a, if, you've got, if you're renting somewhere. First of all, it's so hard to find a place to rent. And secondly, rent is going through the roof because of Labor's policies. But then they're going after your retirement savings. And they promised lower inflation. I mean, this is just so dispiriting, Mr Deputy President, that a, that a modern political party would just make such, such false promises before an election and then, then get into power and skip around this building like fat kids in a lolly shop, stealing all the lollies and then not deliver on their promises because they've forgotten who sent them here. They think the trade union sent them here. They think in this place, you look over there, the good people there, well, most of them, um, is that it's like a retirement home for union barons. This is what it is. Like the UK have got the House of Lords, here we've got the House of Union Barons. And they, they serve two terms as, as the Secretary of the Paperclip Union of, of South Australia, and then suddenly they get elevated to the Senate. So it's almost like their super or their pension policy. It's like, you look, you've done 10 years working for this union, and now your retirement package, um, you know, here we go. Going to, be, going to be a senator for 12 years. Now, the other promise, they said they're not going to touch your franking credits. Well, guess what? They're coming after those because you can never trust a fat kid in a lolly shop like you can never trust the Labor Party when it comes to keeping their promises. Senator Sheldon. 
besides some offensive comments from the people, those um, from the Senator before, but I just want to just say that it's a very um, interesting sort of approach to say honest and altruistic. They voted against a $230 average saving to household power bills. That's what they did. That's their honesty. And you know what? They are altruistic because they voted against and did not support a dollar an hour wage increase. That's altruistic. That's altruistic when you're a conservative on that side of the chamber. They turned around and made sure that they voted against multi employer bargaining, which delivered productivity, which delivered better wages, which produced an opportunity for fair competition amongst companies. They voted against that. They voted against a secure jobs plan because they're altruistic. If that's altruistic, that's what is wrong in this country, and that's why you were voted out. Because they don't understand the importance of making sure that we make a difference in this country on so many fronts, that we build a better country that involves everybody. Now, when we go back to the energy price uh, program from those opposite, they didn't have one because they didn't have one for 22, year, 22 occasions. They had no policy. We have been dumped with a no energy policy from those opposite. But we have had them vote against an energy policy that decreases and holds back average uh, prices for power bills. They are the ones that turned around and said that they and hid the fact that there was a 20 per cent increase in the default electricity offer before the election. These are the altruistic. These are the honest. Well, what a load of rubbish. It is disappointing to have those sorts of false allegations made with this, parliament, with this Senate. Because the reality is, when you don't vote for, to hold back prices at $230 on average per year, when you turn around and lie about and misrepresent the 20 per cent increase in default electricity offer, and then you go on. In nine years, 22, year, 22 energy policies that didn't float, that didn't fly, that didn't be, wasn't progressed. And yet they have the hide to come in here and say that about honesty and altruisticness. Well, altruistic is about actually that. It's about actually making a difference what the plans are that we've put forward. They ignored, ignored 12 warnings from the ACCC in our email about domestic gas supply. They ignored them. And this is the people that have the hide to come in here and say to the Australian people, we have not only do they not have an answer, they don't, haven't progressed an answer and they vote against answers because that's the program that they have. And under them, we also saw a four megawatt in dispatchable power leave with only one, meg, uh, one gil, uh, gigawatt uh, coming back in. The Snowy 2.0 2 is running months late. And of course, we've announced, and quite rightly announced, our energy price relief plan. We've also announced our intent with this May budget to make some incredibly important changes to make sure that there's relief and support for the Australian community that are doing it tough. And doing it tougher because these people that are not altruistic, that are not honest, have turned around and left this country in a hole of over a trillion dollars worth of debt. Whilst they've been running off giving billions of dollars to Qantas without any obligations to the Australian public, tens of millions of dollars to Harvey Norman without any obligations but whilst their profits went up during COVID, put us in a trillion dollars of debt because of their mismanagement. We've been turning around and looking at areas like the Housing Australia Future Fund. They don't want to have 30,000 new social and affordable housing in this country in the next five years. They're voting against it. They said they're opposed to it. They're, how can you be less altruistic and less honest when you say you are honest? Because the honesty is about the fact they are delivering, uh, in their view and their policies and their suggestions, they're no, no coalition, they're no coalition. Their approach to what honesty is is to make sure that every Australian pays the price for their lack of thought, their lack of preparation in the last decade and the lack of capacity to turn around and support good policies that make a difference to the Australian public. And of course, those good policies go to the cheaper medicine under Medicare, and a very important initiative, 30 per cent less for prescription medicines on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. That goes to 180,000 free TAFE and vocational education and training places. That's about building our productivity and our capacity up within our community. That's about $50 million TAFE technology fund all again about improving capacity within the economy and within a productivity. That's smart spending, not wasted spending. That's about making sure we make a difference. So we see these people opposed consistently 
consistently to making sure cost of living pressures are either improved by better and opportunities for better wages, or alternatively, by having policies that make a difference to energy prices. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And, uh, I also rise to speak on the motion to take note of the answer provided by the minister to the question asked by my good friend and colleague, Senator Cadell. And that was a question about the cost of living. And that's an issue that uh, I'm hearing a lot about in my home state of Tasmania. Uh, families are struggling. Co prices are going up, up and up. And they feel like they don't have the means to address those price increases. And it seems like uh, every single day at the moment we are coming into this chamber as uh, the opposition and we are asking questions on behalf of those families in our own states about the cost of living, the skyrocketing cost of living. And every time we ask these questions, and they are important questions that the Australian people want answers to, we find ourselves in a situation where the government brushes those questions off and will try to talk about anything else. If this government was something you bought in a store, uh, Mr Deputy President, well, I think you'd be taking it back to the store and asking for a refund. And then you would take that refund and you'd put that refund towards paying for your power bill, which we know has gone through the roof since this government came to power. Or your grocery bill, which we also know has gone through the roof. Or your mortgage payment, again, going through the roof. Because the marketing material for this government was very clear. What was written on the box is not the product that the Australians have actually got now. If only I could call the ACCC. They said that if you voted for them, then your cost of living would go down. They said that if you voted for them, then your power bill, each individual's power bill, would go down by $275. They made that commitment 97 times in the lead up to the election last year. They made it over and over and over again. Fast forward 10 months, and not only have they broken that promise, but they are actually asking for credit for bills going up by more than 10 per cent. They want credit for breaking an election promise. Yet they don't want to accept any of the blame for the skyrocketing cost of living that Australians are now facing. Indeed, every time we come into this chamber and we have conversations about the rising cost of living and we ask questions about that $275 commitment that was made 97 times during the election campaign, all we get from the government is avoiding the question at best and talking about the previous government at worst because they don't have anything else that they know how to talk about. They also promised that they wouldn't increase taxes on Australians, and yet they've broken that promise as well. And in the lead up to the next budget in May, it certainly seems, as my colleague Senator McGrath says, that they are laying the groundwork to break that particular promise not to increase taxes on Australians again and again and again. This is a Labor government which said whatever it thought people wanted to hear to get their vote back in May 2022. But in fact, this government does the opposite. Under Labor, the cost of living has gone way up when they said it would go way down. And we know that the Treasurer and the Finance Minister are looking around to see whose pockets they can dip into to plug the holes in the budget coming up in May. Sure, they promised before the election that they wouldn't do any of that. Uh, but, of course, that promise is out the window like the vast majority of the ones that they did make. We saw that when the Treasurer got on national TV and refused to even rule out uh, capital gains taxes on the family home. Admittedly, the Prime Minister did come and clean up that little slip of the tongue by Treasurer Chalmers, but, like I say, you can't trust this government when they've broken so many promises already. Who's to say that we won't be having another conversation about capital gains tax come the budget in May. It was pretty obvious uh, when the Treasurer wouldn't even rule out something so obvious that the Labor government are cooking up a long list of possible tax hits on Australians and the Treasurer at that point didn't want to rule anything in or out. But there will be something else. There is always something else when it comes to this Labor government. They promise the world to everyone, quickly run out of money to pay for all of those promises and when they've run out of money, they will come after yours. 
The Labor promise to cut your power bill by $275 is broken. Their promise to reduce the cost of living is broken. Their promise not to increase taxes on Australians, broken already, and looking for even more ways to break it. Senator White. The government understands that the rising cost of living is hurting Australians. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer know that it's uh, that it is hitting a lot of Australians hard. The government knows this too, and I know that. Uh, and the Australian people, I think, understand that we didn't create these challenges, but they elected us to take responsibility for addressing them. The, the Albanese government uh, has a three-point plan for addressing the inflation and cost of living challenge in the economy. It's about relief, repair and restraint. Responsible cost, you know, and how that is broken down is it's responsible cost of living relief, which is we, and policies like our cheaper childcare policy, cheaper medicines, direct energy bill relief. We're also replying, re repairing the supply side constraints. So we've introduced fee-free TAFE, cleaner and cheaper energy, the National Reconstruction Fund, which hopefully will, will, will go through the parliament, and also we've got a plan for more affordable housing. We've also got responsible budget with spending restrained, as I said, and we want to return almost all the revenue upgrades to the bottom line and, and keep spending essentially flat over the next four years to not add to inflation. So there's a plan. There's absolutely a plan. But let's think about how this plan is, has, is, has been has tried to be thwarted by those opposite. Let's talk about the electricity prices. You know, this is, as the question uh, to the minister was about electricity prices, but let's look about this. Look, look closely. It seems to me that those opposite have a bit of amnesia about what they actually did last year. Maybe they can't remember what they did uh, uh, during the Morrison years. They don't remember that uh, the, the they don't want to remember it. Absolutely. And luckily uh, for us, the Australian people saw it and remembered it at the ballot box almost a year ago. They remembered it. But let's, it seems like there's a bit of amnesia and recreation of history. Let's remember last year that the Albanese government legislated to cap wholesale energy prices on coal and gas. We did that in large part because we had to deal with a wasted decade of failed energy policies from the coalition. We did that in part to respond to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which had put enormous pressure on glo global energy markets. We recalled the parliament, do you remember that, uh, before Christmas to deal with this situation because we prioritised energy prices and we prioritised what we thought uh, was a difficult situation. This government took it very, very seriously. So we legislated the energy price relief plan. Do we remember that? Now, just three months later, we're already hearing from the Australian energy regulator that, it, that had we not acted when we did, energy prices would be 40 to 50 per cent more expensive than they are now. Without the government intervention, Australian uh, families would be paying more for electricity. Without the government intervention, uh, Australian businesses would have paid extra. Um, because we acted, Hundreds of dollars of additional increase have been avoided for households, over a thousand, and thousands of dollars have been saved by people. But wait a minute, let's remember, where was the coalition when this, when this emergency was on? When given the chance to support cheaper power prices, the co co coalition said what? They didn't say yes, they said no. When asked if they would support Australian households and business by stabilising the, engine, the energy market, the Liberal and National Party said, said no. The coalition over there voted against cheaper energy prices and voted against support for Australians feeling the sting of inflation. So if the coalition had been in charge last year, Australians would be paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars more for electricity than they currently are. Why? Because the Albanese government had a plan and we implemented that plan, but with no help from the coalition, no help whatsoever. And are we surprised about that? No, because during their time in office of nine years, they had 20 failed energy policies over that decade. There was inaction, 20, yes, it was 20, a decade of inaction in action that put us in, the me in this mess. They were in charge. They, co they could have had an a energy policy, but no, 20 bit the dust. So uh, 
I'm here to remind you of what you did, which was nothing, and what, what the Albanese government have done, which is put it, have a plan, put it into action, and it is delivering for Australians every day of the week. And of that, I am incredibly proud. Senator Bragg. Oh. Well, thank you very much, Deputy President. And the reason that we're having this debate today is because when you are the government for vested interests, you don't have any time to deal with the major challenges that are facing the Australian people. You only have time to work through the narrow set of vested interests that are being set out for you by your great supporters, benefactors and donors. And what we've seen since the election has been a effort to work through the laundry list of grievances from the unions and the super funds and the class action law firms. And of course, we've seen uh, the effort to put in place uh, multi-employer bargaining or patent bargaining. We've seen the efforts to, to line the coffers of the super funds. We've seen the efforts to remove transparency from the workers so they can't see how much money the super funds are sending off to the unions. And of course, we've seen just in uh, recent weeks this hilarious idea of a housing fund where we want the super funds to be given more money so they can buy more houses, but of course the people themselves are banned from buying houses with their own money. So this is the uh, bizarre world of the government for vested interests, where if you're a union or a super fund you get the rolled gold treatment, but if you're a punter you can forget about it. Now, the consequence of the narrow focus here is the government hasn't been able to deal with inflation. Now, we've seen 10 interest rate rises since the election, and for a mortgage holder with a three-quarter of a million dollar mortgage, uh, you're now paying uh, at least one and a half thousand dollars additionally each month. Uh, now, that is a, that, now, that has been massively fuelled by Canberra. Uh, the government is, is fuelling inflation. Uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has warned that the use of off-balance sheet items has fuelled inflation and is a risk to our budget and our economy. Now, inflation is at a 33-year high. Canberra and the Labor Party is massively fuelling inflation because Canberra and the Labor Party are addicted to massive spending projects uh, off-balance sheet but also through the budget itself. So you've seen $45 billion in off-balance sheet items, the reconstruction slash fund for union, the housing fund, the rewiring fund, but you've also got uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars in new expenditure locked into the budget with the bills that have passed the parliament since the election. So you've got a government that is heavily invested in enriching its favourite vested interests through policy proposals, but you've also got a government that is committed to fuelling inflation, perhaps not deliberately, but because it can't seem to restrain expenditure. And it's prepared to ignore the IMF and the independent observers here, and it continues to bring bills before the parliament. I mean, there are now bills before the parliament to establish the union slash fund, the reconstruction fund, uh, and the housing fund, and we've just con considered the housing fund uh, at the Economics Committee this week and will be reporting later today or tomorrow, uh, this is another $10 billion. Uh, and again, going against the warnings of the IMF, the government has decided that it will fuel inflation. And then, of course, we hear the Labor Party people come into the Senate and read out their pieces of paper and read their talking points about how bad the Morrison government was and the other governments. And sure, there were, there were many bad things in the past. But the reality is that the pandemic was managed as well as it could have been from an economic viewpoint. Now, the Labor opposition wanted to pay people to get vaccinations. The Labor opposition wanted to pay JobKeeper to foreigners and wanted to pay JobKeeper to universities. And uh, we, will we won't forget that because Effectively, because effectively, effectively, the idea of paying JobKeeper to extending it and then paying it to foreigners 
uh, was a ridiculous proposition at the time and it was ruled uh, out of order. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Labor would say, oh, you know, you, you switched off too, too quickly. Uh, but, uh, you know, Dr Lee or Mr Lee or Minister Lee, as he now is, has gone through and done a forensic examination of all this sort of stuff and we'll come back to this in the next episode. Thanks very much. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, sorry, I'll just put the question. Those the questions say aye, against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from the Honourable Don Farrell to the question asked by my colleague, uh, Senator Larissa Waters, in relation to the IPCC report. This week, Australia and the world received its last warning from the IPCC about the, about the dangerous pathway that we're on, the climate danger we're on with current settings uh, if we don't keep coal and gas in the ground. But of course it wasn't just the IPCC that blew the whistle on the Labor government's flawed policies for dealing with climate. Because we've seen some 54 climate organisations and environment organisations deliver an open letter to the, to the Albanese government this week calling on them to prevent any further new coal and gas developments in Australia. And that's what the IPCC has said is absolutely needed. And those organisations in the open letter included 350 Australia, Friends of the Earth Australia, GetUp, Greenpeace, Original Power, Oxfam Australia, the Wilderness Society, Environmental Justice Australia, Comms Declare, Common Grace, Move Beyond Coal, Co-Power, Kaha, Lock the Gate, Environment Victoria, Conservation South Australia, Conservation Council South Australia, the Queensland Conservation Council, the Environment Centre NT, the Australia Institute, the Edmund Rice Centre, uh, the uh, um, WA Climate Leaders, the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland, the Environment Council of Central Queensland, even the Labor Environment Action Network in the Northern Territory, Environs Kimberley, uh, Wodonga Albury Watch towards Climate Health, Climate Action Newcastle, Darabin Climate Action, Zero Emissions Noosa, Environment Victoria Southeastern Volunteers, Surfers for Climate, listen to the surfers, Australian Marine Conservation Society, Paracan, Climate Action Canberra, um, Cairns and Far North Environment Centre, Circa, uh, the Green Institute, the Australian Rainforest Conservation Society, Climate Justice Union, C4CE, the Bayside Climate Crisis Action Group, Shirecan, People Climate Assembly, Climate Emergency Action, Glenera Climate uh, Action, uh, Glenera Emergency Climate Action Network, Community Power Agency, Climate Emergency Australia, Lighter Footprints, Psychology for a Safe Australia, ARC, the Australian Parents for Climate Action, Green Music Australia, Sedemia, Vote Earth Now. 54 organisations signed the letter demanding climate action, demanding that the Albanese government change its policies and keep coal and gas in the ground. Will the Albanese government listen? Senator Thorpe, you're, on a different, you're going to take note of a different, your own question? Okay, so I'll put the question. Those of the questions say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe, you're seeking to take note of. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of Minister Gallagher's uh, answers in relation to Beetaloo. You have the call. Thank you. Um, the Beetaloo is apparently responsible. Uh, the responsibility of Beetaloo comes under the Territory. Um, so we want to know: Will you rule out giving Commonwealth funds for Middle Arm? Uh, there's no accountability and transparency in um, fracking or any kind of uh, destructive behaviour to our Mother Earth. There is no free prior and informed consent. Labor does talk about consultation over consultation over consultation. We've also uh, heard from a Labor minister that consultation does not mean consent. Uh, it may be something that Labor need to learn a little bit more about. Uh, you can't just rock up and talk to people and, and think that that is consenting to a project. Uh, the unconscionable conduct, not only from the coalition when they are in power, but now the Labor government are still acting unconscionably by uh, only dealing with land councils who don't always represent traditional owners. Uh, traditional owners are being um, bullied, they're being locked out of meetings, they don't get to, to even have a say about any destructive uh, behaviours on their country. It goes through a peak body that is funded by the Commonwealth Government 
uh, and we see how that turns. You know, the, the last NLC um, CEO is now a uh, Labor uh, member in the other place, uh, and so whoever allows for this consent to happen. Uh, so that these mining companies can destroy our lands and waters, it seems that uh, their reward is a seat uh, as a politician for the Labor government. Put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Chisholm. Oh. Notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the National Health Amendment Bill 2023, allowing it to be considered during this period of sittings. I also table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in hindsight. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Chisholm. Senator Hanson-Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I give notice that on the 9th of May this year, I shall move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to establish an inquiry into the Murdoch media and media diversity in Australia and for related purposes. The short title of this bill will be Murdoch Media Inquiry. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Chisholm. I move that general business order of the day number 30 be considered on Thursday, 23 March 2023, at the time for private senators' bills. So the question is the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A postponement notification has been lodged as follows. General business notice of motion 185 in the name of Senator Hanson Young for today to the 27th of March. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 12 on today's order of business. I shall now. Uh, um I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, I shall now proceed to formal business. And I'll move to uh, government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, Senator Chisholm. Thanks. I ask that government business notice of motion number one, proposing a reference to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion and I table a statement in relation to the work. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice of motion number 183. And it looks as if there's an amendment to that, is there? Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move my amendment to this motion as circulated. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Shoebridge. Um, I, move, I move the amendment. Yeah, sorry, I'm jumping ahead, Senator Dunning. I oh, call on you to move, thank move you. the motion. I... My apologies. <laughs> I'm very awake. Um... With great energy, you'll move it. I will use all the energy, energy, energy. I have to ask that general business notice of motion number 183 be taken as a formal motion, and then we'll. Yeah, we'll take it that you've moved the amendment, Senator Shubridge. Yes, and the motion has been moved. So the the question is that the um, amendment to general business notice of motion number 183 is moved by Senator Shubridge be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against. No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. So I'll now move the amended motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 183 standing in the name of Senator Cash and amended by uh, agreement uh, in the name of Senator Shoebridge be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to um, general business notice of motion number 185, standing in the name of that's postponed, beg your pardon, looking at the wrong list here. Um, we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 188, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 188 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 188, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion one, number 190, standing in the name of Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 190, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Dunningham. Thank you, President. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Productivity Commission Act 1998 and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Productivity Commission Act 1998 and for related purposes. By Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, President. I uh, move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. As leave granted, leave is granted, Senator Dunningham. And table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. I now move to uh, general business, uh, and there's two there together, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith, 191 and 192. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, President. Uh, in regards to 192, I'd like to withdraw that. OK, I think that's fine, Senator Smith. Um, so we're just dealing with 191. So if you'd like to go ahead with one, uh, 191, that Thank would be Thank you, good. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 191 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Smith. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 191, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business, notice of motion number 174, standing in the name of Senator Lambie. I ask that general business notice of motion number 174, number 174 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 174, standing in the name of Senator Lambie, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 174, standing in the name of Senator Lambie, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and I'm at, oh, beg your pardon, Senator Lambie, did you want to appoint a teller? I was just going to put Senator McKim, but <laughs> Senator McKim for the eyes and Senator Askew for the nose. Order. There being 17 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I advise senators there may be further divisions. Um, we will now move to general business notice of motion number 189, standing in the name of Senator Cash. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that general business notice of motion number 189 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice. Oh, beg your pardon, sorry, Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. I leave is granted for one minute, Senator Chisholm. As the opposition knows, the government is working through a cabinet process in relation to the voice referendum, including in relation to the wording for the proposed constitution, constitutional alteration. The Referendum Working Group is providing the Cabinet with advice as part of that process, so is the Solicitor-General. Consistent with the long-standing practice followed by all governments, cabinet should, not be able to be cabinet should be able to be conducted in secrecy so as to preserve the freedom of deliberation of that body. It would harm the public interest to undermine the confidentiality of the Cabinet process by producing the doc documents sought by Senator Cash or by producing legal advice. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 189, standing in the name of Senator Cash, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the So the question is that general business notice of motion number 189, standing in the name of Senator Cash, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is negated. We we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 193, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Birmingham, I ask that general business notice of motion number 193 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 193, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I'm going to put it again. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 193, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 193, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 41 ayes and 18 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. And we're now moving to a deferred vote from yesterday. I remind senators that yesterday a division was deferred relating to a motion moved by Senator Roberts proposing a reference to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee. I understand it suits the convenience of the Senate to hold that division now. Uh, I put the question, and it was business of the Senate number one from yesterday, in the name of Senator Roberts. Those, of, those who agree with that motion say aye. Those against say no. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, deferred vote be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 29 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, that concludes formal business. Do you want the oh the, and the thing? If, you could, if senators can please leave uh, the chamber quietly, and we're. I just want to inform the Senate that Senator Mackenzie has withdrawn the matter of public importance, which she has proposed for today. A proposal from Senator Barrett has been received, understanding Order 75, as follows: Is is the proposal supported? It is supported. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with informal. Sorry. Just for the clarity for the uh, chamber, there were more than four people standing in their correct seats. So, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. And I call Senator Babette. Thank you. Now, Australia, we are facing an energy crisis, an energy crisis that threatens to cripple industry, impoverish families, and if it is not urgently addressed, we will see, we will see our standard of living decrease and we will see our people suffer. The fact that we find ourselves in this position beggars belief. As a nation, we have a clear competitive advantage abundant and easily accessible coal and gas. I keep talking about it. We should have the cheapest energy in the world, but we don't. Instead, we have manufacturers and businesses closing and collapsing all across our nation under the weight of energy bills. In fact, the cost of electricity is going to rise by about 30 per cent this year in my home state of Victoria. Now, the Smithfield Oh, sorry, the snack brands factory in Smithfield reported some months ago that their gas bill had gone from $3 million a year to $9 million a year. And you know where that factory is located? In Energy Minister Chris Bowen's electorate. Who needs enemies when you've got mates like Minister Bowen as your local member? You don't need enemies. Now, our current energy crisis is not the fault of some far-off distant war like some in this place have tried to allege on more than one occasion. Perhaps if that was the case, 
it would be easier to understand. Instead, our crisis is self-inflicted, and the hurt that we are currently experiencing can easily be avoided. The Albanese government and the Greens are determined to shut down all coal and gas. The government, of course, well, I hope anyway, of course, hopes to do this without destroying business, impoverishing families and endangering our national security. This is a pipe dream. This is a pie in the sky plan. It is simply not possible to achieve net zero using solar panels, wind farms and batteries, not while at the same time maintaining our standard of living. If the government is determined to put an end to safe, effective, cheap, reliable and abundant coal and gas and maintain our nation, then the government must embrace nuclear energy. We have no other option. If we do not, we will suffer exactly the same as some other nations across the world are suffering right now. If the government is determined that Australians must not use our abundant coal and gas, then let's use our abundant uranium instead. But here's the irony. Just like we're exporting our coal and gas, we're also exporting our uranium to other countries where they are using it. They are benefiting, it, benefiting from it and we're not. We are the third largest exporter of uranium in the world. And that's just crazy that we're not taking advantage of it. Now, for those who say they are worried that catastrophic climate change is about to end the earth because of CO2, which is just plant food, well, nuclear power, there's your answer. What about the expense? Well, yes, it might cost a little bit up front, but it's an investment which secures our power needs for the long term. Renewables, however, are not renewable at all. The only thing renewable about renewables is the expense. Every 15 or so years, roughly, you've got to bury your solar panels in the ground, in landfill, buy new ones. Every 10 years, you bury the batteries, buy new ones. Every 20 years, you bury the wind turbines, you buy new ones. Where do you buy them from? Mostly China. The CCP controls most of the supply chain when it comes to renewables. Nuclear, when, com when compared to that possible future, is in fact not expensive. It is better for our environment, especially when you can, when you can compare the cost of this against rebuilding our national infrastructure to accommodate renewables. With nuclear, you can build a plant in the existing footprint where the coal-powered fire plant is right now, and you can keep the infrastructure as it is. No changes. How good is that? Now, instead of acres of solar panels and hillsides dotted with wind turbines, we can have a facility roughly the size of an IKEA powering millions of homes. We need to stop cowering in fear at the thought of the word nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is the answer for the 21st century. There is no option. If we do not look at nuclear energy, our only other alternative is poverty. Thank you. Senator Canavan, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, I'm uh, honoured to, to stand and support uh, uh, this matter of public importance and congratulate Senator Babette for bringing it forward. Uh, the acquisition of uh, five nuclear, uh, or up to five nuclear submarines has removed any logical reason for Australia to continue to ban uh, nuclear energy in this country. Sometimes we hear uh, that we, we can't go down the path of nuclear energy because we have nowhere to store the waste. Well, we are going to now have a high-level waste facility because of the acquisition of nuclear submarines. That, will, that hurdle will have already been jumped. That is done. We sometimes hear uh, that it, it could potentially be too unsafe and there could be some sort of accident or issue. Well, we're going to have up to five nuclear reactors sailing around our coastline uh, 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 underwater just next to major population centres docked in our harbours. Uh, no safety concerns about that. It would be completely illog illogical to legalise the sailing of nuclear submarines right around our coastline while we continue to having those same facilities onshore and on land in this country. Because we do have a massive energy deficit right now, our energy regulators are warning that we are 8,000 megawatts short of reliable power over the next decade. And that can't be filled by solar and wind. That is of dispatchable capacity that we need. Now, these nuclear subs, maybe we could have an innovative solution. We could dock them in Sydney Harbour, you go get a big extension cord from Bunnings, and, re and that's 1,000 megawatts of that 8,000 could, could come in uh, into and provide electricity. But a more logical option would be actually to build an advanced 
uh, nuclear reactor in this country, as, as happens in every settled continent in this world except for Australia. It is us and the penguins now who don't have nuclear energy in the world. Every other continent, every other settled continent, settled continent in the world relies on nuclear energy. It has done for decades safely. It is about time now we get over this ridiculous uh, paranoia uh, and legalise nuclear energy so Australians can get cheaper power. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many amazing people who make up our one Queensland community, I note that nuclear is the answer to humanity's energy needs. The only question is whether we embrace nuclear technology now and set Australians up for a prosperous future, or we keep promoting unreliable, expensive wind and solar that will end as landfill every 12 to 15 years. Australia can never achieve a sustainable energy grid if every new wind and solar power unit we build dies so quickly. The energy required to break down a solar panel dwarfs its profit. Even the ABC admits that solar panel waste will outstrip all other e-waste by 2035. Nuclear energy is a single build project with a small ongoing fuel supply whose waste output is tiny, completely contained and capable of being used as fuel for reactors. In other words, truly renewable and, low, and zero uh, output of carbon dioxide. Not that carbon dioxide is a problem, it's, uh, it's uh, plant, food, plant food. It's a proudly Australian-centric energy system that doesn't require dependence on long supply lines from communist China. Nuclear will keep the lights on in Australia independent of the weather. The European Union has embraced nuclear as the gold standard in green technology. They've tried solar panels, they've tried wind turbines. They don't work! So why are parties in this place insisting on subjecting everyday Australians to electricity cost and reliability nightmares? Why are you ignoring the science? A one gigawatt nuclear plant is equivalent to 430 wind turbines or three million solar panels demolished and replaced six times in the life of one new generation nuclear plant with a life of 100 years. This is why the United Nations and World Economic Forum's crooks and disciples are trying to make nuclear a dirty word because they know they can't compete on any environmental or economic argument. Nuclear energy is freedom. Nuclear energy is national security. Nuclear energy is the answer to maintaining everyday Australians' living standards. I thank Senator Bivet for, his, Senator, for the motion. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Uh, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy has laid out the government's energy and emissions reduction plan and has clearly articulated, very clearly articulated, that nuclear will not be part of Australia's energy mix. Nuclear is the most expensive form of energy. So there's a good reason, right? It is the most expensive form of energy which has been reaffirmed over and over again by various people. The CSIRO, in their 2021-22 GenCos report, the report calls nuclear energy commercially immature and high cost. The report um, also affirms that the cheapest form of energy are mixed renewables such as wind and solar. So I would be delighted to introduce Senator Babette to, uh, to some scientists, maybe some economists, um, and that might help inform him in terms of his pathway on pushing for nuclear energy. Senator Babette's friends on the opposition benches, they've been unsuccessful in prosecuting this nuclear argument in nine years under their own government. They can't get their own people to support it. Their own people won't back it. So I'm not quite sure where that's going for those in the opposition. The Senators, uh, I remind you that uh, other speakers have been heard in silence, so I remind people to give the same courtesy to Senator Grogan. So nine years of a Liberal National Government, during which we had 22 stop-start energy policies and three gigawatts of dispatchable energy exit the grid without being replaced. I hardly think that those opposite are in a position to be providing uh, a way forward on our energy issue. And then, of course, when we introduced our energy price relief package, you wouldn't support it. A package to reduce the effect on people's hip pocket to take down the prices. We've seen prices skyrocket and they started under the opposition government. And in our attempts to bring it down, you guys all vote against it. 
Because you would rather you would rather you. invest in very very expensive nuclear energy. Yeah, I'd love a medal. Thank you, Senator Canavan. If you could just make me one, that'd be great. Senator Grogan. I fear Senator that the facts Grogan. on nuclear energy Senator generation. Grogan. I remind you and Senator Canavan that uh, it is disorderly to interject and your comment should go through the chair. Pay the same courtesy as was displayed to you, Senator Canavan. My apologies. But I do fear that the facts on nuclear energy generation are somewhat lost on my colleagues across the room. The reports, I know um, there are a number of you who have cast aspersions on the CSIRO in the past. and. So rather than just to keep quoting them, I will add a bit more um, detail from other sources that you may prefer. So particularly the nuclear energy industry, yeah, that's right, the nuclear energy industry admits that, it, that cost is a prohibitive factor compared to renewable energy. The World Nuclear Industry Status Report in 2020, not the CSIRO, if you're paying attention, but the World Nuclear Industry Status Report stated, and I'll quote it to you, the cost of renewables continue to fall due to incremental manufacturing and installation improvements, while nuclear, despite over half a century of industrial experience, continues to see costs rising. Now that same report goes on to say that the levelised cost of energy analysis by the US bank Lazard shows that between 2009 and 2021, utility-scale solar costs came down 90 per cent, wind came down 72 per cent, and new nuclear costs increased by 36 per cent. So, sure, I get it that maybe you don't like some scientists, you don't like some organisations because you think they believe in climate change or various other things that you can't get behind. But this is the industry itself. This is the report on the industry, the industry itself, telling you exactly what the costs look like. So you enjoy that at your peril and ignore it at the countries, I believe. We have now seen a decade of denial and delay as far as our energy sector is concerned. And now the transition to renewable energy is going to have to boost. We know this. The level of investment has been low, but it is growing. Since we legislated the 43 per cent target, investment has increased, and it will continue to increase Thank you, for Senator, renewable your energy. Your time has expired. Senator B. Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The proposal for nuclear power for Australia is wrong on many counts. Small modular nuclear power, reaction, uh, power generation is too expensive. It's not operating commercially. It's a distraction from what we have to really get on with, which is a very fast move to renewables. We senators in this place have a responsibility to consider realistic proposals to advance citizens' interests, not run impractical, risky, uncommercial proposals up the flagpole on behalf of, in this case, nuclear industry spruikers. Last time I looked, only two small modular reactors were in operation on the planet, one in China, one in Russia, and in both cases the cost blowouts have been huge. Many other such next-generation nuclear reactors have been cancelled as people have worked out that renewables are the cheaper, reliable way forward. But I want to especially focus on what Minister Canavan, Mr Canavan, Senator Canavan has raised, and that's the question of nuclear waste disposal. The truth is that finding a permanent solution for the safe storage of nuclear waste arising from power generation remains a big, dangerous problem everywhere, a very expensive problem. The UK has 70 years of waste, 260,000 tonnes of it, from its nuclear power plants in unsafe, temporary storage. It's a major problem for that country and its citizens. And the US nuclear industry has been plagued, similarly, by dangerous leaks and failures. No long-term solution exists in the US, not for waste from power generation or from nuclear-powered submarines. South Australians have had some experience with these issues. In 2016, our citizens had a very close look at a proposal that we take the world's nuclear power waste and store it. We were promised an income stream of $51 billion. That's a lot of money, but South Australians said no. 
The world's largest citizens' jury of 350 South Australian citizens read the fine print. They saw the proposal was for temporary storage for above ground for more than a century. They said no to the false promise of huge incomes, but especially to the safety risks and the fact that those who spruik nuclear power never offer a long-term waste solution that is safe and that will last the 100,000 years that it's needed. And First Nations people across South Australia in particular said no. They remember Maralinga. So this is a national challenge of long standing. Since Australia first started producing nuclear waste 70 years ago, five successive governments have tried and failed to find a suitable place for permanent storage of our relatively small quantities of low level and intermediate level waste. Low waste arising from medical uses must be stored safely for 300 years and it's nowhere near as dangerous as intermediate waste. But no community in this country has agreed to take and store that waste. Intermediate level waste arising from research at Lucas Heights must be safely stored for 10,000 years. The previous government began a process towards that storage at Kimber and it's been bitterly disputed at every step of the way since, posed by farmers, by community members, by First Nations people, the Bungala people, who are currently in the federal court fighting the current government, which is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to, um, uh, to oppose the voice of the Bungala people. In the case of AUKUS, the fuel from decommissioned submarines is nuclear weapons grade and it requires military scale security and must be stored not safely not for 300 years, not for 10,000, but for 100,000 years. And neither the UK or the US have been able to find permanent storage solutions for their own submarine waste. So given that successive governments have continuously failed to manage much less dangerous radioactive waste in Australia, a government would find it very difficult in this country to find a solution to dispose of nuclear waste or AUKUS submarine waste. And traditional owners of the future in particular should have a say and a veto about any such proposal. So a long list of reasons why the $368 billion spend proposed for AUKUS is a terrible idea, but it's not least because the government has no viable solution to, to, to care for the weapons-grade nuclear waste and keep us safe. The Australian public is right to be sceptical and concerned about waste disposal in relation to AUKUS. There is no plan, and the same argument applies to any ill-considered expensive adventurism around nuclear power. Our children need practical, affordable action on renewable energy that cuts carbon pollution, not pies in the sky that generate toxic waste for which there are no safe solutions. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Van. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 1,430 terawatt hours per year is the amount of electricity needed to be able to power Australia to be a green energy superpower, something that we all aspire for this country to be. That is an awful lot of energy. If we are going to power that through green energy, we have to consider all options to do so, nuclear power being exactly one of those. There is no way that we can get to net zero emissions, or even better, zero emissions, without nuclear baseload power. So all clean energy options need to be on the table. So that includes nuclear, pumped hydro, geothermal, all sorts of other ways. This fixation on renewables only is a fallacy that's being sold to the Australian public, and they're being lied to because there is no way that we can get to where we need to be and be a hydrogen superpower simply on renewables. The variable and intermittent nature of those generation techniques are not doable. Now, my learned friend over here talked about unproven technologies. And the other fallacy that uh, the Australian people are sold on is that batteries can solve this. There is no battery that can provide the deep storage of energy that will be needed to firm up intermittent power from wind and solar sufficiently enough to power in industries as they are now, let alone as we electrify industries to reduce emissions down to the lowest possible part we can. So stop telling lies, 
Nuclear power is a proven technology and it will play a part in our energy mix in the future. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Green. Uh, thank you. I'm very happy to stand and speak on this um, matter of public importance today um, because it gives me an opportunity to talk about a number of matters, particularly our government's record on delivering on um, our renewable energy plan to make this country a renewable energy superpower. But it particularly gives me an opportunity to talk about two things. Um, the, the the debate that we are having about nuclear energy in this place and why we are having that debate and who is pushing that debate in this chamber. Uh, because we know um, that there's a reason that the Liberal National Party is pushing nuclear as a, um, a form of energy, and it's because they're um, distracting from their bitter disunity and denialism on climate change and the fact that they don't want to see this country become a renewable energy superpower. Uh, I am proud that one of the first actions of our government was legislating our emissions reductions targets. Our government has a clear commitment to renewable energy. We know that firmed renewables are the cheapest form of energy and they are getting cheaper every single day. If we hadn't lost 10 years of investment, we would be far beyond where we are now, but we are making good headway in catching up we are working with states and territories to deliver renewable energy projects across the country. It's why we're delivering our Powering Australia plan, but we're also choosing to invest in renewables through the National Reconstruction Fund, an incredibly important piece of legislation that those opposite have dealt themselves out of. We want to see our regions become renewable energy powerhouses, and I speak of the region that I come from in far north Queensland when I talk about um, the wind, solar and uh, pumped hydro opportunities that will create jobs in regional Queensland. But it's important to understand where we've come from over the past 10 years and why we are now having this debate. Why we're, why we're at a point where we have a genuine discussion about renewable energy not being the way forward. And it's because the LNP's record on energy is abysmal. They vetoed in government, the Liberal National Party vetoed renewable energy projects that would have created hundreds of jobs in regional Queensland. In Queensland, the Liberal National Party tried to sell off the state's power assets so that we couldn't have public in, um, energy in public hands. Now, when it came to um, promising what um, power they would generate, they did um, promise years and years ago to build a coal-fired power station in North Queensland. That never happened because there is, no, um, there is nothing from this former government when it comes to delivering on the promises they made. Heading up into the election, they hid key information about electricity prices from Australia ahead of the election. And now in opposition, they choose to vote against energy bill relief in this chamber. They talk about reducing power prices, but they're not prepared to vote for cheaper power bills. We know what the experts say about nuclear energy. It's expensive, it is slow, it is the hardest to deliver when it comes to forms of power. Now that isn't members on this side of the chamber saying that. That's the CSIRO. They've done these reports time and time again and found that nuclear energy would be far, far away the most expensive form of energy in Australia. That is the experts telling us the way forward when it comes to nuclear energy. We're facing an energy crisis right now in this uh, country and in this world, and um, it is a matter of um, deep concern that a party of government is pushing a form of energy that would not have a plan that would take decades to establish. But why is the Liberal National Party talking about nuclear energy? Well, it's purely because, purely because they are completely disunified when it comes to their beliefs about climate change and renewable energy itself. They don't believe in renewable energy. They don't believe in climate change. They don't believe on doing anything about it. Now, the Liberal National Party can choose to generate a debate about nuclear energy, but they are using it as a distraction from the fact that they continue to drift further and further to the extreme far right on issues like this and others that we have seen play out in the national debate this week. But the Australian public know 
that the former government did nothing on energy, the proposal that they are putting forward around nuclear is uncosted, won't be delivered and won't deliver the jobs that regional Queenslanders deserve. And I urge this Thank chamber you, to push Senator back Green. on this debate. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I cannot believe that we are actually here talking about nuclear power. Nuclear power makes no sense on so many fronts. It is a dangerous undertaking and can never be fully accident-free. As we have seen with Fukushima and Chernobyl, this is simply not a risk we can take for anybody living now or in the future. My people have known for many thousands of years that this poison, uranium, needs to stay in the ground and never be touched. It causes sickness and death. There is a lot of talk about next generation nuclear re reactors, but their concept, even if they were somehow magically safe, the technology does currently not exist to scale. So it is not even an option until some time in the future anyway. And even economists agree that nuclear is financially not, I repeat, not viable. Investment in nuclear energy would also slow the decarbonisation of our economy and would actually increase electricity costs, which you all are always so concerned about. Last but not least, we have absolutely no idea how to safely manage high-level nuclear waste for tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Nobody knows this, probably because it's actually not possible to make it safe for such a long time and communicate with generations in thousands of years. The, pro the proposition of nuclear energy is dangerous, dangerous eco economically, dangerous for our clean energy journey, dangerous for humanity. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. In the last 30 years, nuclear energy has come a long way. The Greens like to remind us of the Chernobyl disaster, but the fact is nuclear technology has advanced tremendously since 1986. Nuclear energy in Australia has great potential to contribute to the global movement towards low emission technologies, and this is widely recognised by experts. Now, putting aside your personal views on the net zero debate, we're certainly not going to achieve it with only wind, turbines and solar panels. The entire world looks to us confused. They don't understand why we have a moratorium in place on nuclear energy. Uh, all we know is we're now working towards gaining nuclear submarine capabilities, so why not nuclear energy? In the United States, nuclear constitutes 20 per cent of the energy mix there, and there is bipartisan agreement in Congress about the importance of nuclear energy to help the US achieve its climate ambitions, its energy security and its sovereignty. President Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act has a heavy emphasis on the important role that it will play in the US. Now, I quote directly from the Office of Nuclear Energy's website, which says, Momentum is building for the US nuclear energy and the investment and tax incentives included in the IRA guarantee a commitment to nuclear energy that will continue well throughout the nation's journey to net zero. We must get our heads out of the sand and seriously look at lifting the moratorium. Now, I'm not even saying that we should necessarily build a nuclear power plant. We should just lift the moratorium. This way, we'll allow industry to explore the opportunities and for universities, importantly, to commence the important work of skilling up our workforce that will be critical for any future nuclear industry here in Australia. We're still having the same discussion here today that we were having when I was born. And the rest of the world is, frankly, leaving us behind. Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, Senator Thorpe, did you... I wanted to make, uh, seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Uh, well, I might just. What I might just is finish this, and then I'll cu come to you. So the time for discussion has expired. I will now move to Senator Thorpe, um, who wishes to make a one-minute statement. Um, and leave has been agreed. So Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, yesterday, while talking to a MPI, a matter of public importance, I was ordered to remove a prop 
the message stick I brought into the chamber with engravings for lives lost through deaths in custody, 441 lives. I'd like to state to this chamber that a message stick is not a prop. It is a means of communication for my people. It is no different to the pieces of paper, the mobile phones, the iPads, etc., that everyone is allowed to carry in here. I'd like to point out that the move was disrespectful to my people and culture and undermines cultural safety in this place. I will therefore approach the President and seek to find a way forward to ensure the practices in this place are respectful to First Nations people. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Senator Thorpe. I will now proceed to the consideration of documents. Documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. If no one wishes to talk to any of those documents, I will uh, now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports. Uh, Senator, oh, Senator Polly. Yes, um, I present two reports of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement as listed at item 16 of today's orders of business, together with accompanying uh, documents. And I move that the Senate take note of the reports. And I will first like to speak uh, to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement uh, to speak on the committee's uh, report examining the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission annual reports 2020 to 21 and 21 to 22. The committee has a statutory duty to monitor and review the performance of the ACIC by examining each of its annual reports. The committee is pleased to report that the ACIC performed satisfactory in 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022, achieving significant outcomes despite the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. The committee heard from the ACIC officials that the volume and tempo of the agency's work remained during high during both reporting years. The ACIC achieved a range of positive operational results by focusing on serious and organised crime and its networks that caused the greatest harm to Australia. In partnership with other law enforcement agencies, the ACIC's criminal intelligence efforts disrupted 107 criminal entities across the two reporting periods. The ACIC continues to make important contributions to operational activities such as Operation Ironside, which was led by the Australian Federal Police and involved the management and access of a dedicated encrypted communications platform to target criminal criminal syndicates and led to hundreds of search warrants and arrests across the globe. Despite external demands on the National Police Checking Service, which impacted the agency's ability to meet its timelessness benchmarks for standard and urgent police checks, the ACIC processed more than 6.7 million checks in 2021-22, 18.3% more than its four-year average, a notable achievement. The ACIC did not meet one of its performance criteria relating to National Police Checking Service during both reporting periods. However, the committee acknowledges that the ACIC has adopted several mitigating strategies to improve its performance, including working closely with its police partners. The committee will review the effects of these mitigating strategies in 2022-23. The ACIC redeveloped stakeholder surveys now target <coughs> partners who are better placed to comment on the quality of the agency services. The committee is pleased that in 2021-22, survey participants reflected positively on the AC ICIC, noting that the ACIC's national policing information system were of value to their work. The ACIC's insights and research on drug consumption and law enforcement 
drug seizures were of particular interest to the committee, as it is currently holding an inquiry into Australia's illicit drug problem, focusing on the challenges and opportunities for law enforcement in this area. The committee commends the National Waterways Drug Monitoring Program, which provides valuable insights into drug consumption trends across Australia and identify identifies new sources of threat. Lastly, the committee thanks ACIC executives and the dedicated staff of the ACIC for their efforts and achievements in protecting Australia from serious criminal threats in 2021 and 21-22. The committee also extends its thanks to Mr Michael Palin, who led the ACIC and the Australian Institute of Criminology from November 2017 to November 2022. The committee thanks Mr Palin for his dedication to disrupting criminal networks over this extensive career and helping to make Australia safer by positioning the ACIC to meet the challenges of a complex and continually evolving global organised crime environment. I thank you. I'd also, Mr um, Acting Deputy um, President, I want to rise to, to speak on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Law Enforcement uh, Committee's report examining the Australian Federal Police annual reports for 2021-21-22. One of the committee's key roles is to provide oversight of the Australian Federal Police by examining each of the AFP's annual reports. This role recognises that agencies which have been granted strong cohesive powers, co such as the AFP, should be subject to additional oversight. Like all Commonwealth agencies, one of the challenges facing the Australian Federal Police in recent years is the COVID-19 pandemic. As people began to spend more time online, the AFP responded by ramping up its efforts to combat online child exploitation. This included releasing a podcast called Closing the Net to raise community awareness around the serious risks children can now face online. This was a long-term covert investigation involving collaboration with the United States Federal Bureau of Investigations. Prosecutions arising from the operations are ongoing, but as of June 2022, there had been 774 search warrants executed in Australia, 383 offenders charged and seizures of 6,339 kilograms of drugs, $55.6 million in cash, 69 firearms and 78 weapons. I commend the Australian Federal Police for continuing to perform well in the service of the Australian community. I also wish to thank the AFP officers who gave evidence to the committee, as well as my fellow committee members for their contribution to both of these committees' um, reports in the way we scrutinised uh, their work. And I thank them and I commend to this chamber these reports that will be um, of great interest, I'm sure, to all my colleagues. But I seek um, leave uh, to continue my remarks. Um, I think le leave is granted. Uh, Minister. Um, Acting Deputy President, I present the government's response to the report of the Select Committee on the Future of Work and the report of the Education and Employment Legislation Committee on the provisions of the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022. In accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the documents incorporated in Hansard. Uh, leaves, leaves granted. Uh, Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On behalf of my dear friend and colleague, Senator Dean Smith, I present Scrutiny Digest 3 of 2023 of the Standing Committee oh. for the Scrutiny of Bills. Um, Senator, Scar, well, Senator, Senator Scar, I'll come back to you. Sorry. Senator Pocock, sorry I missed you. Yeah. I wanted to offer some comments on the reports okay. um, that have just been tabled and um, uh, welcome their uh, content um, and the um, material that they present, which is very relevant to many matters before our parliament. Um, it is a somewhat disappointing that a report on the future of work has to wait five years to be uh, tabled, the response to that report. Um, so it's a long time to, to spend without dealing with matters which really remain and certainly were five years ago very important. 
Um, I say that as someone who's recently chaired a, a similar select committee which looked at issues of work and care, uh, a report which I hope does not have to linger on the shelf and wait five years for a response from the government. But I would make the point that there are a range of additional materials now before the parliament in the form of that select committee on work and care and other matters which are very relevant to legislation we will be looking at over the coming course of the rest of the year. These reports point five year to, some, uh, to the, the existence of labour shortages um, five years ago and of the need to change the way in which we regulate and support workers. There is clear evidence in more recent times that our labour participation rates in Australia can be increased by improvements in our paid parental leave scheme, increasing um, the uh, uh, participation of people in work through better childcare and cheaper childcare. Um, and a range of measures that countries use which are referred to in these reports, and clear evidence in them of the need to take action, particularly in relation to security of employment. Um, it is very uh, uh, clear that we have too many casual workers, especially in our care sectors, many of them on casual terms, uh, unaware of their potential hours next week, um, and uh, unable to predict their working time or necessarily get the support they need for the care to get to work. So um, I think there are many important issues raised in these reports which require a legislative and a policy response which subsequent reports have also referred to and which I hope will lead to positive action to make a difference for working uh, carers, men and women and for their families into the future. Thank you. Do you seek leave to continue your remarks? You don't. Okay. Okay, so rightio, brutal. Um, so the questions we, we, we uh, take note, uh, those of the opinion say aye, those against the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Senator Scar. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, on behalf of my dear friend and colleague, Senator Dean Smith, Chair of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, I present Scrutiny Digest 3 of 2023 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, and I move that the Senate take note of the report, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you. The, the, the question is the Senate take note. Those of the opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Pratt. On behalf of the Chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, that is Senator Billick, I present the report of the committee on its examination of the annual report of the Integrity Commissioner for 21-22 together with accompanying documents, and I seek leave to incorporate the Chair's tabling speech into Hansard. Uh, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I seek to comment on the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission annual reports for 2020, 2021 and 2021-22. We must comment... Uh, comment um, what, just to assist the chamber, and I'm, I'm sure leave will be granted, um, hopefully. That can you just seek leave to? I to seek leave with to this? do that. Because I think we. I think okay, you don't need to seek leave then. Okay, keep speaking. Ignore me. <laughs> we must commend the Australian Institute of Criminology for high quality, impartial, and factually statistic and factual statistical report, reports and especially commend their statistical reports on Indigenous deaths in custody. If we want solutions to our country's problems, we have to deal with facts, hard data. With deaths in custody, the data shows there's no sudden or worsening crisis. The rate of deaths in custody has been steady for 20 years, at around half its 1990s peak, early 90s peak. These are und undisputable data from the Australian Institute of Criminology, the government agency tasked especially with monitoring deaths in custody. Adjusted for population, non-Indigenous prisoners were twice as likely to die in prison than Indigenous. Yes, you heard that right. Non-Indigenous prisoners are twice as likely to die in prison than are Indigenous prisoners. Due to the small numbers, deaths in police custody fluctuate from year to year. The data on Indigenous deaths in police custody per Indigenous population has drastically reduced since the 1990s and has remained steady at this far lower rate for nearly 20 years, two decades. The real crisis is of male deaths in prison. On a population-adjusted basis in the last reported year, men were 60 per cent more likely to die in prison than were women. 
Now, activists have previously pointed to the total number of deaths in custody over decades to implicitly denigrate the police and prison staff as white supremacists who just want to kill Indigenous people. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the statistics that have been published every year for decades show our prisons are going to great effort to avoid Indigenous deaths in custody, much more than they are doing for the non-Indigenous. The problem certainly is not racism in our custody system. And we must remember that these deaths in custody statistics include things like deaths from natural causes, deaths in motor vehicle pursuits by police, suicides and other arguably unrelated issues. All these are included in the total numbers. Now we do have a problem. There are far too many Indigenous people in our prison system for the population of Australia they represent. This is the result of decades of virtue signalling politicians like the uncaring Greens voting for policies that do nothing to help remote and Indigenous communities. Decades of dishonest, negligent, uncaring neglect, creating victims, robbing them of personal responsibility, depriving them of hope. These virtue signalling policies have only transferred, transferred taxpayer money to the Indigenous industry of white and black consultants, lawyers, activists, rent seekers, who care more about their salary and perpetuating their jobs than the communities they supposedly represent. The voice to parliament is just the next policy on this long list of look good and do nothing policies that will not help anyone except bureaucrats in the Canberra bubble. We thank and appreciate the Australian Institute for Criminality and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, leave is granted. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, we will now. Are there any ministerial statements, Minister? Uh, thank you. On behalf of the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Miles, I table a ministerial statement on the AUKUS nuclear-powered submarine pathway. Thank you, uh, Senator Ayres. Uh, <clears throat> I move to take to take note of the ministerial statement by the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence. And in so doing, I want to take the opportunity to emphasise some points about what AUKUS means in context of Australia's engagement in the world and our broader foreign policy. I understand that Senator Wong will make more comprehensive remarks as Foreign Minister when she is back in the chamber next week. The Australian government's in intent in acquiring this capability is to make our contribution to the strategic balance of the region. Australia wants a stable region where no country dominates and no country is dominated. If that is to be the case, we all have a responsibility to play our part in collective deterrence of aggression. Our region has been home to an unprecedented military build-up in recent years, meaning we must work hard and fast if we are to maintain equilibrium. Increasing our military capability sits alongside our diplomacy, which is about increasing the opportunities and benefits from peace and partnership, positive incentives for peace. I come to this debate with a deep interest in, in the intersection between regional affairs, peace and security questions and economic and industry policy. On the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, I should note that I was a key figure in the organising committee for the anti-Iraq war demonstrations in Sydney. National security debates are not the sole property of the security establishment, our defence forces or conservative commentators. They are for all Australians. There is no room for dogma or over-reliance on outdated ideological certainties. As well as positive incentives for peace, Australia must have effective deterrent for conflict and aggression. By having strong defence capabilities of our own and by working with partners investing in their own capabilities, we change the calculus for any potential aggressor. There are those in the building who like to beat the drums of war with a comic book characterisation of regional powers. And there are those who like to believe that peace can come from passively hoping for the best. This government knows that part of maintaining peace is making sure that all countries are invested in that peace through effective diplomacy. And part of maintaining peace is making sure no state will ever conclude that the benefits of conflict outweigh the risks. The goal is not to be an aggressor, to use the military capability. The goal is to make anyone thinking it's a good idea 
to use their military capability to think again. For those who are concerned about the diplomatic impl implications of the optimal pathway on nuclear-powered submarines announced last week, I make the observation that our regional partners agree on the need for a stable region, and we appreciate that they have listened to our explanations of how AUKUS contributes to regional balance. The Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Foreign Minister and Minister for International Development and the Pacific made more than 60 calls to counterparts in the lead-up to the announcement. This is, of course, on top of ongoing diplomatic legwork put in by the Albanese Labor government, particularly our Foreign Minister, Senator Penny Wong, since the election. Work that has been focused on rebuilding relationships with key partners, deepening trust and demonstrating Australia's growing contribution on the need for strategic equilibrium and guardrails to prevent competition between great powers turning into conflict. Our engagement has emphasised that Australia will continue to meet its non-proliferation obligations and commitments under the Treaty for the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons and remains fully committed to the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone Treaty. We are committed to ensuring that the rotational presence of UK and US submarines aligns with our long-standing commitments under the treaty. And while we are not a party to it, Australia will continue to act in a manner that is consistent with the basic principles of the Bangkok Treaty. This is underlined by the fact that these boats will be nuclear-powered, not nuclear-armed, and that Australia will never seek to acquire nuclear weapons. In addition, I note that the US Defence Secretary Austin has confirmed that the submarines visiting Australia on rotation will be conventionally armed. We are working openly and transparently with the IAEA to develop an appropriate, robust, non-proliferation approach to underpin Australia's nuclear-powered submarine program. This will enable the IAEA to provide assurance to the international community that Australia is continuing to meet its obligations as Director-General Grossi confirmed again last week. Uh, for those who have expressed concern about regional reactions, and I note that Senator Shoebridge did in question time this week, let me offer some reassurance. Fiji's Prime Minister Sitavani Rambuka has expressed his support for the AUKUS agreement. Samoa's Prime Minister Fiamma Naomi Mata'afa, here in Canberra this week, said that she understands Australia's rationale for acquiring nuclear-powered submarines. Philippines' Ministry of Foreign Affairs said has no objection to the development of the Trilateral Security Pact and noted that assurances made to contribute to the preservation of regional peace and stability. Japan, Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said the undertakings of AUKUS will contribute to the peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region amidst an increasingly severe, severe security environment in the region. Indonesia said maintaining peace and stability in the region is the responsibility of all countries. It is critical for all countries to be part of this effort. Malaysia said it appreciates the readiness on the part of the three countries, which are our close partners, in engaging with Malaysia at various levels and in sharing the latest updates and future outlook of AUKUS prior to the announcement. Vietnam said peace, stability, cooperation and development in the region and the world is the common goal of every country. And France has said that while it deeply regretted the Morrison government's decision to cancel the contract because it was announced in a particularly harsh way, it noted efforts underway to re-establish a solid partnership with the current Australian government with close and regular contact between leaders and officials, including at the recent Australia-France 2 plus 2 meeting. Mr Acting Deputy President, as the Deputy Prime Minister has articulated, acquiring nuclear-powered submarines is a game-changer for our capability and posture. The Collins class is a potent, highly capable diesel-electric submarine. The Australian Government will extend the life of the Collins class from 2026 so that it remains a potent capability until its withdrawal from service. But as we look to the 2030s and beyond, the reality is that diesel-electric submarines will be increasingly detectable as they surface to recharge their batteries. That will necessarily diminish their capability. By the 2030s and 2040s, the only capable long-range submarine 
able to effectively operate in the environment in which we live will be nuclear-powered submarines. These submarines have the capacity to remain submerged and deployed for months, making them incredibly hard to detect. As a corollary of their speed, stealth and endurance, nuclear-powered submarines are a capability that will make Australia a more difficult and costly target for anyone who wishes us harm. And so it is a capability that will significantly enhance our contribution to peace and security in the region. Maintaining peace requires effort. It demands effective diplomacy to ensure that everyone in the region benefits from that peace. Our intent in acquiring this, our, our intent in acquiring this capability is to contribute to the strategic balance of the whole region. We want, the Australian government wants, a stable region where no country dominates and no country is dominated. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Steele-John. Thank you. The AUKUS political deal was a last-ditched attempt by Scott Morrison to cling on to power, brought before the Australian people in the dying chapter of that benighted government. It was his final roll of the dice. His prediction was this, if I come together with some of the most outlandish and least trusted world leaders and propose to the Australian public and propose to the parties in this place that we bind ourselves to them, bind ourselves to the Americans, bind ourselves to the British, led at the time by Boris Johnson, under a project that would see hundreds of billions of dollars spent on the acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines necessitating a waste dump on Australian soil, submarines, nuclear submarines, in our waters, then no Australian Labor Party that could call itself progressive would possibly be able to back that. No Australian Labor Party, bound as they are to a platform that includes support of non-proliferation, would surely be able to back that. They'll have to oppose it. It will sound so ridiculous, particularly being led by Anthony Albanese, they can't possibly back it. And so they'll oppose it and we will have, he thought, a khaki election. We'll have an election where I can say I'm Scott Morrison, defender of the people of Australia, and the other side want to put us at risk. What he didn't count on, what he did not count on, was the fundamental spinelessness of the leadership of the current Australian Labor Party and the reality that the leadership of the current Australian Labor Party are not progressive. They have no desire nor ability to oppose the Conservatives when it comes to questions of so-called national security. He had not counted on just how committed people like Minister Wong, people like Mr Albanese were to fundamentally binding themselves together with a Liberal National Party that you wouldn't trust to run a lemonade stand on questions of national security so that they could have the maximum possible chance of getting elected. And so Mr Morrison's gamble to get himself a khaki election failed. And yet here we are today, buried as the Australian people under the $370 billion price of Labour's fundamental political spinelessness, where we as a nation for the next 30 years are asked to trust in the judgment of the United States of America. Now let us examine the record of this nation into which we are to place our foreign policy for the next three decades with which we are to bind ourselves inexecrably. 
indivisibly. Let's examine their record on matters of war and peace since the Second World War. The war in Vietnam, five million tons of bombs dropped on a nation that is more than all of the bombs dropped by the United States in the entirety of the Second World War. The illegal bombing of Laos and of Cambodia. The invasion of Panama. The support of coups all across South America. Chile, particularly. El Salvador. The support of the Contras in Nicaragua violent and vile as they were, and then rolling wonderfully up to the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. Iraq, an illegal and immoral invasion which fundamentally undermined international law, which left 500,000 people dead, 1.2 million people displaced, and created 5 million orphans. Australia, Britain, the United States populations led to war on the lies of a US president. And then, as if to add a dark bow to the whole thing, Afghanistan, where America, in its wisdom, spent 20 years, trillions of dollars, countless lives to replace the Taliban with the Taliban. Now, these are the people only a few years out of living under a fascist president who led a coup against his own government in order to overturn the results of an election. So, two years out of President Trump, 18 months away from either his return or the potential election of President DeSantis, a competent fascist. And this is the country with which the Australian Labour Party proposes that we bind ourselves for the next 30 years. This is the judgment upon which we are being asked to trust. Not because either Penny Wong or Richard Miles or Albany, Anthony Albanese thinks it's a good thing uh, excuse me, Senator Still, John. I have um, uh, the minister on, on his feet. I, I don't want to interrupt um, Senator Steele, John, but it would uh, assist um, both uh, compliance with the standing orders and the um, civility of debate if you referred to people, but with their proper uh, titles. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Still, John, if, if you could refer to people by their proper titles, thank you. That would assist the chamber. Senator Still, John. Thank you, Acting President. The fundamental point is this. The Australian public, without being asked to vote on the actual ramifications of this political deal, are being saddled by both major parties with a $360 billion, 30-year commitment to a nation who, in the post-World War II period, has demonstrated again and again that it does not have good judgment. It cannot and does not make decisions in relation to issues of war and peace in anybody's interest but its own. The people of Vietnam, the people of Iraq, the people of Afghanistan know that America is a very bad house guest. They begin a conflict in their national interest and they end it in their national interest. And the Australian people deeply understand the recklessness of this nation and have always been reflexively of the view that we should chart our own path, supportive of peace and of independence in our region, precisely because we understand that the Americans on these questions will always act in their own interest and their interest alone. 
once they are done with the Asia Pacific, once this posturing no longer serves their purpose, they will leave. For the United States of America, the Asia Pacific region is an area of current strategic interest. For Australians, it is our home. For the nations of the region, it is our home. And Australians across the country are uniting in a common call for peace in the face of this reckless political deal cooked up by a man we rejected and now continued by a government without the courage to call it out for what it really is and to join the Australian people in that common cause for peace. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. The question is that the uh, Senator agree to the motion moved by the Minister. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, there are no committee uh, memberships. Uh, Clark, thank you. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the Financial Accountability Regime Bill 2023 and four related bills for concurrence. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. So the, so the question is that, it now, that it, the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Financial Accountability Regime Bill 2023 and four related bills. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Um, leave is granted. Uh, thank you. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned till 9 May 2023. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Health Amendment Effective Prosecution Approved Pharmacist Corporations Bill 2023 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be read um, for the first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Uh, leave, is, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 9 May 2023. Clark, sorry. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of changes in the membership of joint committees. Uh, Clark, please. Oh, yes, Clark, yeah. Yes. Yes, Clark, yeah. Uh, business of the Senate, order of the day number one, a report from the Economics Legislation Committee on the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and related bills. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, pursuant to order and at the request of the Chair of the Economics Legislation Committee, Senator Walsh, I present the report of the Committee on the provisions of the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and related bills together with the accompanying documents. Okay. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Uh, Clark. Oh, sorry, Minister. Acting Deputy President, uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022. No. Just read it out. Read. Minister. Read it out. Um, it's uh, to um, uh, 
deal with um, divisions that may take place between 6.30 and 7.30pm today for the purpose of that said act. Is leave, leave is granted? Yes, leave is granted. Move that divisions may take place between 6.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. today for the purposes of the referendum machinery provisions um, amendment bill 2022. So the question before the chair is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. <laughs> Uh, for those within the chamber and those who, who might be watching, that just that motion means that divisions will take place between 6:30 and 7:30. Uh, for those who are watching, Clark. Government business orders of the day: referendum machinery provisions amendment bill 2022 in committee. The committee is considering the referendum machinery provisions amendment bill 2022 and the amendments moved by Senator Farrell on sheets QE 100, PX 151, PX 149, PX 150 and ZB 195 and the amendment moved by Senator David Pocock to government amendment number one on sheet ZB 195. The current question before the chair is that Senator David Pocock's amendment be agreed to and I call Senator Patterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, I wonder if you had the opportunity to refresh your memory or, or seek wider advice from your colleagues uh, about those issues we were discussing, uh, discussing this morning. Uh, Minister. Yeah, thank you, uh, <coughs> Chair, and thank Senator Patterson. Um, so this is the response I've had from the uh, Attorney-General. Um, look, it's a very long response. I don't know. Um, I'm happy to give it to you or um, read it out, but um, given table it, what about that? Are you happy to receive it um, uh, through tabling? Uh, oh, sorry, I'm um, sorry. Um, uh, who, who has the call? Do you want to call or do you want to have a well, question? I'm happy, oh, happy Senator to Patterson. I certainly have no objection to it being tabled, but I would also like to ask follow-up questions based on it. Um, if it is a very long statement, I, I suppose we shouldn't waste time reading it out. Um, perhaps other senators can ask their questions and deal with their matters while I consider the document after it's tabled, and I will ask questions on that basis. All right. Uh, Minister, so you're, you're tabling... Sorry, the minister has the call, and you'll just table that document. Yep. yep. Thank you. Uh, no yeah. objections. Um, would anyone like the call, uh, Senator Hume? Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, minister, how will the AEC police electoral material with no authorisation during the referendum? Minister. Well, I would have thought they'd police it the same way they. Police it in a general election. If somebody makes a complaint or they discover that uh, somebody has uh, not uh, authorised uh, relevant material, then they would uh, take uh, the action that they would take um, in any other set of circumstances. Senator Hume. Chair, uh, thank you, Chair. Minister, does the government intend to provide the electoral roll to any organisation campaigning during the referendum? Minister. No. <coughs> Senator Hume. Will parliamentarians minister be allowed to provide access, their access to the electoral roll to organisations that are campaigning during the referendum? Minister. That's not uh, permitted. Uh, Senator Hume. Thank you, Chair. Under the legislation, Minister, can a parliamentarian campaign for either case at the referendum and can staff of a parliamentarian campaign for either case at the referendum as part of their duties? Uh, 
Minister. Yes. Senator Hume. Uh, Minister, noting certain electoral activity undertaken by parliamentarians and political parties associated with them are exempt from the Privacy Act of 1988, will the activities of participants captured by the referendum machinery provisions in this bill and the Act be subject to the same exemptions? Minister. They're not um, <clears throat> registered political parties, so there would be no exemption. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, um, you've said that you want this to be a, um, a civil society-led uh, referendum, and many community groups will be involved. If a community group nominates to fundraise for the purpose of putting forward an argument in the referendum, will they be captured by the donation regime? Minister. Um, yes, my understanding is if they go over the disclosure threshold, then they would have to declare. And that threshold, I think I talked earlier today, is in the vicinity of $15,000. Senator Hume. Uh, so, Minister, what mechanisms are in place to prevent a community group from accepting a foreign donation prior uh, to them re actually receiving it? This, uh, this Act um, replicates the foreign donations provisions of the Electoral Act. So, um, as I've said so many times today, uh, the idea is to match the same experience, and so the same provisions would apply. Senator Hume. Thank you. So, Minister, the um, foreign donations law applies to political parties, registered political parties, registered political entities, and. Um, these organisations won't be registered political entities, won't be registered political parties. So is there a mechanism that's specifically in place for civil society at large to prevent them accepting foreign donations prior to them actually doing it? Minister. If they, if they, um, if they become a referendum entity, by virtue of the um, level of donations, then yes, they would be captured if they um, um, were in receipt of foreign donations. Senator Hume. Thank you. So a referendum entity is something that has to be registered because earlier today you said that there wasn't necessarily going to be a register of entities that can campaign as part of the referendum. Minister. They're not formally registered, they're required to disclose and as such would then attract the regulation regarding uh, foreign uh, donations. Senator Hume. Uh, will a community organisation be liable for receiving an illegal donation if they are ignorant of the provisions against foreign donations? Minister. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Senator Hume. So will the community organisation be liable for receiving an illegal donation if they are ignorant of the provisions against foreign donations? Minister. Well, the general rule, ignorance of the law is no, uh, no defence. Um, that wouldn't be any different in these circumstances and obviously um, they are subject to the foreign disclosure provisions. Senator Hume. So will the government then expect a community group to be prosecuted by the AEC if they receive an illegal donation? Minister. Um, look, 
the 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 idea is that um, by, by virtue of the foreign um, donations uh, rules, uh, that um, uh, it would work in the same way. Um, it would work in a general election. We're not seeking to do anything different here. The the idea is to standardise the um, <coughs> the uh, experience people get um, and the obligations organisations have, um, whether it be um, uh, for a general election or for a referendum. <coughs> Senator Hume. Uh, can I ask the minister what the penalty is for receiving an illegal foreign donation and what action the government would take when it becomes aware of foreign donations occurring? Minister. Understand it to be a uh, hundred uh, penalty units. And what was your second question? Well, it wouldn't 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 be the government taking the action. It would be the Australian Electoral Commission, who would um, do whatever they would usually do when they find a breach of the um, of the law, any aspect of the electoral law, which I imagine would be a prosecution. <laughs> Senator Hume. Uh, can I ask the minister what or uh, how? Donations of cryptocurrency might be treated under this donations regime. Minister, I'll uh, get the AC to uh, give me a response for that question. <clears throat> Senator Hume, can I ask also how donations in kind to organisations campaigning in the referendum will be treated under the donations regime? Minister. Exactly the same as the Electoral Act currently provides. Senator Hume. Can I ask the Minister, will foreign citizens be able to purchase goods and services that are sold for the purpose of funding referendum activities? Um, again, exactly the same provisions as in the Electoral Act, which is um, if it's uh, in excess of uh, $100, yes, it applies. Senator Hume. So can the Minister explain to me what will happen to funds raised by a referendum campaign organisation that isn't expended prior to the referendum? Repeat that question. If an organisation is a campaigning organisation for the referendum and is accepting donations from citizens to campaign for the referendum, what will happen to that money if the organisation hasn't expended all of those donations prior to the referendum? Minister. Look, it would be the same as you know, a political organisation if they um, raised more money than they used it in an election. Um, you know, it would sit somewhere, I guess, in a bank account. Um, but um, <clears throat> obviously, you know, if it exceeds the threshold, um, then um, uh, then they would be required to uh, to, to declare that. And I assume it would be up to the organisation as to what it subsequently does with the money. Senator Hume. Oh, is there any obligation on the organisation to notify those that have donated that it still contains money in a bank account somewhere that belongs to them that hasn't been expended? Minister. I think the rule would be the same if a political party got more money than it expended. I don't know how often that happens. I suppose it happens occasionally. It never happens in the Labor Party, so we never have this issue. But um, uh, look, the only answer I can give you to that is that um, the organisation would have to resolve how they dealt with the money. Um, if it was no longer required, then of course um, you'd hopefully get them to return the money. 
uh, if that was possible. Senator Hume. So, Minister, my concern there, of course, is if you donate to a political party, chances are it's going to be fighting another election. A referendum is a one-off occurrence. And I think that there probably needs to be some clarity around that. Perhaps you could confirm for the chamber that the government is considering how to build some clarity around that. Minister. I'll give it some very deep thought. <clears throat> Senator Hume. Can I ask the minister what confidence should Australians have that they'll be donating to a genuine referendum campaign organisation? Minister. Um, look, I think, I mean, the. The hope of the government is this um, referendum will be conducted in a civil um, fashion, um, that each side will have an opportunity to um, progress its arguments through civil society. And um, you know, our expectation is that people um, will abide by <coughs> um, that, um, I guess, sense of civility in, in the processes and that we won't find people doing things that um, are, um, are inappropriate um, or, for that matter, uh, illegal. Um, if we find that there are issues arise in that regard, and I hope we don't find that, um, that those sort of issues arise, then I guess we'll have to deal with them. But we're working on the basis that um, people are going to behave um, appropriately throughout the course of the referendum uh, and that um, um, we won't get into a situation where people, for instance, are illegally taking money on false pretences. Um, but I guess <coughs> there are other laws which might uh, come into play if somebody set themselves up and as an organisation receiving money for the yes or no case and you discover that um, in fact they're a bogus organisation, well I imagine there's laws in place that deal with those sorts of things quite independently of um, the referendum. Um, I think we have to work on the basis of a degree of trust in the Australian people that this will be a civil campaign uh, and that at the end of the day, um, whether it's a yes or a no case. Um, people are satisfied that um, the Australian people have had an appropriate uh, opportunity to express their view on a voice to parliament. Senator Hume. Minister, do you think that this is an opportunity without a register of organisations or without an official yes or a no campaign that this is a situation that is ripe for scammers? Minister. No. <coughs> Senator Hume. Minister, when a private company engages in pro bono work on behalf of a referendum entity or a participant captured by one of the disclosure regimes, how would that activity be captured as a donation or a gift? No, oh, sorry, as, would that cap be captured as a donation or a gift? How would that be disclosed? As a donation or a gift by the individual or as a donation or a gift by the company? Minister. Treated as an in-kind donation for both. Senator Hume. So, where a private company becomes aware of work conducted using its resources and its staff for a referendum entity or a participant, and it hasn't disclosed that activity, will that organisation then be subject to penalties? Minister. Um, that would be an issue for the uh, AEC to work through um, in the same way they would do that um, in respect of a general election. Senator Hume. Uh, could the minister confirm that the donation and disclosure regimes in the bill and, that the, and the Act will apply retrospectively? You mean minister. For are you talking in respect to um, contributions that might have already have been made um, to either the yes or the no case? Is that?
Okay. Minister. All right. That's a reasonably complicated uh, answer. Um, let me see if I can explain it. Um, if the money is um, uh, received and spent in the six months prior to the issuing of the writ, then yes, it will have to be included in the, um, in the declaration that you, you make, um, I would consider that a prospective uh, rather than a retrospective application uh, because the declaration <coughs> um, would have to be done after the issuing of the writs. Senator Hume. Can I just clarify, because we don't know the date of the issuing of the writs yet, there are companies out there right now who may be donating their time, may be donating their staff's time, may be donating money that don't realise that they have to declare that yet or record it yet. Is that a concern for government? Minister. Um, look, what we're concerned about is that when this legislation hopefully passes today and you don't have too many more questions for me, um, uh, that all um, organisations understand their obligations and uh, comply with them. Senator Hume. Sorry, I'm not entirely sure that organisations understand their obligations because those obligations haven't been specified to those organisations yet, and they don't know whether they fall within or outside or inside that six-month regime. Is there a message that you would like to send those organisations that want to provide pro bono work to a campaign organisation today from the government? Minister. Yes, yes, there is a message. Thank you for the opportunity of giving me <coughs> to uh, give them a message, please comply with the uh, obligations under this uh, new legislation and we'll do our level best to make sure that um, you're aware of what your obligations are. I suspect the sorts of organisations um, that you're talking about, um, Senator Hume, um, will take um, a very careful look at the legislation and take the opportunity to get some advice. Um, I'm sure my office and perhaps even yours um, after this legislation goes through, would be uh, happy to advise them exactly what their obligations are. Senator Patterson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Minister, thank you for tabling this statement. Um, I'm not sure that your definition of long and my definition of long are the same. This is a single-sided, double-spaced, dot-pointed piece of paper. It might have taken two minutes to read to the Hansard, but nonetheless, thank you. Um, really, the, only, the first two dot points are relevant in any case. Um, which read, I understand at the National Press Club the Attorney General last year expressed concern about overseas funding of campaigning in the upcoming referendum and that he was referring to foreign donations. And point two, I also understand that he did not refer to advice. Am I to understand from this that the Attorney General and the government has also not sought any advice, as you admitted you had not, about the foreign interference risks in the referendum? Minister. Thank you. Um, look, I know you have a bit of an obsession in this area, uh, Senator um, um, Patterson, and uh, are looking for, uh, you know, looking for <coughs> um, an opportunity to. Um, um, expose or expand on uh, foreign uh, foreign interference um, in any of our uh, in any aspect of our society and good luck to you for doing that um, I don't have any um, difficulty uh, with that but um, uh, if there were issues that the AEC thought um, were concerning, about they monitor these things very closely, much much more closely, and I'm happy to take you in to the AEC one day and show you what they do in this uh, space to um, keep an eye on all of these things. Um, uh, if they felt that there was an issue that needed to be addressed in this area, I'm sure that um, the first uh, thing that they would do is make contact with me. Uh, about it, or for that matter, the the Attorney General, if it was something in his uh, his bailiwick. As I said before, I was uh, talking with the um, 
uh, AC yesterday. Um, I've got the greatest confidence um, that they uh, will conduct um, uh, the referendum in exactly the appropriate uh, way, but that if um, an issue of foreign interference does arise, um, then we'll become uh, aware of it and we'll take appropriate action. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Just to be clear, has the government sought advice from any agency about the foreign interference risk at the upcoming referendum? Yes or no? Minister. I can talk for myself, and the answer to that is no. We've referred to uh, the comments made by the, uh, the Attorney General um, um, earlier. And um, um, as I said, if we believe there's an issue uh, arises here based on uh, advice from uh, either the AEC or other organisations, then we'll take the appropriate action. Senator Patterson. Uh, Senator Farrell, um, it wasn't just a question to you, it is a question to the government, and I would be grateful if you could answer on behalf of the government, as you are representing them here on this bill, and I ask again, has the government sought advice from any agency on the risk of foreign interference in this upcoming referendum to assist you, for example, ASIO, or ASD, or ONI, or the Department of Home Affairs, or the Attorney General's Department? Have any of them been asked for advice on the foreign interference risks in the referendum? Minister. I can only, I can only uh, uh, answer the question um, based on uh, my own knowledge, and I've, uh, I've done that. Um, and um, uh, I'm happy to make some inquiries and come back to you about whether or not uh, other organisations uh, have received any, uh, uh, any such information. I suspect that had uh, any issues been um, um, uncovered, uh, then we would have heard about it. Uh, and the fact that we haven't heard about it is probably an indication that there are no issues out there. Senator Patterson. That last part of your answer does not fill me with confidence. You suspect that if there were issues, you would have heard about it, and since you haven't, perhaps there aren't. I mean, that indicates to me an attitude or a culture in the government of not taking these issues seriously. It is your job as ministers to seek advice uh, and to consider that advice that you're provided with. Um, Minister, I did ask you this morning whether the government had sought advice from any agencies. You did undertake to come back to me about that. Um, you appear not to be able to. Can I ask you to confer with the advisers next to you who will be able to consult the ministerial officers they are here representing and I'm sure have telephones and WhatsApp and Signal and can seek that advice from their ministerial officers and provide that answer to the chamber now? Because now is when the, when the chamber is considering relevant amendments which will have implications to foreign interference, which I'll come to next. Minister. Um, look, that's a very patronising uh, way to treat me uh, with respect, uh, Senator Patterson. Um, look, 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 well, I, I have answered it. I've said that um, I've not received any advice which would lead me to believe that we currently have an issue in respect of um, foreign donations. Um, <coughs> we, are, we are, in fact, um, one of the things we're doing here is reflecting the foreign donations provisions in the referendum, of course, the last time the referendum uh, uh, took place, we didn't have those provisions in the Referendum Act. We, we will have them in the Act now. Um, uh, those provisions are there um, to stop foreign donations. Um, I've got the greatest confidence in all of our um, authorities that in the event that somebody were, was seeking to influence um, our referendum, <coughs> foreign, uh, foreign companies, foreign organisations, uh, that we would take the appropriate action to ensure um, that, um, that the law of this country applies and that uh, those foreign donations were uh, prohibited. Senator Patterson. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, to assist you, I mean, I really do think it probably is the case that some of your colleagues in government have been briefed on this question, have sought advice on this question, and I find it extraordinary that you are not able to answer that question on their behalf. It would be remarkable if no advice had been provided to your colleagues. I'm surprised it hasn't come to your awareness. Um, I can't go to the content of it, but I myself have received briefings on the risk of foreign interference in this upcoming referendum, so I'll be utterly astonished 
if government ministers had not also received them. Why is it that you are not able to answer this question on behalf of the government on your own bill? Minister. Well, Senator Patterson, we're putting in a foreign donations provision into the Referendum Act to stop exactly what you say you're interested in stopping. I mean, what else, what else are we supposed to do? We've got a regime. Now, why have we got a regime to stop foreign donations? Because two parliaments ago, I, as the um, small special minister of state, shadow special minister of state, pushed the government into doing something about it. We have a foreign donations register in this uh, um, country in the AUC legislation because the Labor Party pushed it. And I can't remember, to be frank, any contribution from you in that, uh, in that, uh, in that role. We've got that legislation. We've put it into the uh, Referendum uh, Act now. So let the law work as it is intended to work and stop all these conspiracy theories, all these, all these crazy ideas that you obviously have. Um, we want a civil uh, Australian referendum to determine whether there should be a voice uh, to, to parliament, um, and that's what this legislation uh, is doing. And if you vote in favour of this legislation, then you'll get what you say you're after, which is uh, protection from foreign, um, um, foreign uh, influence in our electoral system. Senator Patterson. Minister, is it the government's view that the risk of foreign interference in the referendum is a conspiracy theory? Minister. It's the government's view that if this legislation passes today, we will match the foreign um, donations provisions that apply in uh, a general election. We think that is the safest course of action to ensure that there is no foreign influence um, in this referendum. Senator Patterson. Minister, is the only sort of foreign interference or foreign influence that the government is concerned about from foreign political donations, or are you aware of other possible avenues for foreign interference? Minister. We are going to apply the foreign interference regulations that apply to a general election. We think that is the appropriate course of action uh, to deal with any potential sources of foreign uh, influence. If we find that um, there is foreign inf interference, we'll ensure that that is dealt with in the same way that it would be dealt with in respect of a general election. Senator Patterson. Has the government sought or received advice on the risk of foreign interference through social media in relation to the referendum? Minister. Um, so we have um, an organisation called the Electoral Integrity Assurance Task Force and comprised of the relevant agencies across federal government working together to provide information and advice to the Australian Electoral Commissioner on matters relation, relating to uh, the integrity uh, of the processes of federal elections and referendums. The following portfolios and agencies are EIAT members. The Australian Electoral Commission, the Department of Finance, the Department of uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet, Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development, uh, Communication and the Arts, Department of Home Affairs, Attorney General's Department, uh, Australian uh, Federal Police, Australian Signals Directorate, the Office of National Intelligence and the Task Force is also supported by members of the national intelligence community as required. Um, on the 26th of July 2022, the Australian Electoral Commissioner released a public media statement confirming that the EIAT agencies did not identify any foreign interference or any other interference that can uh, compromise the delivery of the 2022 federal election and would undermine the confidence of Australian people in the results of that election. <laughs> Members of the EAIT Consult with online media platforms, including major electoral events, including referenda, and have also established escalation processes for the referral of content 
in breach of the Commonwealth legislation or in social media platforms terms of services. Uh, agencies that participate in the EA, EIAT are already working to provide appropriate support to protect the integrity of the proposed referendum, including from foreign actors. The government will continue to work through the members of the EIAT on risks to integrity of the referendum, including the threat of foreign interference, to ensure the public can have continued confidence uh, in the conduct and the outcome of this and other electoral events. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Minister. That was an interesting answer, but not one that addressed the question that I asked, which was, has the government sought or received advice about the risk of foreign interference through social media in relation to the upcoming referendum? Minister. I've answered the question. <laughs> Senator Patterson. Thank you. Minister, this morning when I asked you a series of questions that you undertook to take on notice and come back to me in the chamber on, one of them was, has the government uh, had any meetings with any of the tech platforms in relation to the risk of foreign interference in the upcoming referendum? What's the answer to that question? Minister. I just read out the answer to that question. Obviously, you weren't listening. Um, I refer to my previous answers. <clears throat> Senator Patterson. It didn't address the question, has the government sought uh, or had meetings with any of the tech platforms in relation to the risk of foreign interference through social media or online uh, in the upcoming referendum? Minister. I refer to my previous answer. Senator Patterson. When did the government meet with the tech platforms in relation to the risk of foreign interference in relation to the upcoming referendum? Minister. I refer to my previous answer. <coughs> Senator Patterson. Uh, Minister, I don't think it reflects all that well on you that you are refusing to answer this question. If the answer is that the government has not met with the technology platforms in relation to this issue, you should just say so. And if you don't know, you should say that you don't know. Minister. Um, well, again, another condescending uh, remark, uh, <coughs> which is not appreciated, uh, Senator Patterson. I'll read out what I said previously, which answers your question directly. Members of the EIAT consult with online media platforms, including prior to electoral events, including referenda, and have also established escalation processes for the referral of the content in breach of Commonwealth legislation or social media platforms terms of service. Senator Patterson. Minister, when did the, when did the government meet with the platforms? When did the government meet with the platforms? Minister. Well, I've just explained to you the process of how we deal with these issues. I mean, I can repeat this over and over again, Senator Patterson, but maybe at some point you'll get, you'll get that I've answered your question. There is a process in place to deal with this. I've explained how it's working. I've explained how the AEC have given a report uh, saying that they didn't see any evidence of uh, foreign interference in the last election, I'm hopeful that by adopting exactly the same set of procedures uh, in the referendum uh, that we get exactly the same results, so that sometime after the election um, there will be a report that discloses there has been no foreign uh, interference uh, in our, uh, our referendum, but the process is all set up to deal with it. Senator Patterson, and I can't understand for the life of me why you can't understand that. Senator Hume. Thank you, Chair. So, Minister, may I follow up on Senator Patterson's question? Because at a normal election, the Electoral Integrity Assurance Task Force that you referred to um, might contact a person that is leading a political party or an organisation. But in this referendum, we don't have political parties or organisations. Um, so, how will this be managed under the current referendum machinery where participants don't need to register prior to engaging in electoral activity? Minister. Look, um, have some faith in the AEC. There's a process set up there to deal with this. Um, uh, those processes will work. Um, I'm absolutely confident and uh, we can be assured, I hope, that at the end of this process we'll get the same sort of communication from the AEC that we got um, in, 20, uh, in July uh, 2022 that they didn't identify any foreign influence in the referendum. Senator Hume. Right. 
again, just follow up on that. So, if an is instance of foreign interference occurs, or foreign intervention, uh, interference activity becomes an issue in a campaign for an election, uh, for a referendum, there won't be any official yes campaign or no or yes organisation or no organisation for um, intelligence and security agencies to contact about that. So in contrast, there are registered political parties at elections, each who have officials and structures that can respond to those sorts of events. So in this referendum, who will the agencies contact to make the yes or no cases aware of any of these issues? Minister. Well, it's not a case of contacting the yes or no cases. It will be the job to contact the organisation about which it is alleged that they are a foreign organisation seeking to influence an Australian referendum. That is who they will contact. Senator Hume. Can I clarify, then, uh, Minister, what steps the government has taken to educate parties that will potentially be campaigning yes or no about the risks of foreign interference and how those risks can be mitigated? Minister. Well, we haven't passed the legislation yet. We, <laughs> I mean, fair crack of the whip. Um, the legislation hasn't passed. Um, in due course, the AEC will do everything um, that it is required to do to educate people. Um, you know, one of the things that we um, know we're going to invest in uh, is an education campaign about the, the, the referendum, and I'm sure this will be a part of anything that the AEC ultimately, you know. Um, communicates with the uh, with the Australian people, but have some faith that this is going to work the way that you know we, we, we want it to work. Have a little bit of faith, both in the AEC and the Australian people, that this will work properly. Senator Hume, can I ask also then, will the foreign interference, sorry, the foreign influence transparency scheme operate during the referendum, and if so, how will it operate? Minister. It operates all the time, uh, <coughs> Senator Hume, and uh, will continue to operate throughout the course of the of the um, uh, referendum in the same way it works at the moment. Senator Hume, so if a referendum-related event were to have a speaker that wasn't an Australian citizen, would this activity be captured by the Foreign Influence Scheme? Minister. Um, my understanding is it would be covered by the in-kind provisions, but we're starting to move outside the scope of this uh, legislation, I think. Senator, Osa uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, earlier today, before we moved on to other things, uh, you said uh, quite complimentarily that uh, the AC Commissioner was able to make himself available to senators and, and no doubt members of the House of Representatives. Uh, I'm wondering, Minister, could you undertake, and that, that's great that he's able to have private meetings, uh, but would you be able to undertake for a maybe a special meeting of the Finance and Public Administration uh, Committee to be able to hold uh, a public uh, inquiry with the minister, uh, sorry, with the commissioner to be able to ask these sort of questions and ask him directly to get some direct feedback as to the, the mechanics of how this, elect, uh, this referendum would be conducted. Minister. I'd be very happy to um, see if he would make himself available uh, either to that organisation or to any senator who wants to find out about how this process is going to work. Um, senator Patterson. Minister, it seems to be your view, based on these exchanges, that the existing arrangements are sufficient for guarding against uh, the risk of foreign interference and influence in the upcoming referendum. 
although it is not clear to me how you could form that view given you yourself have not sought or received any advice from our agencies about that risk and therefore you do not appear to be uh, informed about it. Um, of course, it is this legislation itself which will contribute to and risk exacerbating the risk of foreign interference because you have not allowed for an official yes and official no campaigns. The reason why that is important, and you may know if you had met with the tech platforms to discuss this, is that the tech platforms have said to me that it would be very helpful to them to be able to point to official yes and official no campaigns as authoritative sources of information if there is conjecture about disinformation or misinformation in this political debate, which may or may not be driven by foreign states or other, other actors. Um, how did you form the view that it was not necessary to have a yes or no case to ameliorate this risk if you did not seek or receive briefings from our agencies and if you have not met with tech platforms to discuss their point of view? Minister. Look, I am extremely confident. and I invited you to discuss it with the uh, AEC after this legislation passes, uh, that um, they are completely um, in control of this issue. Um, you can never guarantee that no uh, foreign organisation may seek to influence them. I am not saying that uh, you could um, you know, make that uh, guarantee, but I am very confident, certainly based on the advice that we got subsequent to the last uh, federal election. Uh, that the AEC and all the other organisations that are responsible for um, monitoring this issue, um, I've got the greatest confidence in them, and I know that they'll be able to uh, deal with any issues that may arise. Senator Patterson. Thank you for that offer of a briefing from the AEC. I've had many such briefings in the past, and from that I know that it's not the AEC's responsibility to deal with content in an election campaign or referendum campaign, and it is, of course, the content of speech and debate in the context of a referendum campaign, which has the greatest risk of potential foreign interference. Um, we have seen this uh, in relation to recent reporting about foreign interference in the Canadian elections. We have seen this in other elections where content has been weaponised on social media platforms to drive disinformation, sometimes weaponised by foreign states, to increase, uh, to undermine social cohesion and undermine national unity and cause division. That is the risk in this debate, in this referendum, and it is exacerbated by your policy choice to not allow a formal yes or no case. Will you reconsider your opposition to a yes or no case? Minister. No. <laughs> Senator Hanson. One Nation seeks to introduce an amendment to the Referendum Machinery Provisions Act 19, 1984, which will be a first for Australia. We have always championed the Australian people having a more direct say in how they are governed. We strongly support a people's democracy, sometimes called direct democracy. Over the years, the need Order. for it— Senator Hanson, sorry, I have the minister on his feet. Probably the wrong place for um, Senator Hanson to move her um, amendment. We, we we have um, a number of amendments uh, before the chair, and it would be, and in fact, we have some amendments to our amendments. Um, can I can I suggest that um, uh, we deal with um, our amendments and um, Senator Pocock's amendment, and deal with um, uh, Senator um, Hanson's? Uh, uh, amendment at a later point I'm cognizant, in the proceedings. Uh, so thank you, um, Senator Farrell. I'm cognisant that the question before the chair is in relation to um, those government amendments which you just referenced, but I don't think Senator Hanson had actually moved her amendment at this point. I think she was just foreshadowing moving her amendment, and she's entitled to. Uh, But uh, Senator Hanson does need to be relevant to the question before the chair, which is the content of the current amendment. So I will listen very closely to ensure that she is being relevant to that. Um, but I think, Senator Hanson, you are in order. Here. Over the years, the need has <clears throat> become more urgent. Policymakers, political parties, lobbyists and the media have become increasingly distant from the Australian people they are supposed to serve. As a result, legislation and political commentary increasingly do not reflect the wishes and aspirations of the Australian electorate, and the people themselves are feeling increasingly powerless and disenfranchised. Our amendment seeks to reverse this trend and, for the first time, allow the Australian people to set the agenda instead of out-of-touch politicians, lobbyists and the media. 
I'm talking about citizens initiated referenda. There is ample precedent for this overseas. New Zealand and Switzerland have citizens initiated referenda and direct democracy is practiced to varying degrees in Europe and a number of the United States. One Nation's amendment to add a new schedule to the Act after section 145. This schedule will enable Australian citizens to initiate legislation that provides for the holding of a referendum to alter the constitution. Part two of the schedule will set out the process that must be followed and the requirements which must be met. These are exacting processes and requirements, as should be the case for initiative to change the founding document of the Commonwealth. Firstly, a person is an elector may apply to the Electoral Commissioner to register a proposal for a referendum. The Commissioner must examine it and decide whether it relates to a proposal for a referendum to amend the Constitution. If it does, the Commissioner must register the proposal and the applicant must, within six months, lodge a document with the Commissioner containing the signatures of 2 per cent of the total of all electors. Once this requirement has been met, the Commissioner must undertake random sampling to verify that at least 50 per cent of the signatures were obtained validly. Once this verification is achieved, the Minister must cause a proposed law to alter the Constitution in accordance with the proposal to be introduced into the Parliament. Part 3 of the schedule will set out the rules that apply to holding a citizen-initiated referendum. Once a proposed law to alter the Constitution in accordance with the proposal has been passed, by an absolute majority of one house or both houses of the parliament in accordance with section 128 of the constitution, the Governor-General may issue a writ for the citizens' initiated referendum to be held on the date of the next federal election. Part 4 with the delegation of the commission, electoral commissioner's functions and powers. This is not a simple process and this is intentional. Democracy is not an easy exercise as it was never meant to be. By its nature, democracy is hard and difficult. Winston Churchill perhaps described it best when he said that democracy was the world's worst form of government except for all others which have been tried. But anything worth doing is worth doing well, and democracy has proven it's worth time and time again. This is an important truth which the Albanese government seems to have forgotten with its disturbing habit of rushing through extremely poor legislation with the absolute minimum possible scrutiny. One Nation calls on the Albanese gov Labor government the opposition of the crossbench to recommit to the fundamental principles of Australian democracy and stop this my way or the highway cowboy approach to lawmaking. There is no better way to signal this commitment to the principles of democracy than supporting One Nation's amendment and allowing Australian citizens to initiate a referendum. Yes, Minister, there was um, a discussion about the yes and no vote at, um, at the next referendum. Will you be supporting um, the no vote with the, um, in uh, allowing them to actually put out literature um, on the same basis what you're going to put out for the yes vote? Minister. Senator Hanson. Um, no, the, the, the government is not supporting either the yes or the no case in a financial um, sense. Um, it will be up to civil society to conduct the arguments uh, in favour of a yes or a no case. Senator Hanson. Thank you. Well, then, under the NIAA, you've actually set up, allowed for a, a, a body of people to actually put um, recommendations to the referendum costing about $1.6 million. Um, so basically you've already put in place <coughs> committees and, and organisations um, to actually and funded by Prime Minister and Cabinet under the NIAA. So is that really saying that you distance yourself from the Yes campaign? Minister. The government has um, sought, sought um, advice from uh, various organisations in this uh, country um, to um, uh, well, um, receive advice on the best way in which to go forward in terms of the yes case. Um, and I have um, earlier today uh, explained all of the organisations to which um, funding has uh, has uh, has been given, uh, but in terms of the conduct of the 
uh, yes, no case itself. Um, we're leaving that to, uh, to civil society. Senator Hanson. Thank you. So let's make it quite clear. Under the Prime Minister and Cabinet, which costs about $4.5 billion a year for the NIAA, and part of this money then has gone to the structure of a body to actually um, inform the Prime Minister and Cabinet's department about the structure of them working towards this referendum. So that means that really you're saying that you don't fund a yes case uh, at all, although your money from the Prime Minister and Cabinet have gone to a body of people purely to develop a strategy and information towards the, the yes vote. Minister. Senator Hanson, the <clears throat> government took to the last election the proposition that we would put a referendum to the Australian people on the issue of whether there should be a voice, recognition of a voice uh, in the federal parliament to um, Indigenous uh, Australians. The government won the election and we are carrying through um, on that promise to the Australian people. In the process, um, we're seeking advice on the nature of, uh, of the question that should be put to the Australian people to determine that issue um, and a range of other issues uh, around that. But once this uh, legislation uh, passes um, and the subsequent uh, legislation to deal with that question, um, then of course we are leaving it to the Australian people, either the people who want to vote yes or the people who want to vote no. Um, to run, uh, run that case and, or present the arguments to the Australian people. And sometime later in the year, the Prime Minister has said in the second half of the year, uh, there will in fact be a referendum and people will be able to make a choice, yes or no, for Indigenous rec recognition. I, for one, will be voting yes. Senator Hanson. Last question. Is the Prime Minister aware of the decisions and the direction that the NIAA are headed towards um, with this referendum, and does he support what they're doing? Minister. I'll ask him and get back to you, Senator Hanson. <laughs> Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, to return to uh, my amendment to the government amendment earlier that you said that Social media advertising was the least likely to change someone's mind. Uh, so I'm just interested why the Australian Labor Party spent over $1.3 million on Facebook alone in the, just the last week of the last election campaign. Minister. Uh, there's no, there's no, no hypocrisy there. Um, um, Order. There's no hypocrisy. No, we're, we're not into hypocrisy in the Labor Party. Um, rest assured, we're not, we're not, we're, we're not um, into hypocrisy. Um, no, look, I think you're, you're you're taking selective references from my from from my comments. Um, the point I was trying to make about you, you might recall I, I referenced Twitter, and I revealed that Twitter was. Um, the least likely form of communication that would change your, your vote. Um, and um, one of the reasons that political organisations um, do spend money on social media is making contact with the people that they know um, are supporting them. So you spend a lot of money um, in the election actually <coughs> Ging up your own your own supporters and reassuring your own supporters, um, and well, I mean, I don't purport to be an expert on social media, and I'm sure there are other people that can speak more authoritatively on this uh, topic than than myself. But the reason you spend money um, on social media in that period of the election, as I understand it. Um, is that you reinforce your message to those people that are already considering voting for you. Senator Pocock. Thank you, thank you, Minister, for the explanation. Uh, 
just 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 finally, and then I'm, I'm very happy to to move on. Uh, if social media is such a legitimate advertising channel that the Labor Party in one week would spend $1.3 million on Facebook, why don't we just add it to the blackout period? Like we've, we've listed all the other, the other mediums where people consume content. Social media is, is a big part of that now. Minister. Uh, look, I agree, uh, Senator Pocock. It is, it is a big part of it, although some people say a declining uh, part of it, and when you see what's happening to some of the social media organisations around the world, you, you might conclude that um, there is a bit of a decline, uh, decline there. Um, what, what the message I've tried to give the, the Senate is a, is a simple one. Um, we want the experience that Australians get um, at this up-and-coming referendum um, to be as close to the experience that they would have in a general election. And um, so what we're trying to do is marry um, the two sets of, of uh, provisions so that that can, can occur. Um, it's been more than 22 years since we've had a referendum. Um, the Electoral Act has been updated. For instance, um, Senator Patterson was talking about um, you know, foreign interference. We didn't have that as an issue when we had the, um, um, the uh, Republic uh, referendum. Um, it's been raised as an issue since. There's been legislation. We've legislated it in respect of the AEC. We're now, <coughs> sorry, in respect to a general election, we're now legislating it to make sure that the same provisions apply to a referendum. So um, I'm happy to have the discussion about whether the blackout should be extended to social media. I'm not saying that we should reject that um, out of hand, but we've got a process that's dealing particularly with general elections. There's a whole range of issues. Um, many of the um, um, amendments that the Greens are proposing, um, like um, you know, ceilings on uh, disclosure, real-time um, real disclosure, all of those issues will be subject to a JSCAM inquiry um, let's not preempt that J scam inquiry because um, you know there are there are significant issues if you do extend the ban, um, and I think the appropriate course of action is to let that J scam process go. Um, let's have a look at what comes out of that and make some uh, uh, some evaluation after that. And I welcome your participation uh, in that uh, in that discussion. <laughs> Senator Hume. I just have one last question for the minister and then I hope that we can progress this. But having heard the answers that you've given the chamber today, I'm interested to know if this referendum were on a different issue, if it weren't about an Indigenous voice to parliament, if it were about something far more basic, would you change the mechanism and the machinery by which Australians would go to the polls? Would you consider a yes campaign and a no campaign organisation, as there has been in previous referenda? Or would you persist with this mechanism and this machinery the way you have established it and described it today? Minister. I don't know. <laughs> Senator Hume. Can I clarify then that this machinery bill has been built around the question rather than around the issues of foreign donations, foreign interference, updating the machinery for all of those issues that we have covered off today. In fact, the machinery bill has been updated by the government specifically for this question rather than a fair, free uh, um, referendum that Australians would normally expect, no matter what the question is. Minister. I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that characterisation. Um, um, you're, you're trying to ask your previous question um, was based around what would we do if a different topic um, was the subject of the, the referendum and I answered as honestly I could um, I'm, I'm not sure and I don't know what we might do it in some future referendum I think we've our objective here and I, I've repeated it so many times today is to try and get the experience for the Australian people to be as close to a general election in a referendum as, as we can do it. We took a de deliberate policy decision 
uh, not to um, do what you have been seeking. And I've explained to you time and time again uh, that we've make and made that uh, decision. What we would do in respect of some future referendum, um, given how hard it is to get this particular bill through the, the parliament, I don't, I don't know. But um, 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 we'll, we'll have to look at that and um, see what we might do. But look, we've made a policy decision that um, um, civil society can run these campaigns. They run them free of any sort of political interference. Um, and uh, hopefully, I'm hopeful that at the end of that process, the Australian people vote for an Indigenous voice um, in, the, uh, in the parliament. Senator Thorpe. Yeah. Um, Minister, how will homeless people vote? Minister. Well, um, I. Well, um, we have tried to make a number of changes to increase. Um, I, I'm assuming you're talking about a homeless person who's not currently on the on the electoral roll. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's our um, in wish to try and increase. Um, uh, the number of people participating in this uh, referendum. Uh, we've made some changes that makes it easier for people um, to uh, get on the electoral roll, and I referred to a couple of those changes today. Uh, one of them is the um, 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 use of the Medicare card to um, uh, get yourself on the roll, and um, the other one is a naturalisation uh, certificate. Um, I've asked the AEC um, to focus on trying to increase the level of um, enrolment between now and the um, uh, now and the referendum, and I believe that they are doing that. And as time goes by, I think we'll see, uh, and we get closer to the referendum, I'll, I think we'll see the number of people uh, on the roll. Um, increase. That's certainly my wish. That's certainly what happened, for instance, in the plebiscite um, that um, we dealt with the issue of um, same-sex marriage. Um, and I'm hopeful that the same processes will apply. Senator Thorpe. Minister, uh, if a First Nations person rocks up on voting day Sorry, with their ID, will they be allowed to vote? Minister. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Thorpe. Of course, if they're enrolled, um, they will be allowed to, to vote, um, and they won't be required to have ID. We don't. Um, you might recall in the last parliament, um, uh, <clears throat> there was a proposal to require people to produce uh, photographic evidence uh, before they were allowed to um, to vote, and. Uh, ourselves and uh, the Greens um, worked um, very hard to defeat that. Um, yeah, cosy. You can call it cosy if you like, but um, it, it, um, it was a sensible decision. Um, I think even now there'd be members of the coalition who would admit that that was the wrong course of action. Um, but we defeated um, that, uh, that legislation. Um, so. Um, uh, you, you don't have to. You're not required to um, produce photographic evidence in this country to um, to vote. There's a, I guess, a certain degree of trust in that in that process. Um, the level of people who vote more than once is um, minuscule, absolutely minuscule. Um, I can probably get the exact figures, but I have a feeling it's something like 16. Finally, 16 people were discovered to have voted more than more than once at the at the the election before last. So there's only a tiny um, group of people that ever vote uh, more than once. Um, and uh, well, you've got to have a little bit of faith in the Australian people that, firstly, they'll um, uh, participate genuinely in this debate. Um, They'll have an opportunity to express their point of view, 
uh, and that at the end of the day they'll make the right decision, which in my view uh, is a yes vote for Indigenous recognition. So the question is that so, Senator Thorpe. Uh, Minister, for those First Nations people who turn up to the booth that are not enrolled to vote, they come with their Medicare card and whatever ID and they say, we would like to vote on something that will assimilate us into the colonial constitution. What is the government doing about those people and how many First Nations people are not enrolled? That you're going to turn away on the day, Senator Farrell. Well, it would be my <clears throat> preference that there there'd be none, and one, one of the reasons for um, allowing the Medicare card to be identification for purposes of um, the electoral roll. Um, I want the people that you're talking about, who might turn up on election day, I want them to be enrolled today, tomorrow, next week, next month, but well before. Um, uh, election day, and um, I'd certainly encourage all of those people to get on the roll. We're making it easier for them to get on the roll, uh, and uh, I, I'd be hopeful that we wouldn't have anybody in the situation that you're talking about um, on election day that they would have been enrolled well and truly before that. So the question is that the amendment to the government amendment moved by Senator Pocock on sheet. 1861 to ZB195 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Did I? I didn't. No, the noes have it. So, sorry, Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Sorry to interject that. Could my position just be recorded? Most, most certainly. Without division. Thank you. Senator Thorpe and uh, Senator Waters, I'm assuming you're seeking your individual and your party positions recorded. So that will be done. Okay, the question now is that clause four stand as printed. So, as I understand it, to vote up the government. No, no, sorry. It's been. It's been moved. Yeah. Okay, so that's been moved, but that hasn't been put. So the question is that the government amendment be agreed to. I put it in. Sorry. The question is that clause four stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Now the, question is the remaining government amendments be agreed. now the question is that the remainder of the government amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Chair. I'd like to move Australian Greens Amendment 1 on sheet 1830, and this pertains to on the day enrolment, not just for First Nations people, but for anyone um, who wishes to have their voice heard in this and any other referendum and has not been able, for a variety of legitimate reasons, to be able to enrol themselves prior to election day. And as, my, as I said in my second reading speech, this bill is an important and timely opportunity to improve enfranchisement, particularly for First Nations communities, particularly on this topic, and we must not waste that opportunity. Um, the government have consistently said that they want the referendum to be as close as possible to a normal election, but in the last election many people missed out on voting. That's something that we need to fix rather than replicate. Now, we do support the government's commitment to increase remote, uh, remote area mobile polling, but that's not enough on its own. We support automatic enrolment. We support the recent changes to allow people to use their Medicare card or the citizenship certificate. They're all good amendments that will help boost enrolment, but they are not enough. And I have talked to the government about this consistently. 
um, and put the position that we've heard over and over from stakeholders that on the day enrolment and provisional voting will have a significant impact on the number of people able to cast a vote on referendum day. It is, if you like, an insurance policy in case those other provisions, which I hope they work, you seem confident that they will, I hope they do, but if they don't, we need an insurance policy. This is a foundational document. It is crucial that as many people as possible have their say. We don't require them to all think the same thing. We just want to know what it is that they think. Our amendment would allow voters, including but not only First Nations voters, to attend a polling place, apply for immediate enrolment and cast their vote. That vote would be done by declaration to manage any risk of fraud. That means it would only be added to the formal count after the usual checks are made. The AEC would still need to verify that the enrolment is valid before the vote is counted. There is no reason not to make this change. It would redress decades of disenfranchisement. It will make sure everyone with a stake in the outcome of a referendum is able to exercise their right to vote. And it is a right. It's not a privilege. It is, in fact, a right. Moreover, this proposal has the support of the Electoral Commission. Not just that, it's been operating in other states and territories for years. There is no evidence of voter fraud, there's no evidence of admin delays, there's no undermining of election results. There is only evidence that more people get to vote. Now, I thought this was about increasing and improving democracy and modernising the laws under which our referenda were uh, conducted so that they might be closer to elections. I thought this was about maximising people's chance to have a say. Well, Please pass this amendment. Allow people who wish to have their voice heard to enrol to vote on the day. I've just run you through the checks and balances that will exist. There's no risk. There is no downside to this. There is only an upside for democracy and for our nation to have its voice heard, ironically, on whether it should have a voice to parliament. I mean, what dark irony that you would not allow as many possible people to have a voice on whether they would like to have a voice. Without this reform, there's a real risk that many First Nations people may not get the chance to have a say on the voice referendum. And frankly, it is unconscionable to refuse a change that would only increase the number of votes cast in a referendum. We strongly again urge the government to uh, support this amendment and the opposition. This is an issue that, yes, we will re-agitate this through the JSCAM reforms when we consider reforms to our electoral laws. But I'm concerned that we won't be able to do that in time for the referendum. And I don't want people to miss out on voting in this important question. We've got a chance to actually fix this now. We know it works in other jurisdictions. We know the AEC is happy with it. I don't understand why you're not just supporting this. Let people vote. They want to have a say. Please support this amendment. Yeah. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just on the, the uh, Greens amendment, um, I want to put on the record that the opposition would be opposing the amendment. I have great respect for the, your position, Senator Waters, but the opposition have a very strong view that changes to the enrolment procedure should be considered by the Bipartisan Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters rather than done on the fly in the chamber. The voting franchise is the bedrock of the Australian electoral system and changes to it should be considered in a thoughtful and deliberate manner under existing and established processes, including that joint standing. So we will be opposing the amendment. While I'm on my feet and for the sake of the clarity of the chamber, I should inform the chamber that we will, the um, opposition will not be moving uh, uh, the amendment on sheet 1803 because that issue has been already dealt with through government amendments. Yep. But I will be moving uh, our, the, the opposition's amendment on sheet 1804, which creates an official yes and no campaign and ensure those uh, campaigns have equal funding. Uh, the reasons, I think, for this amendment have become very clear throughout this committee process. I've stated in many speeches on my side of the chamber, I, as, as have my colleagues, that the creation of an official yes or no campaign will dramatically improve the integrity of the referendum. It will increase trust in the integrity of the process. Having that official yes 
and no campaign will make things much simpler for the regulatory environment and for the proper conduct of the referendum. It will make life so much easier for the AEC. It will make life so much easier for our intelligence agencies. The amendment will ensure that once these two bodies are established, appointed uh, by the government, that equal funding is also provided to each side to ensure that neither side is advantaged and to ensure that they can comply with the disclosure and the regulatory regimes that these amendments brought on by the government to the machinery bill um, can be adhered to at the referendum. And I move the motion. Minister. Well, I thought we can have. Yes, I'm just going to respond to the Greens amendment. Oh, um, didn't do that look, anymore. I um, respect the sincerity uh, with which. Um, okay. Senator Waters uh, has uh, raised uh, her, her concerns. Um, my wish is that we don't wait until election day to get people enrolled, that the changes that we've uh, made, which I'm told, um, will result in significant um, additional enrolments between now and the election, uh, will work, <coughs> that today, tomorrow, next week, next month, uh, we get those people on the roll so that we're not relying um, <coughs> on the very last day. Uh, to get them on the roll. Uh, but in any event, as um, uh, Senator Humes pointed out, this should be a matter that is discussed at JSCAM, and I'm very happy to engage in that uh, discussion. So the question is, Senator Cox. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, Minister, can you tell me that 87,000 First Nations people are eligible to enrol to vote currently? In a six-month period, which is the predicted period when this referendum will take place, which by my calculations is 2,416 people need to be enrolled per week, what is the strategy of this government to achieve that? Minister. Well, I've just explained, uh, um, Senator, that um, we are making it easier for people to get uh, on the roll. Um, one of the features of a referendum coming up, of course, is the AEC um, does uh, ramp up its uh, effort to ensure people are enrolled and uh, correctly, uh, correctly enrolled. Um, uh, the previous government uh, withdrew funds from the Northern Territory in terms of um, uh, enrolment. We have restored, re restored that money. Uh, and um, the AEC is already having a significant success in increasing um, enrolments generally, but um, uh, Indigenous uh, enrolments uh, in particular. Um, and I'm confident that between now and the election, uh, we'll have um, significant extra people on the roll. Um, in, in terms of the total um, population, um, we're now at roughly 98 per cent of Australians being registered uh, to vote. Now, I don't think there's, outside of a, <clears throat> perhaps a dictatorship, I don't think there's any other democracy in the world that's got that level of uh, enrolment. Um, that's not reflective in Indigenous enrolment. Um, we need to um, ensure that more Indigenous Australians um, are, uh, are, are on the roll and entitled to, to vote. That was a policy we took to the last election. We've been implementing that. And as I say, the changes I've recently made uh, will not only help um, <coughs> total enrolment, but will particularly help Indigenous enrolment. Senator Cox. <coughs> Senator Cox. Minister, respectfully, and that wasn't really an answer, but you know, about the practical actions that your government are going to take. Last night at spillover of estimates, I asked NIAA a very direct question about $75 million that your government have allocated to this referendum. And they said, we have strategies. No one's actually telling us what those strategies are, because in my home state of Western Australia, in the Northern Territory and in Queensland, we have people currently displaced from floods. How do you think those people are going to now, with your confidence, be able to get to the AEC? Because they're worried about surviving. They're worried about their families. They're worried about their livelihood. 
They are not worried and prioritising getting to the AEC to be enrolled. So I'd like to hear about the practical strategies. Um, well, I'm quite happy to organise a um, meeting uh, with you and the AEC to talk about how the AEC is dealing uh, with this. You're obviously talking about a more broader uh, group of uh, group of people. Um, political parties, uh, if they wish, can go out and try and encourage people to uh, vote, and they often do. Um, sorry, uh, go out and uh, enrol. Um, that is a very common practice, I know, <coughs> in the South Australian branch of the Labor Party. Um, in the six months before the uh, the election, we we go. Okay, okay, but I'm, I was just giving you an example of what you can do as an organisation. To tr yeah, yeah, yeah. Black and white people. Yeah, um, we get both on the on the roll. Um, so um, look, there's a whole range of things that's happening at the moment. It is having some success, and I think if you um, talk to the uh, AEC, they will confirm uh, that they are having success. Um, we, um, we, we want a greater um, number of people on the roll. We're doing practical things um, to actually bring that about as we, as we speak. Um, and I'm happy to get the AEC to talk to you, to go, actually go and meet the group that's specific. Well. Um, <laughs> yes, we are the government, and we are um, making decisions to invest in uh, a range of activities which is going to increase enrolment in this country, and that's that's a good thing. Um, I'm responsible for doing it. I accept that. But um, the AEC have got a very crucial role in um, this area, and I'd be very happy to make them available to you, so you can go and talk to them about exactly what they're doing right now in the communities that you're talking about. Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. Just one last contribution from me on this amendment. I accept that the government are doing some administrative measures in an attempt to increase First Nations enrolment um, and that those changes were made approximately two weeks ago. I accept that. I don't think it should be a choice between doing that or also having an on-the-day enrolment protection mechanism to scoop up anyone that hasn't availed themselves of your administrative opportunities. It doesn't need to be a choice between the two. You can actually do both and genuinely maximise First Nations enrolment. So don't accept your premise that because you're doing it now, you can't also have a protection, a safety net, if you like, to catch people on the day. So I, I just think your logic there is a, a little lacking. The other point that I'd like to make is you have mentioned that this will be considered by JSCM in the course of the electoral reforms. I'll just remind the chamber that this bill was in fact already considered by JSCM, and in fact the report recommends that this very change be adopted. The AEC made that suggestion and the report says, what a great idea, let's do it. So I do really feel like you're punting the ball down the road a little when in fact JSCM has already considered this matter and has already considered in a multi-partisan way that this is an amendment that would ensure more people can vote and in particular more First Nations people can get on the roll. So one last opportunity for the government to explain why it is that they don't want to do this extra thing that seems to have no detractors and no downsides to help First Nations people vote. Here, here, here. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Waters on sheet 1830 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The, the question before the committee is that amendment on sheet 1830 as moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the eyes and Senator O'Sullivan teller for the noes. Honourable Senators, there being 15 ayes and 23 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator Hume, you see the call? Yes. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I moved my um, amendment on uh, sheet. Sorry, I'm looking for the number um, 1804. Um, uh, inadvertently, prior to the last division, but I just reiterate my comments from uh, earlier. Yep. Uh, Senator Hume, are you moving that? Could I have you just formally move it? I, sorry, I have already formally uh, you have moved formally it. I'm just reiterating Thank you. those comments. Chair. Thank you. Does any other senator want to co make a contribution on uh, the opposition amendment on sheet 1804? Otherwise, I, uh, Minister? To indicate that the government uh, will not be supporting this, uh, this amendment. I intend to put the question. I put the question that the uh, amendment on sheet 1804, as moved by Senator Hume, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. No. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Division is required. Ring the bells. The bells will ring for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that amendment on sheet 1804, as moved by Senator Hume, be agreed to. Those for the question move to the right of the chair, noes to the left of the chair. I point as teller for the eyes, Senator O'Sullivan, and teller for the nose, Senator Shikoni. Honourable Senators, there have been 24 ayes and 31 noes. It's passed in a negative. <laughs> Senator Thorpe, are you seeking the chair? Are you seeking the call? Yes, I'm, I'm seeking to move an amendment. Yep. Yep. Um, I move amendment. One on sheet 1855. Do you want, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Uh, yes. There's been much debate about the yes and no pamphlets being produced by politicians in the so-called two camps. This amendment would take the politics out of preparing essential information about the two cases and put it into the hands of the Australian Human Rights Commission, an entity we all respect who can ensure that the information provided is correct, factual and provided in clearly accessible terms, ensuring human rights are respected in the process. I urge you all to support this important amendment as it would vastly improve the process in the up and coming referendum. I'll give the call to the minister and I'll come to the opposition. Indicate minister. that the government uh, opposes this uh, amendment. Senator Hume. That the opposition is also opposing this amendment. Are there any other contributions? Because it's my intention to put the question. No one's. Oh, sorry, sorry, Senator Waters, my apologies. That's fine. Thank yeah, you, call. Chair. Uh, I'll just note that the Greens will be supporting this amendment. As I said in my second reading speech, the Greens support the public having access to clear, objective, 
accurate and respectful information outlining the yes and no cases. For many Australians, the implications of a referendum are not clear, and they need to have the confidence that the official material produced in this place will help inform their decision. We've already seen the dangers of misinformation and missing information in the current debate. Submitters to the inquiry into this bill and to the various referendum reviews that preceded it have called for an independent panel to produce the official material. Um, that would help ensure that the material was clearly communicated, that it was accurate, that it was unbiased, that it, that it candidly outlined the pros and cons without fear-mongering, that it did not include discriminatory or racist talking points. The Australian Human Rights Commission is an expert, uh, and independent and well-respected body. We support the amendment to give them responsibility for producing the materials to help Australians understand the referendum question. Giving people information that they can trust will help to ensure that we get a referendum result with integrity. And I might just add that um, uh, we actually would like to see broader reforms in this space and have truth in political advertising laws, something that we have advocated for for many years now. And I hope that we can have that conversation as well as many others in the course of the JSCAM reforms that are coming down the line. But in the absence of those laws, which actually would have delivered a good and impartial result, um, we think this is a, um, a good suggestion. We'll also be supporting Senator Pocock's amendment, which makes a slightly different proposal, um, but with the same intent to ensure that there's a basis of truth in independence in the preparation of these materials. I intend to put the question. I'll put the question that the motion on sheet 1855, standing in the name of Senator Thorpe, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Aye. So is the division required? Yes, it, can, it will be recorded. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters. Chair, likewise for the Australian Greens, please. Thank you. It will be recorded. Uh, Senator Pocock, you, oh, you wish to be recorded as yes. opposed? Yes. Yes, thank you. Now, uh, do you see the call for a, yes, yes, for a further? In yes. support, in support, but also seeking the call. Oh, sorry, yes, in support. My apologies. And you're seeking the call now to move another amendment? Yes, please. Yes, I'll give you the call. Uh, I seek leave to move. Uh, amendment number one on sheet 1851, amendments one to 12 on sheet uh, 1815, uh, amendment one on sheet 1816. Together. If you wish to, is leave granted? Leave is granted. I give you the call if you wish to speak to it. I move the amendments. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, these amendments I, I have uh, been in discussions with the government about. Uh, the first one is simply having an exclusion zone around polling booths. This is done in Tasmania in the ACT. works very effectively in taking the heat out of um, polling booths. In my opinion, it's, it's, a, it's a much nicer experience for voters and given uh, the sensitivity of, of this referendum and some of the rhetoric we're already hearing, I, I, I believe it is a sensible amendment to ensure that people are safe um, when they're casting their vote. Uh, the amendments on 1815 uh, truncate the, the disclosure uh, time frame. To me, it's, it's frankly ridiculous in 2023 that six months after an election, we find out who funded it. Uh, we've got plenty of uh, technology to be able to do that in a much more timely manner. Uh, I'm proposing seven days to disclose, seven days to make that public. Uh, I, I understand the government's, um, I guess, reason that they're waiting for JSCAM, but this is, this is something that we know that Australians want. It's something we have the technology to do, um, and it, it's disappointing not to, not to have, have support for a, a sensible amendment like that. Uh, and finally, a, a review of the, the pamphlet arguments, just leaving it up to politicians who we know we've seen over a number of elections, uh, political parties being willing to uh, be very creative with the truth uh, down to 
smear campaigns and misinformation. It seems to me that having some sort of independent check on that is a sensible move. Senator, I'll, I'll go to the minister, then I'll go to the opposition, and I'll come to the Greens. A few positions. Let's indicate that the uh, government uh, will be opposing these uh, amendments. Senator Hume. The opposition will be opposing all three amendments. Senator Waters. Uh, I'll just indicate the Australian Greens will be supporting these uh, sensible amendments, in particular about real-time disclosure. We have a, a similar amendment to achieve the same outcome, although I do note that um, we uh, actually would like the disclosure threshold to be lowered down to 1,000, so I note this, this amendment um, just would simply maintain the disclosure threshold where it is, but we, we are in support of real-time disclosure. Um, and Likewise, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, um, we support an independent review of the pamphlet text and are happy enough with this um, formulation of folk to do that, uh, as we were with the previous uh, amendment. Senator Tyrrell, and then I'll go to Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Um, we'd just like to put on record that we're in the affirmative for 1815 and 1851, but in the negative for 1816. I'll, put, I'll break the question then. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. I just wanted to put on the record that I support Pocock's amendments. Does anyone wish to make another con any senators wish to make a further contribution? Because what Senator Tyrrell has indicated, I will put the question on 1851 and 1815 one, one one eight one one together, and then I'll put a separate question on 1816 unless any senator objects. I'll put, I intend to put the question. I put the question that all the amendments on sheets 1851 and 1815, standing the name of Senator Pocock, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Uh, do we wish for a division? Division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question before the chair is that all amendments on sheets 1851 and 1815, standing in the name of Senator David Pocock, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, those against to the left. I appoint uh, uh, David, Senator David Pocock as teller for the eyes and Senator O'Sullivan for teller for the nose. Yeah, yeah, I can. I'm new. Honourable Senators, there being 17 ayes and 27 noes, it's passed in the negative. Unless any senator wishes to make a further contribution, I intend to put Senator Pocock's further amendments. No senators indicated they wish to speak, so I, I, I will put the question that all the amendments on sheet 1816, standing in the name of Senator Pocock, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye, against no. I think the noes have it. We'll now Senator Waters, Can would you I like to record yes, that please. the Greens uh, supported that? Yes, please. That it recorded. Port also. For Senator Thorpe, and obviously Senator Pocock is in agreement because he moved them. Senator, Senator Thorpe, you seek the call? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, I'd like to move Amendment 1 on sheet 1865. Uh, yes, well, I'll take it that you've moved it, and I'll give you the call to speak to it. Uh, these amendments would introduce telephone voting provisions similar to those we had during COVID. It is nothing radical and nothing new and completely doable. It is a small measure with a big impact. It would allow so many people who otherwise cannot vote as they can't physically attend a voting booth to, to cast their vote. If referendums are really the people's votes, then we should all support these amendments. Uh, uh, yes, I, yeah, yeah, I'll give you the call. Yeah, that okay. I won't be uh, moving 1854 or 1818. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Um, so, Chair, can I just flag that? You're all right if I give the call to the opposition? Yeah. Uh, just one wait moment, thank you. Just Give the call to Senator Hume. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to indicate that the opposition will not be supporting Senator Thorpe's amendment on sheet 1865. 
Senator Waters, would you like to put the position of the Greens? Yes, thank you. We have an incredibly similar amendment, and we think both are great. Senator Tyrrell. I'd like to put my support in, but just my support for this one too. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Please may indicate my support as well. Uh, Senator Farrell, would you like the call? Um, I intend to put the question. I put in the question that amendment on sheet 1865, uh, standing in the name of Senator Thorpe, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Yes. Uh, well, Senator, I think, I think everyone's position is known given, given uh, uh, the declarations ahead of the putting of the vote, but I'll make sure it's recorded. Senator Hanson seeking the call. Uh, uh, Senator Hanson. Thank you. I seek the call to move my amendment. Uh, you have the call. Thank you. I move um, number one on sheet 1874 in the name of Vaughan. Uh, you have the call. Do you wish to speak to it? Um, just briefly to say it's to do with the initiated, um, citizens initiated referenda um, so that people, 2 per cent of the population, can actually get a petition that's drawn up in accordance with the AEC and present it to Parliament if the Parliament agrees with it and passed in both houses. Then it will be put to, to a vote at a referendum um, by the people. So I'm basically saying that this is giving the people of Australia an opportunity to actually, um, if there is concerns to them with anything that's uh, in the referendum, whether they wish to have it inserted or withdrawn from the referendum, it's basically the people's democracy that the people have an opportunity to sign a petition and present it to the parliament. And I must ensure the parliament it cannot be passed without both houses agreeing to it. It's basically giving the people a voice. This has actually worked in other countries around the world who have this um, in place, and it's worked very well for them. And I think it's about time that we actually allow the people to have more of a voice in this country. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Chair. Um, there seems to be a bit of a mood around the chamber that with just a little bit of extra time beyond 7.30 we may be able to conclude all stages this evening. So I wish to move that the committee report progress. Question. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Honourable Senators, the committee reports progress. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Deputy President. I move that uh, the sittings of the Senate hours be varied so much uh, that the adjournment occur on the motion of a minister. Given no one else intends to speak, I intend to put the motion. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. Government business order for day number one, referendum machinery provisions amendment bill 2022, resumption and committee of the whole. Uh, Senator Waters, we're on Senator Hanson's uh, motion. I give yes. you the call. Thank you, Chair. Now, with the luxury of a brief uh, additional period of time, I'll just uh, put the Greens' position uh, on the record in relation to this amendment. We support participatory democracy. Politics can't work for people without listening to their voices rather than the voices of big donors and corporations. However, the proposal from One Nation sets the threshold for triggering a big and expensive review of our constitutional framework at just 2 per cent of voters in the majority of states. That is a big change, and we think it needs more consideration, um, particularly about what an appropriate threshold will be. Uh, we will not be supporting the amendments, but we will continue to call for reforms that increase democratic participation and give politics back to the people. This could include a range of things, such as citizen juries, reforming question time, mechanisms to allow the public to petition for a key issue to be debated in parliament, and a range of reforms to get big money out of politics, and ensuring that the maximum number of people get to vote in elections and referenda, something that our amendments, which sadly were not supported by this chamber, um, sought to achieve. Minister, would you like to speak? 
But the government's indicate uh, um, the government will not be supporting the uh, amendment. Senator Hume. Can I indicate that uh, the opposition think that this is a very interesting idea, but it should go through the normal JSCM processes, so we won't be supporting this amendment at this time. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, the JLM will not be supporting that, although we do we uh, do agree it's an interesting idea. It's just been a little bit late in the involvement of things. Thank you. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I thank Senator Hanson for her contribution. I agree this is a, a very interesting uh, proposal. I have not had time to, to look, look at it properly. Uh, whilst generally supportive of, of participatory democracy, should this come to a vote, I will abstain. Uh, before I put the motion, uh, because of the nature of the um, certain number of motions in relation to the placement of business, we can't at this point in time have divisions. Now, we can, as a chamber, report. I'm in the hands of the leaders here. We can actually record our positions, or we can uh, move further motions to uh, amend that position. So. Yeah, we can put the question for that division, but the divisions obviously will be held over. So I'm I'm in the hands of the chamber. So before I put the question, I'm happy to happy to report to do as the chamber to reflect the will of the chamber. Senator Birmingham. Chair, as there would be two options before us to try to conclude tonight. It would seem one would be that, as you just expressed, the parties can individually express their positions, uh, and that that avoids the need for a division to be called. Uh, the other would be uh, if we reported out of the committee again with the leave of the chamber and no disagreement across the chamber, we could move that divisions also be allowed, if that is the will of members. But if somebody called a division on that, then that division itself would have to be deferred until tomorrow. Um, so, dependent upon the will of people to easily get the job done, the simplest path would be for people to express their opinions and for those to be recorded. Senator Hanson Young, and then I'll go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Is anybody intending to call a division for any of the remaining? <laughs> hey? No, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, if nobody is intending to call a division, then let's proceed. Senator Young. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think the um, suggestion by Senator Birmingham is um, a good one, and I've, I feel that the, the goodwill in the room was to that intent, and uh, we, we should move forward in that vein. So, so you're suggesting that we report progress, uh, move another motion to allow divisions, and then return back into committee? Yeah, just for the point of clarification. Y y yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, the, the minister has no objection, so I'd, I'll give the uh, call to. Oh, sorry, Senator Hanson. Just sorry. To confirm that. So, you want to record the votes without calling a division? I mean, say so if I wanted to call a division, I, I have the opportunity to call a division for this if I have the two voices. Is that correct? You could still you, you could still call a division, but it'd have to take place tomorrow. Right. So we have a, So the, one of the options on the table is that we report progress. I go up to the chair. And then we yep. allow divisions, and we just proceed. Right. And I'm quite. Yeah. Look, I'm. I'm quite happy to put it on record that people's um, votes are recorded and uh, without calling a division. Yes. We have, we are, uh, there are other members of the chamber that wish to have divisions, so I, I think the consensus. So we're going to have well, a division. Well, the, the Australian Greens have indicated they wish that. Come on, no, Senator Hanson. Sorry, Young, I'll give you the call. Sorry, Senator yeah. Hanson. Um, the Australian Greens would like uh, to be able to complete this tonight, if we can. I feel like there's goodwill in the room to do it. If we don't need divisions and, we're happy, and all parties are willing to put their, record, their um, position on the record, that is fine. We are also um, relaxed about the idea of having to go uh, back into the chair if need be. But I feel as though we've now got a consensus around the room, something the Greens are quite good at, um, to make sure that we can move forward. Right. So if, I, if I'm, I'm going to summarise the mood of the room, and then you can then you can all pull that apart. I feel that the that the, the mood of the room 
is to stay in committee at the moment and proceed, and where someone uh, wishes to record their position, they can do so. All right, I'm going to proceed and subject to um, so I'm now going to put the question that, that I'm going to put the question uh, of the motion moved by Senator Hansen. I put the question that the that the amendment on sheet 1874 standing the name of Senator Hansen be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. I think Senator Hansen you would want recorded that you you supported that motion. And Senator Babette and Senator Roberts. Opposed it? Well that's everyone who's they're happy to be recorded. Okay. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Chair. I'd like to move Australian Greens Amendment uh, number uh, item one on sheet. 1862, um, and this would remove the restriction on people in prison being able to vote. Denying people in prison the right to vote is like adding a punishment beyond their imprisonment. It treats people in prison if, as if they are not members of the Australian community, as if their views on constitutional reforms that impact the way we live our lives don't matter. Restricting the right for people to vote, uh, restricting the right of people in prison to vote is a form of disenfranchisement which heavily affects already marginalised people. The over-incarceration of First Nations people means that disenfranchisement disproportionately affects Aboriginal communities, which are already neglected by political processes. 0.6 per cent of Aboriginal people in Australia are disenfranchised by restrictions on voting from prison, compared to 0.075 per cent of non-Aboriginal people. We know that many people removed from the electoral roll while in prison may not re-enrol after their release, which just compounds the disenfranchising impact of the restriction. This amendment seeks to restore the dignity and voting rights of people in prison, and I urge the Senate to support it. Minister, I indicate, um, as rather than get up every time, um, all of the remaining Greens uh, amendments uh, we uh, we oppose. Um, <laughs> And uh, and uh, and uh, there's an opportunity to raise these issues in JSCAM. Senator Hume. Uh, for the sake of the uh, convenience of the chamber, the opposition will also um, uh, not be supporting any of the upcoming amendments by the Greens, including this one that is been that is before the chamber immediately. Does anyone wish to make a contribution, Senator Hanson? Um, one Nation will not be supporting this amendment. Um, <laughs> Senator Waters said that people have a right because they're in incarceration should have the right to vote. Well, I'm sorry, they shouldn't have the right to vote. They've committed crimes against society. You've lost your rights, and one of the rights is to the right to vote. Don't commit crimes and, and um, be a citizen, and then you will have those rights. Are there any other contributions? Because I intend to put the question. Put the question that. The amendment on sheet 1862, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think, I think the noes have it. Senator Waters. Yes. Can I just ask that the Greens voted in support of our own excellent amendments? Uh, to make this work, I, uh, Senator, are any other senators wish to indicate their support be recorded? Okay. So I intend to ask that question after every vote to remind members. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. I think there's only one left in any case. Yeah. Um, I move Australian Greens amendments uh, items one to seven on sheet one eight four three by leave together, please. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Chair. Our amendment does two things. It lowers the disclosure threshold to $1,000, the level the Greens have long advocated uh, for all donations disclosures uh, to be set at, and the level that it is in fact set at in most states and territories. The amendment also requires far more regular disclosure so that people aren't finding out who funded the yes and no campaigns many months after the referendum is done and dusted. 
Disclosure isn't a complete solution. The Greens will continue to call for caps on donations in all elections, but regular disclosure of all donations above $1,000 would give people a better insight into who's providing the information that they rely upon when they decide how they will vote. Does any, uh, Senator Tyrrell? Put our on record that we support this as well. Are there any other contributions? I intend to put the question. I put the question that uh, all the amendments on sheet 1843, standing the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I, th I think the noes have it. Does any other senator wish to record their position? Senator. Uh, yes, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. I, it, is, it, it is on record. Senator Hanson. One, one Nation oppose this amendment. Thank you. Senator Waters, I'll give you the call for. I think the, is it the final? Is there any more amendments? No. Sorry, Chair. I'll just. Um, I won't be moving uh, Amendment uh, One on Sheet One Eight Five Three because right. um, Senator Thorpe's amendment was to a very similar effect. I'm intending to put the final question. That the bill as amended be agreed to. So I'll put that question that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. I put the question that now the question now is that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the referendum machinery provisions amendment bill 2022 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone in the chamber for their cooperation and, uh, and uh, I can at least say that, surely. Anyway, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Um, I move that this bill now be read a third time. Clark, I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to referendums and for related purposes. Minister. I move that the Senate now adjourn. I'll bring on some more bills. <laughs> Uh, Senator Polly, Senator Davies on the whipping list ahead of you, and Senator Davies there. Can senators please leave the chamber? Because I wish to give the call to Senator Davies. Here, here. Yeah. Thank you Senator very Davey. much, uh, Acting Deputy. Uh, not Acting, your Deputy President. Sorry about that. Um, I rise today because I want to express my profound disappointment in the Labor Party's attitude towards regional Australia and the desperate need to address mobile connectivity. It is no secret that residents in rural and remote areas struggle with inadequate mobile coverage, resulting in gaps in communication, safety issues um, and uh, gaps in communication that result in loss of business opportunities. And that's why, when we were in government, the Nationals developed the Mobile Black Spot program. In our time in government, we, we delivered, constructed, delivered over 1,200 base stations funded across rural and regional Australia in seats of all political holdings. And now Labor has the reins. Congratulations. They came in saying they would address the problems. Well, what have they done? They've given it a new name, for starters, because Labor are very good at changing logos and, and giving new names and changing machinery of government. Uh, they've called it the Better Connectivity Program, and they claim this program will finally address the issue of regional connectivity. But the reality is it is nothing more than a sham. 
While we in government recognise that through the five earlier rounds of the Mobile Black Spot program, uh, in the early days the low-hanging fruit was taken. The obvious and mildly commercial options were addressed. We saw the need over time to adjust the program. We developed round 5A and then we developed new guidelines for round 6. We looked at new ideas. We sat down with community and industry to ensure that even our most remote communities had a hope of getting access to funding through the program. Whether it was work councils building towers to be accessed by all providers, or whether it was looking at small cell options. Everything was on the table. We worked with industry and community anywhere that connectivity was an issue, regardless of political holdings. And then Labor comes in. And Labor's promise to improve mobile phone coverage in black spots has been nothing but a political exercise in pork barrelling, aimed at winning votes and boosting the party's profile in Labor electorates. The sad truth is that in announcing funding under the latest round, Labor has done nothing but feather its own nest. It is absolutely true because in New South Wales, out of all of the sites selected, they all went to Labor electorates. In Victoria, the majority of sites went to Labor electorates. In Tasmania, the majority, I agree, we hold bass, Senator Polly, but the majority of black spot programs went to Labor electorates. Oh, what a surprise. It is beyond what belief surprise. that no funding went to seats like Farrah, where I live, or the Riverina, or Parks, the majority of rural and regional New South Wales. When questioned on 2GB radio by Ben Fordham, <coughs> Communications Minister Michelle Rowland actually admitted that, yes, she handpicked every site for funding. She admitted that she worked with Labor candidates prior to the election to identify the allocations for funding. She agreed that none of the locations Order. chosen were selected based on advice from the Department of Communications. Shame. I believe there is a word for this blatant partisan decision making. What is it? Pork barrelling. What is worse, no. given that no. Labor no. hold a minority no. of regional seats, this sort of partisan funding should ring alarm bells right across rural and regional Australia. I find this deeply concerning that the Labor Party is more interested in scoring political points than addressing the real issues faced by regional people. Thank you, Senator Davey. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Right now, homeless people across Tasmania and Australia are doing it tough. It really is tough for them. They're sleeping rough of a night, and these summer nights are not going to last for much longer. Too many Tasmanians are couch surfing, sleeping in their cars, relying on friends and family and sleeping in tents with their kids. And then there are those that don't have any friends or family that they can rely on. Nearly 10,000 women and children are seeking safety at crisis accommodation shelters across the country and they are often being turned away because of the lack of supply after nine long years of the Liberal national governments. Every single person sleeping rough has a personal story to tell and I urge people to think about that when they walk past and see homeless people or they see the tents in the parks because it could happen to anyone, any one of us. Too many Australians are living paycheck to paycheck. They're one paycheck away from not being able to make their mortgage repayments or their weekly bills. We know that a disproportionate number of women are now homeless because often women retire without reasonable superannuation balance because they're caregivers, they're raising their children. 
and in many cases caring for their elderly parents. Therefore, financially, many women feel unable to leave an unsafe relationship because they do not have the financial circumstances. The Albanese Labor government is doing everything in its power to ease the cost of living, drive prices down and ensure we implement a housing strategy that is fit for purpose and allows for more Australians to be safe and warm at night in a dwelling of their own or provided by social and affordable affordable housing. Now, homelessness and a lack of housing has been an issue for many, many years, and those opposite and the Liberal state government in Tasmania have done nothing but broken promises. They have neglected to ensure that there is housing and affordable housing for these people who are in urgent need. That is why an Albanese Labor government will establish the Housing Australia Future Fund to build 30,000 social and affordable homes across the country. What we need is for those opposite to support that legislation. This will include 4,000 homes for women and children fleeing violence and older women on low incomes who are at risk of becoming homeless. And I'm glad to say that this has started in my home state of Tasmania. As a government, we are also going to invest in 500 new community sector workers across Australia to support people who are facing violence, because the extra hands will be instrumental in getting more women and children out of those dangerous environments. People need support and they need to be able to talk to people who they can relate to. Further to this, to support women in northern Tasmania, the Albanese Labor government is providing $2.25 million for additional crisis accommodation. We expect this could help as many as 202 women and children to find refuge. We will also fund 12 workers to help 960 women and support them during their hardest times of their lives. I look forward to working with my Tasmanian colleague, Minister Julie Collins, to deliver on this much-needed funding. Survivors of violence are strong and they deserve to have the help that they need to rebuild their lives, and Labor will, will tackle the scourge of domestic violence with ambition and urgency. I look forward to the day when we can see more social housing to see that built across Australia and particularly to address the very real homeless epidemic across this country and in my home state. And it is devastating to think that the Liberal state government and the former Liberal national government did nothing in terms of providing that support for those women and children who are so desperate to leave a domestic violence situation. And you ask, why don't they leave? The reason is because they have nowhere to go. What we should be asking them is, what can we do to help you, to assist you, to be able to rebuild your life, to live in safe, affordable housing so you can go on and reach your full potential and support your children? Older women in this country are the fast and growing fastest growing cohort of homeless people in this Thank country you, and it's shameful. Your time has expired. Senator McKenzie. Labor has backflipped on its pet permit implementation bungle after being grilled about its dog act by the Nationals in Senate estimates. And we recently received some great news about Maximus and Henry, two dogs trapped as a result of this implementation farce by the Labor Party on coming to power. And I just want to read uh, some of the comments by these loving dog owners so stoked with the um, backflip by Labor. We want to share the fantastic news with you that DAF yesterday issued permits for both our dogs, Maximus and Henry, and both for the 10 days quarantine. This is the best news we could have hoped for, and we want to pass on our thanks to you and your teams. We also understand from others that DAF have indicated in correspondence to them that they will honour the 24-month RNAWT for applicants prior to the 1st of March 2023 yeah. with 30-day quarantine. This small win will be very welcome news for many families that were applicants prior to the 12th of January in particular who are impacted by this change and just need to get to Australia 
and who are willing to accept 30 days. For those still stuck in the ID check rigmarole and having to start again to qualify for 10 days quarantine, those in the UK who are still unable to do this, it remains an ongoing issue. DAF did point out to us, please note that the assessment and outcome was specific to your dogs and the information provided and assessed. This outcome is not guaranteed in every instance for every applicant. DAF has not, to our understanding, publicly indicated that they may be willing to review information to support ID checks from applicants most impacted on a case-by-case -case basis, and we are reluctant to share the outcome of our own assessment due to perception of favouritism. Now, this is unacceptable. The Labor Party made a mistake in the implementation of what is good biosecurity practice. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of dogs, families, uh, expats impacted by this. As we know, 6,500 dogs and cats came into Australia in 2022 alone. And many of them had uh, put in applications to return their beloved pets to Australia under the pre-existing regime to be caught short. Uh, by the implementation disaster that was Labor that was uncovered in se uh, Senate estimates. So I just really want to say thank you to Michelle Johnson, who was actually willing to speak out on this issue and that allowed us as the National Party to pr prosecute this in Senate estimates. We're stoked that Maximus and Henry are you know, home with Andrea and Shona and um, look forward to that family being reunited home here in Australia, whilst also keeping our biosecurity um, issues in place, like our strong borders. We want to keep Australia safe and free from disease, but it's important that Australians, whether they're here or overseas, are, have confidence in our biosecurity system. Under Labor new rules, pet owners overseas must now take their animals to official government vets for identity checks, like who actually is Maximus, who actually is Henry and others, even though, and this is like classic, classic. Um, what's that? What's that? What's the show on the ABC? No, 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 not Bluey. Border Force. No, no. When they make up policies on whiteboards. Oh, Utopia. Utopia. Classic <laughs> Utopia. I love Utopia. Yeah. So the official government vets that this entire biosecurity arrangement was based on actually don't exist in the US or the UK yet. So we've got potentially thousands of expats in the US, in the UK, wanting to return home with their pets, uh, unable to because the actual system the Labor Party set up with uh, doesn't actually exist. They can't identify their pets in the UK or the US. So, well, uh, hats off everybody over there. So thankfully, they've given an exemption for Maximus and Henry to come home, I'd be calling on the Labor Party to not make that a once-off, to actually ensure that all cats, dogs, llamas, mice, gerbils, whatever, family pets, one and all, within a strong biosecurity system can actually uh, come home with appropriate systems in place to protect our strong borders on biosecurity but also ensure uh, that pets are reunited and stay with the families that love them. So thank you, Andrea and Shona. Our pleasure. Thanks, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Hanson. Thank you. As Australians would be aware, the Liberal Party have today struck a deal with Labor to give the government the numbers to pass the voice referendum machinery bill. So in effect, the coalition have handed Labor the starter's gun for what will be an extraordinarily divisive constitutional change when we peg Indigenous Australians against all other Australians. My concerns have been further elevated today by a letter I received from a member of the public who provided an 11-point plan he says was devised by staff within the National Indigenous Australians Agency, which operates within the remit of Prime Minister and Cabinet. It's the same NIAA group I brought to the Australian people's attention earlier this week. A body of 1,317 bureaucrats funded to the tune of almost $4.5 billion this financial year reportedly set up to improve the lives of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The NIAA are an unnecessary, 
duplication body set up in addition to the roughly 3,000 Aboriginal corporations all registered under CATSI Act that also claim to do the same thing. But my anxiety levels are rising following this correspondence containing details of an 11-point plan left behind by a group of six or seven NIAA employees having coffee at a cafe in the Woden Town Centre. Now, this coffee shop in Woden is roughly 450 metres from the NIAA office here in Canberra. Let me read to you the 11 bullet points that were taken from the pages left behind by that group of NIAA staff. It was headed, Early Action Opportunities for the Voice. One, jobs quota. Minimum 10 per cent appointments to be First Nations people for judges, magistrates, CW, SES, ADF officers, AFP and state police forces, corrections departments, vice chancellors and ambassadors. Two, universities, no entry tests and no fees for First Nations people. Three, old age pensions, reduced age eligibility for First Nations people because we die younger. Four, public housing, First Nations people to have first preference for all vacant public housing across all states. Five, sport and music, entry fees reduced by 50 per cent for First Nations people for any events on public land. Six, beaches and national parks, all beaches and national parks to be property of the relevant tribe and non-First Nations people to be charged to use the beaches, parks, etc., revenues to go to relevant tribe. Seven, rivers and streams to become property of relevant tribe, tribe and fees for water consumption paid to relevant, relevant tribe. Eight, mining royalties, same as for water. Nine, income tax for First Nations people to be 50 per cent of normal rate. Ten, liquor licensing, all new liquor licences across Australia to be vetted by voice. Eleven, voice office research, policy staff to analyse and review all proposed government policies, legislation and appointments, same size and pay as DPMC. The DPMC they refer to stands for Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. If the Prime Minister is aware of these initiatives set out by the NIAA, it would appear that Mr Albanese continues to mislead the Australian people over the extent of powers given to the voice to Parliament. If, on the other hand, the PM does not know about the list, then who from Prime Minister and Cabinet is overseeing the actions of the National Indigenous Australians Agency? Australians have a right to know the extent of the powers being handed to the voice to Parliament now, certainly not whenever this government feels like it. And this greatly concerns me of what has been listed here, because, as I said before, once you put it in the Constitution, any government can make whatever legislation they want and that it can be, cannot be changed. It is only through a referendum can it be changed. This is fraught with danger for the rest of the Australians because this is divisive. What they're proposing here is divisive, divide Australians, and we are all Australians together. And that's what I want an answer from the Labor Party and I definitely want an answer from the Prime Minister. What are your intentions? What is, do you intend to do to, to the Australian people? It's not about bringing everyone together. It's about dividing us. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. And I rise to speak uh, about the upcoming state election on Saturday in New South Wales, my home state. It's a state that's desperate for a fresh start, and a men's Labor government is the recipe for a great New South Wales. Uh, the, past seven, the past 12 years, of LNP government in New South Wales has seen our state rocked by scandal after scandal at the highest levels of LNP politics and leadership. It's been an ongoing and egregious privatisation of our state's public assets. It's seen a total lack of policy accomplishments with nothing, nothing to show for more than a decade in government. As a duty senator for the great uh, regions of New South Wales that cover the seats of Parks, Calair, Farrah, Riverina, Hume and Lyne, much of the work that I do outside of Canberra entails travel to the rural and regional parts of New South Wales. 
These are regions that the coalition, and in particular the Nationals' parties, claim to advocate for most strongly. Yet the reality is that after 12 years of Liberal National Party government in New South Wales, the entirety of the state of New South Wales, and particularly, particularly our rural and region areas, are hurting, and they are in fact in a state of profound neglect. Health and education, two of the primary public services which state governments are responsible for delivering, have totally deteriorated under the coalition. The management of New South Wales health systems under the coalition in New South Wales has seen an egregious collapse of the capacity of our health services to respond to the needs in our state. Unacceptably long ambulance wait times and stories of ambulances being ramped at hospitals for hours have become sadly commonplace, just reported daily in our news cycles. Even in our metropolitan areas, the state of public education is in need of serious attention as our country's teachers' shortage really begins to bite. The situation with regard to teachers is even more dire in regional New South Wales. My office constantly receives stories of high schools without enough teachers to actually start classes for the day. Students forced to take off full days from learning, complete uh, the vast majority of their courses remotely with no teacher. But there is hope for change on this Saturday. Not only is Labor committed to ensuring that teachers, particularly in our public system, are valued, but we're committed to the common sense policies that will improve the quality of both the teaching and learning experience for those in schools in New South Wales. Now, to respond practically to that challenge, a New South Wales government, government is going to ban mobile phones in schools. They're going to expand the school breakfast program to 1,000 schools because no child should have to start school with an empty stomach. They simply can't learn. Labor is committed to public education and to addressing gross neglect in the form that New South Wales education has just become accustomed to and has become the signature of 12 years of coalition government. It's not just through the considered policies that are going to ensure New South Wales prospers under Minns Labor government, it's the people of New South Wales. Now, I've had the great privilege of knowing many of the Labor members of both the current Legislative Assemblies and Council, and as well as the candidates running in this election. Not only are they part of a party which has an undeniable legacy of delivering positive, practical outcomes for Australian families, they're individuals of extraordinary calibre. Each and every member of Labor's New South Wales team that I've met, from members to staffers to candidates to rank-and-file branch members, is deeply committed to the values of equity, justice, inclusion and a fair go for all Australians, regardless of their postcard. Labor is the party that delivers for Australians. It's been almost a year, 10 months in fact, since Australia chose wisely to elect a federal Labor government. In that time, We've seen policy and cultural achievements which dwarfed in 10 months the efforts of a previous decade of failed LNP government. The Albanese Labor government, of which I'm so proud to be a part, has already legislated cheaper childcare for Australian families. The National Anti-Corruption Commission, 10 days of paid domestic violence sleep. We've implemented the Jenkins report in full, ensured women's safety is at the foremost uh, concern for government policy making. We've supported a wage increase for aged care workers. We've begun the work of modernising Australia's Senator industrial Your system. Time has it's time. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9am. Thank you, Senators.